Planning a vacation can be a real pain in the butt, can't it? Do you want to go somewhere hot or cold? Are you there for some busy days of sightseeing or some quiet rest and relaxation? Sometimes it'd be nice to just get away from everything and everyone, just take a long break from all of life's troubles. If that sounds idyllic to you, then maybe you should book your next trip to either the Sahara or Antarctica, each home to two of the largest deserts on the entire planet. There are, however, a few things you should know before you decide to take a trip to either of them, in particular, whether or not you'd make it back alive. So join us as we ask the question, could a human being survive for a year in Antarctica or the Sahara Desert, and which one would be worse? Let's start with the warmer of the two, the Sahara Desert. What makes an area a desert is the lack of rain, snow, mist, or fog that an area experiences. Any region that doesn't get a whole lot of these various forms of precipitation is generally classified as desert. While there are numerous different subcategories, including subtropical, coastal, and polar deserts, they all share certain traits. They're usually barren, wind-swept landscapes that plants, animals, and even us humans have a hard time surviving in. Considered to be the largest hot desert in the entire world, the Sahara Desert covers a staggering 3,000 miles from east to west, with a total area of over 3 million square miles making the entire desert almost the same size as China. In fact, you could even fit the entirety of the US in the Sahara Desert and still have some space left over. That's a lot of desert. Great, unless you don't like sand. After all, it's coarse, rough, irritating, and it gets everywhere. Speaking of everywhere, the Sahara fills nearly all of northern Africa, spanning 11 countries in total. It's bordered by the Atlantic Ocean in the west, to the north are the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlas Mountains, the Red Sea is over to the east, and in the south is a region called the Sahel, which is where the Sahara Desert transitions into a belt of more humid savannas. Those aren't the only features of the Sahara Desert, and it's not all just sand either. Perhaps most famously, the Sahara is home to fields of sand dunes, the kind you might often see during long walks in desert-depicted movies. These dunes are formed when winds move grains of sand, piling them up on top of each other until eventually a mound starts to form. From these humble beginnings, Saharan sand dunes can sometimes reach almost 600 feet tall, and overall they cover around a quarter of the entire desert. However, while you might picture a flat, open plain of sand, when you hear the word desert, you might be surprised to know that most of the Sahara is comprised of barren, rocky plateaus, as well as salt flats, sand dunes, mountains, and dry valleys. The highest peak in the desert is Omi Kosi a volcano located in the Tibesti Mountains that stands over 3,400 meters tall. Other mountains within the desert also include the Ayir Mountains, Saharan Atlas, Adrar de Zifora, Hogar Mountains, Tibesti Mountains, and the Red Sea Hills. So you got plenty of sand, a lot of rocks, and not much else to contend with. Living in the Sahara for a year might not exactly be a cakewalk now, but if you arrived earlier, you might have found that to be a different story. Surprisingly, the Sahara wasn't always the dry, inhospitable desert we know today. The area now covered in sand used to be completely unrecognizable. It was much greener and home to a variety of plants and animals covered in lakes, rivers, and even a few forests. However, thousands of years ago, a gradual change took place caused by the tilt of the Earth's orbital axis. The Sahara Desert often experiences intense periods of humidity followed by drought. The reason for this fluctuation is the result of occasional disruptions to Earth's tilt which changes the angle at which the solar radiation penetrates the atmosphere. This has occurred repeatedly throughout history, directing more energy from the sun at the area of the Sahara during the West African monsoon season, when a higher volume of rain falls over Africa. And it was thanks to all this rain that so much greenery was able to thrive in the Sahara up until between five to 8,000 years ago. The Sahara went from humid greenery to intensely dry with some archaeologists pointing to the introduction of humans and domesticated animals into the region as the cause. When humans brought goats or other cattle to the area, the variety of plants growing there experienced a change as a result. Since plants give off moisture, when animals overgrazed on the grass, it lowered the amount of moisture present in the atmosphere, since that moisture would have produced clouds, which would then provide the area with coverage when the periods of intense dry heat began. Nomadic folks moving their herds might have also used fire in order to clear paths through the plant life, and this would have only exacerbated the rate at which everything dried out. However, some believe that the Sahara Desert will eventually return to its former lush green state at some point in the future, but not for several thousand years. As you probably already know, the Sahara Desert is the hottest desert in the world. 
possessing one of the harshest climates imaginable. This would definitely impede any attempts to live there for a full year, especially since the desert's average annual temperature is 86 degrees Fahrenheit. That's only on average, though, and the heat in the Sahara can easily clock in at much higher temperatures. For example, one of the hottest temperatures ever recorded there was a staggering 136 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. Um, I mean, sand dune. On some days, the temperature of the Saharan sand can exceed 170 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot enough to burn the skin right off your soles if you happen to be walking barefoot. If you were attempting to survive there, then walking out in the open can be next to impossible. However, it's during the middle of the day that the heat is at its most intense, whereas in the early morning and late afternoon, the temperature is significantly lower. Another necessity would be keeping cool and regulating your body temperature by taking breaks in any shaded areas you are able to find. Staying in the heat for too long could cause a person to collapse, especially if their body is not acclimatized to such high temperatures. The intense high temperature of the Sahara is only one of the biggest factors that would impede surviving there for longer than a few days. Since becoming a desert, the area has not received anywhere near as much rainfall as when it was in its greener state. In fact, half of the Sahara Desert receives less than a single inch of rain each year. Although it has changed over time, the prior 2,000 years have seen the Sahara's climate stay fairly stable and consistent. Even if it's consistently hot and dry, winds coming in from the northeast will strip moisture from the air above the desert, while hot winds are pushed more toward the equator. The desert winds can reach alarming speeds, with the faster rushes kicking up sand and causing severe dust storms. If one of these hits you while you're in the Sahara, then your visibility will fall to zero. The dust from the Sahara would block out everything around you, making navigation nearly impossible. If you think you could just wait it out, think again. Some bigger sandstorms can go on for as long as 12 whole hours. And with all those fine grains of sand being kicked up, getting caught in a sandstorm can mean that you might choke or have your flesh ripped apart from the sheer speed and force of the sand. Even without a sandstorm blocking your vision, Navigating the Sahara is beyond challenging. With no rain, no roads or major landmarks, and nothing but endless sand dunes surrounding you, you would be lucky to find your way back to camp after a stroll through the desert. And that's just during the day. Nightfall brings with it a whole host of other dangers. While we think of the Sahara as having this dry, inhospitable desert climate all day long, it actually gets much colder at night. Once the sun sets, temperatures can drop dramatically due to the lack of humidity. That might sound like a nightly reprieve from the blistering heat, but the Sahara can often become so cold at night that it becomes just as deadly as when the sun is out. Nights in the Sahara can reach lows of 21 degrees Fahrenheit. For reference, 32 degrees is where water freezes. Much like with the heat, everyone's body has a different tolerance to cold, but when temperatures drop that low, and that rapidly after the highs of the day, it can lead to dangerous consequences. Heat can cause the body to react in certain ways in order to try to prevent hyperthermia also called heat stroke. And that's why we sweat. It's our bodies trying to cool themselves down. However, being wet can cause your body to abruptly get colder. And while this might come in handy during a scorching Sahara daytime, it becomes deadly when night arrives. If your surroundings are colder, you still retain your internal heat, and that temperature difference can cause your sweat to evaporate. This can inhibit your body's natural ability to regulate its temperature, making it drop rapidly and triggering hypothermia. This slows the chemical processes of the body that usually keep you alive, and can eventually cause someone to fall into a coma and die. There are ways to avoid this, however. For one, you could adopt the lifestyle of some of the 2 million people that live there. Yes, that's right, people do actually live in the Sahara Desert, although their population numbers aren't high for obvious reasons. Some of the people living in the desert have established communities near water sources. Predominantly, though, the Sahara is populated by nomads, moving from place to place. Many choose to travel at night and find shade to sleep under during the day, which is definitely a viable strategy. However, it might not necessarily work for everyone as a perfect survival method. If you were going to attempt to keep warm during the colder nights in the Sahara, then setting up camp close to rocks might help you maintain a warmer campsite. Rocks retain their heat far longer than sand, so setting your tent up near rocky outcrops could help stave off the lower temperatures while you're asleep. Additionally, sleeping in several thin layers of clothing, as well as using a tent and a sleeping bag, will prevent additional heat loss overnight. Of course, one of the biggest problems when traveling across the Sahara is dehydration. Although the cold nights in the desert can cause snow to occasionally fall on mountain ranges, this doesn't happen anywhere else in the Sahara. Water is scarce across the entire region. However, two rivers run through it, the River Nile and the Niger River. 
There are also at least 20 lakes in the desert, but these aren't exactly the best options if you're looking for drinking water. For one, they are salt water, with Lake Chad being the only freshwater lake in the desert. So unless you have the necessary items to filter out that salt, you will not be able to drink any of the water from the lakes. That is, if any of those lakes are even around during your year-long ordeal in the Sahara, because these are seasonal lakes, meaning they dry up depending on the seasons. Human beings can only survive for a few days without water, which is one of the primary reasons why the nomadic peoples living in the Sahara keep moving constantly. You could theoretically survive in the Sahara for a while, but only if you had access to some consistent means of hydration. Carrying water bottles with you is one way to achieve this, but of course that's only a finite amount of water, and all the weight of it will slow you down. Still, it's better than having none available at all, as getting stranded in the Sahara with no water would be a death sentence for even the most experienced adventurer. Electrolyte tablets or sports drinks can also be used to replace minerals and salts that the body needs to function, but above all, staying hydrated is the single most important rule of surviving in the Sahara, or any desert for that matter. Having plenty of water, even if you had no food and ways to protect yourself from the daytime heat and the cold at night, you could probably survive for between two to four weeks. This is, of course, dependent on a number of factors, including how you adapt to the harsh conditions of the desert. The Sahara Desert is not a place for the faint of heart. Lasting that many weeks would be a grueling experience, even for the most determined survivors. Acclimating to the terrain and intense heat often takes months or even years of preparation. Your survival during a year in the Sahara can also depend on how fit or knowledgeable you are, along with your determination to survive, and how much you're willing to endure walking long distances. Those are just the factors that come internally from yourself. It also depends on how much water you have with you, how much water you're able to gather, as well as the provisions and equipment you have on hand. With at a minimum a sleeping bag, flashlight, various survival essentials, food and plenty of water, you have a good chance of surviving. The key is to not stay in one place. Keep an eye on your body temperature and maintain awareness of the desert around you. Now, when most of us think of a desert, we're likely to picture the Sahara or other places similar to it, complete with sand dunes rippling in the warm wind and scorching hot temperatures from the relentless sunlight. But remember what we said earlier, a desert is defined by the amount of precipitation it receives. It's not necessarily somewhere that's hot and sandy. So how about a desert that's freezing cold and icy instead? Welcome to Antarctica. Hiding at the southern pole of our planet, Antarctica is considered to be one of the most mysterious places in the entire world. It's a cold continent covered completely in ice. In fact, Antarctica has up to 90% of all the fresh water on Earth stored in its ice sheet. And yes, even though it contrasts with the Sahara being a cold, icy place, Antarctica is actually also a desert. The continent actually gets less annual rainfall than the Sahara Desert, reaching only 10 millimeters on average over the last 30 years. Antarctica is classified as a polar desert, and the ice covering it took around 45 million years to reach its current thickness, thanks to how little rainfall the region receives. As well as being one of the driest continents on Earth, Antarctica is also the coldest. The lowest temperature ever recorded on Earth was logged in Antarctica in August 2010, plummeting to the unfathomably frigid temperature of negative 135 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 93 degrees Celsius. The reading was taken via a NASA satellite as part of an effort to locate the coldest area of the planet. There are actually a number of these lower than freezing cold areas in Antarctica, mainly at high elevations. Temperatures that low are certainly not conducive to human survival, especially for extended periods, like say if you wanted to try to survive there for a year. Although it might be hard to imagine, much like the Sahara once being full of plant life, Antarctica wasn't always the frozen continent it is now. At one point in time, an estimated 50 million years ago, Antarctica was almost as warm as the city of Melbourne, Australia today. According to researchers, the temperatures across Antarctica used to reach the low 60s in Fahrenheit. Fossils recovered from beneath the ice also indicate the continent was once home to large forests inhabited by dinosaurs. However, the Antarctic Peninsula is warming up again, and this isn't any cause for celebration. Heating more rapidly than most other areas of Earth, the average temperatures across the peninsula have only increased over the past 50 years by nearly 40 degrees Fahrenheit. That's good news for anyone trying to survive a year on the frozen continent, but bad news for the rest of us, as that's five times the average temperature increase elsewhere on the planet. While the Sahara has a modest population of its nomadic inhabitants, Antarctica is actually the least populated continent in the world. People can't actually live on Antarctica, 
There are no townships or cities anywhere. There's usually a population of at least 1,000 people present during the winter and up to 4,000 in the summer months, but the vast majority of these people are researchers working in the numerous scientific stations on the mainland. The researchers are often studying the animals that live in Antarctica, as well as observing the effects of climate change on the ice sheet. While some tourists do travel to the icy continent, it's only for short visits. Researchers also never tend to be there for long, given the extremely cold conditions, and are normally stationed there for a single year. The main reason nobody lives there full time is the low temperatures. Even in the warmer area of Antarctica, there are no clouds and no wind. An average person would, in all likelihood, only survive for a few hours, and that's only if they had plenty of warm food and hot drinks on their person. Nearer the coasts, where the temperature drops to below freezing, most people would find themselves developing hypothermia in less than an hour. This could cause them to die within two to three hours, so that might make it seem like just avoiding the coast and staying inland would give you better odds for a year's worth of survival. But even in the Antarctic summer, temperatures inland are around negative 4 degrees Fahrenheit, meaning you would likely develop extensive frostbite within 10 minutes. This would also likely lead to hypothermia and death within 30 minutes. In the winter, it'd be far worse, with temperatures dropping even further with the addition of no sunlight reaching the continent. This would fast track your frostbite, letting it take hold after only 5 short minutes. Once again, hypothermia and death would arrive soon after. When it comes down to the question of which is worse, it all depends on what you would rather endure. Living in the Sahara for a year would mean contending with intense dry heat during the day and needing to stay hydrated and regulate your body temperature just to stay alive. Not to mention, making sure you keep warm at night to stave off the potentially life-threatening consequences of a rapid decline in temperature. But all that being said, while both are inhospitable deserts, it's likely that your chances of surviving for a year would be higher if you were in the middle of the Sahara rather than the cold plains of Antarctica. Believe it or not, there's a fairly long list of people who have survived their executions. We might look at the case of William Duell, a 17-year-old English boy who was hanged in 1740 in London and then came back to life as he was about to be dissected. He was later exiled to North America. Then you had John Babacombe Lee, another Englishman nicknamed the man they couldn't hang after surviving three executions. More recently, you have the case of Romel Broom, an American man sentenced to death by lethal injection. He survived that ended up writing a book called Survivor on Death Row, but it seems he spoke too early, as he's scheduled for another execution in 2020. But today we'll talk about one of the best known survivor stories in this episode of the Infographic Show, Death Row Inmate Who Survived His Own Execution. As we've said, a handful of people have survived their executions. You can read quite recent cases too, such as American inmate Doyle Lee Ham, who was said to have experienced torturous and traumatic hours in the execution chamber before staff admitted that they had failed. The US media reported in 2017 that a man called Alva Campbell became the third man to survive an execution in the country in recent decades, and that was just a matter of the execution team not being able to find a vein in which to inject the lethal drugs. But perhaps the tale we're about to tell you now is the most moving, as the person that survived was only 17 years old. It's also the first case of someone surviving the electric chair in the USA. If you've seen our show on Old Sparky, you'll know that executions in the early days could certainly be horrific to watch, but eventually the inmates succumbed to the shock. That was not the case for 17-year-old Willie Francis. Let's have a look at what events led to him ending up in the chair. Francis was a young, poor African American in 1946, and at the time of his lucky escape, many people believed that the hand of God had interrupted this macabre spectacle of official murder. For one thing, he was just so young, and a lot of people decreed the execution of a boy not yet a man. And another thing was the fact that the American justice system at the time could have been said to be harsh for certain people of certain races and certain social standing. He lived in a place called St. Martinville, located in southwestern Louisiana. You can read articles about this place in the the 40s with one saying that the town had two sections, one for the white people and the other for the colored. The white tended to their own business and the colored tend to theirs. Yes, this was a time when racism was pervasive in some parts of the US, and despite the backwards attitudes of some people, there was a lot of support for young Willie when he was condemned to death. After the botched execution attempt, Francis wrote from his prison cell, A lot of people write me to ask me to tell them something about what I did when I was young. I'm only 18 now, so I guess they mean when I was very young. But what had he done? 
One of 13 children, Francis said life was hard as a kid, but he wrote he had fond memories of the hard knock life, playing baseball with a broomstick handle and going out with friends causing mischief. When he got older, he was given a job by a man called Andrew Thomas. Thomas owned the local drugstore, hiring Francis to do errands and keep the store tidy. They apparently got along and Francis was called a nice boy and cooperative by folks who visited the store. He was, however, called illiterate by some, or at least close to that. Others said he was slow, but later when Francis was writing from his prison cell, it was proven that he could not just write, but express himself in a deep and meaningful way. We're telling you this because this case was very controversial, and at the time and for years after, people tried to understand why this seemingly nice kid committed a murder. That murder was of the drugstore owner, Thomas. When her son was convicted of slaying his boss, the mother told the press, there wasn't no bad in him, I just don't understand. Quite a few people thought that this young boy, perhaps somewhat mentally challenged, had admitted guilt to something he didn't do, the murder of Andrew Thomas, described as a handsome, educated bachelor with his own successful business. He was killed at his home during that night of November 7th, 1944. His body was discovered the next day, splayed on the floor near the house steps. Two witnesses, Alvin and Ida Van Brocklin, had said that they heard gunshots in the night. They didn't see who did the firing, though. It was later said that Thomas had been dining with friends and upon returning home had been met by a gunman who unloaded five bullets in him. Two hit him in the back, two in his left side, and one went right through his eye. It said his pockets had been emptied, prompting police to say the reason for the murder was robbery. Rumors spread around town. It said he was quite the ladies' man, and many speculated he had been killed by one of those ladies' husbands or lovers. For months, people believed this to be the case. Sometime later, police were looking for a drug dealer, and it said that Willie Francis just happened to see the police. He wasn't dealing drugs, but it said that when he saw the two white police officers running his way, he just took off out of fright. That was a mistake, as running made the police think that he was guilty of something. Later, Francis was interviewed by cops at the police station. They said he seemed frightened and he stuttered a lot, but it turned out that Francis had stuttered his whole life. The cops didn't think that they had captured a drug dealer that they had been looking for, but guess what they found on Francis? They found Andrew Thomas's wallet and identification card. That's what they said anyway. It's said that within three to five minutes, the police got a full confession for the murder of Thomas. They also managed to get a confession for an unrelated assault and robbery in another town. The facts cops did this in a few minutes, and the fact that the boy was said to be somewhat slow would compel people to ask if the interrogation and subsequent confessions were perhaps a part of a setup. Francis was questioned without a lawyer, without any advice, without any family member or friend being present. The confession read, I, Willie Francis, now 16 years old, I stole the gun from Mr. Ogasey at St. Martinville, Louisiana, and kill Andrew Thomas November 9, 1944, or about that time at St. Martinville, Louisiana. It was a secret about me and him. I took a black purse with card 1280182 in it, $4 in it. He wrote a second confession the next day. This one contained more details about how many shots had been fired and where the body was found. As for the trial, it said Francis's lawyers were inept. One writer says they they never questioned for indictment, nor did they make a motion for a change of venue, despite the widespread publicity about the murder of a beloved white member of a small community by a black youth. The 12 white jurors found him guilty, and he was to be executed. Francis' lawyers never challenged the verdict. By the way, Francis has pleaded not guilty. The jury never heard any argument pertaining to the possibility of a forced confession or that evidence could have been planted. The confession itself was good enough for him to be convicted. Many people in the town thought that something smelled funny as did many others across the U.S. The local press wrote, quote, Throughout the trial, the Negro was uninterested and showed very little emotion." Unquote. Francis wrote that he was concerned that he might act like a crybaby on the day of his execution, but was relieved to hear that the actual execution would only tickle. On May 3, 1946, he had his head shaved and prepared to have 2,500 volts of electricity flow through him. On his cell wall, it was discovered that he had written the words, Of course I am not a killer. Police never did have a motive for the murder, nor any substantial evidence other than the confession of a slow 16-year-old boy. He was taken to Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola to be put in the chair nicknamed Gruesome Gertie. The lever was pulled and this is how Francis later described the feeling. I couldn't stop the jumping. If that was tickling, it sure was a funny kind. I thought for a minute I was going to knock the chair over. Then I was alright. I thought I was dead. Other reports state that he shouted, take it off, take it off, as the executioners tried to give him a second round of shocks. It's said that after the failed attempt he wasn't even injured, but he said he felt kind of dizzy. Some people said this was a miracle and a righteous one as they didn't believe that he was guilty nor had had a fair trial. Louisiana 
Texas Governor James Davis then said in six days they would send him to the chair again. That didn't happen, and much of America got behind the young man. He once wrote, I felt just like a movie star. I didn't have any idea I had so many friends. He also later described how his execution felt, and something he called the chair. He wrote, You feel like you got a mouthful of cold peanut butter, and you see little blue and pink and green speckles, the kind that shines in a rooster's tail. What ensued were many months of legal arguments. Not only did some people believe he wasn't even, but lawyers now argued that to subject a person to a second execution was cruel and unusual punishment. Prosecution lawyers argued against that, stating the first attempt had not worked at all and he had not been hurt. But the evidence supporting this in hindsight seems pretty weak. The court also heard that the botch was just an accident, and such accidents happen for which no man is to blame. That meant no one was at fault, and there should be another execution. We might also note that later the state was petitioned with lawyers stating this about the botched execution. The scene was a disgraceful and inhuman exhibition, that as soon as the switch controlling the current was taken off, the drunken executioner cursed Francis and told him he would be back to finish electrocuting him, and if the electricity did not kill him, he would kill him with a rock. The drunken men in charge that night were accused of being sadistic, not giving Francis the full shock because they wanted to torture him. He was then returned to the chair on May 9, 1947, and this time he didn't survive. He was just 18 years old. If anything positive came out of all of this, it's the fact that the justice system was exposed for not supporting Francis in the first place. This poor black boy may or may not have killed his boss, but he certainly wasn't protected as he should have been by the American justice system. Many Americans of all colors saw and criticized what had happened. It's August 11th, 1934, and along with 136 prisoners, you're on your way to what will become known as America's toughest prison. You guys are what the authorities have called the incorrigibles, because in the prisons where you've come from, you just couldn't stop causing trouble. All of you have been called violent and unpredictable, and so you're being taken to the penitentiary version of hell. You sit there on a specially designed train coach, handcuffed and surrounded by 60 FBI agents, US Marshals and other security. The atmosphere is solemn, and each of you grisly looking hardened criminals each eye each other with distrust. Every chug of the train is foreboding. In your mind, it says to you, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. You're not wrong. That's how the first shipment of prisoners traveled to Alcatraz Island. None of those guys were prisoner number one, since Alcatraz had some leftover army prisoners. This place has been a military prison before it became the penitentiary renowned as being an inescapable hellhole. Let's just pretend you were one of these prisoners again. You arrive on that train in a place called Tiburon at 9.40 am. A barge is waiting in the water there, and that's how you'll get to the island located in San Francisco Bay. The train carriage where you've been sitting could perhaps go down as one of the most well-guarded trains in the history of rail. Imagine if some of the USA's most violent prisoners all got loose, something akin to a movie about the Wild West. No one escapes this day. Many of the men around you are convicted killers, and others are notorious bank robbers. You can make a book out of your combined rap sheets. Each of these guys have been called an agitator, and the authorities have noted that the men are desperate. Most of them have planned prison escapes from other places, and it's well known that they will kill anyone who gets in the way of their freedom. For that reason, you will be guarded by highly trained men, and when we say highly trained, we don't mean in rehabilitation. They are men that were chosen for their toughness, not their ability to help improve prisoners' behavior. The two men in charge, the warden and his assistant, have been nicknamed the Iron Men. When you finally get to the ferry ship that will take you to the island, you are handcuffed with another man, and both of you are shackled together. You're ordered to walk 10 feet forward and cross a gangplank, and then onto the ship. You're surrounded by law enforcement and prison guards. All this is happening without the press looking on, because the authorities have kept the operation a secret. Only one lone photographer got news of the move. At Alcatraz's dock, you and the guy you're chained to walk between rows of guards. Two by two, you're marched through the gate into the yard, and then into the cell house. You're searched and given a number, after which you're allocated a cell. Now your cuffs are removed and you are free of the other man. But before you can go into your cell, you're taken to the bathhouse and stripped naked. You're examined in every nook and cranny of your body, and then told you can wash. You're then taken to a cell and the door is locked. Outside is a sign that has your name and number. The authorities will later say that the entire operation went perfectly. Ok, so what does your cell look like? You're assigned to block B. You might move to C later, and block A, you learn, isn't used much at all to incarcerate men. D Block is solitary, a segregation center where a prisoner can be locked up 24 hours a day. 
These cells are sometimes referred to as confinement chambers. You might get let out in the yard for an hour once a week if you get on the right side of the guards, but other than that, you face total isolation if you're sent there. So your cell in block B is 5 feet by 9 feet. Proverbially speaking, if you were to swing a cat in there, you'd kill it. Inside that cell is a cot that you can sleep on and it's made out of steel. It folds against the wall when not being used because there really isn't that much space in the cell. There's a steel shelf to sit on and a steel shelf to put things on. There's also a basin and a toilet. Everything you own when you first get into that cell is a toothbrush, some tooth powder, two towels, and a cup. There will be books to read so you can fill that shelf at some point. You will be able to get visits if you're good, but only once a month and non-contact. If you fall sick, then there's a hospital in the prison. Over the coming year, some big names will arrive at the prison, including the man known as George Machine Gun Kelly. Others that arrive have been convicted of what the press call most atrocious crimes. Alcatraz is called the end of the line, the last resort. It holds formidable robbers and ruthless murderers, and it especially holds anyone who has tried to escape from another prison, or a prisoner that has hurt or killed a prison guard where he was housed. Maybe the most famous criminals to stay on the rock is the mafia crime lord Al Capone. He actually arrives shortly after you. So there you are, sitting in your cell. You receive a booklet, and it's called Regulations for Inmates USP Alcatraz. It tells you that what you have right now is what you're entitled to. The clothes on your back, the roof over your head, and some bathroom items. Anything else you might receive as a privilege. And to get more things, you'll have to show good conduct and a good work ethic. You might even get some time taken off your sentence. But show bad conduct and the opposite might happen. You might lose privileges, get some time added on, or be sent to those isolation cells. This is nothing you haven't read before. In bold letters, the booklet tells you that there will be no trading, gambling, selling, giving, or loaning. They mean this too. You will work 5 days a week, 8 hours a day. The rest of the time will be recreation time and cell time. You can watch a movie twice a month, and if you show good conduct, you'll be able to go out to the yard and play handball. You're also told that this won't happen just yet since your first 30 days will be spent in your cell. This is called the quarantine period. It doesn't sound too bad, only you guess the guards will be stricter. That is very true. You'll wake up at 7 am and you'll be counted. You must be absolutely silent during this time or you'll be disciplined. This rule of silence will be the thing that gets to you the most, and the guards are serious about it. You might have your own cell, but the silence kills you. You can try talking through the toilet bowl, but that will get you in serious trouble. You can talk when you eat with the other prisoners. The food at least isn't that bad. In fact, you're quite impressed with the chow. For breakfast one day, you get oatmeal, milk, sausage, fried potatoes, toast, and coffee. For dinner, you get some bean soup, roast beef, and veg. For your supper, you get pork and beans, salad, more coffee, and bread. On another day, the breakfast is similar, but dinner consists of breaded cod, potato chowder, cabbage, bread, and tea. For supper one evening, you get vegetable soup, spaghetti and meatballs, fruit pudding and bread. They even throw in some spiced apples. What's going on? You're eating better than you did on the outside, and a lot better than the many Americans living in abject poverty. In the years to come, the delicious food at Alcatraz will become legendary, and it'll make any prisoner in the present day wish he was taken back in time as he chows down on his single slice of moldy bread and dubious slop filled with mystery meat and gristle. At Alcatraz, the wardens believe that healthy food and tasty food will lead to good behavior and cut down on violence. Three good meals a day should keep the prisoner in good physical and mental health. You are what you eat, and your warden believes slop doesn't align with good behavior. Alcatraz is quite progressive in this respect. Ok, so you've got your pounded beef steak with gravy and mash, and you're not going to complain about that. The silence thing gets to you, but as you follow all the rules, you at least get time on the yard and books to read. It's a bit cramped in the cell, but at least you don't have to share with a man who has a history of atrocious violence. What can go wrong? Well, that routine is so strict that it can feel oppressive. It's final lockup at 4.50 pm and lights out at 9.30 pm, and until the next day you're not supposed to make a sound. A man named Edward Watke doesn't take to Alcatraz very well. He's prisoner number 47, and he's the first man to take his life in there. More will follow. There is bullying, of course, and this leads one man to severely hurt himself. He wants to get transferred because of the bullying he faces daily. So for you, as long as you don't get bullied, life could be ok. You just have to adhere to the strictest of routines. You even get to go to the library, and since you're eating well and exercising, you might actually get rehabilitated. In fact, as an average prisoner, you'll get to go through almost 100 books a year. As the years go by, you'll get the chance to use a musical instrument and listen to a radio. The problem is, what if you don't follow the rules? Well, that's when Alcatraz turns into Hellcatraz. 
Let's just add that it's very easy to break the rules. That code of silence is enforced with enthusiasm, and you also have to look presentable at all times. Your cell has to be spotless and come rain or shine, you have to work really hard. There's no shirking in Alcatraz, and so you might say it's run in a zero-tolerance style. Now, with that in mind, the place is full of notorious criminals with problems of self-control. Things can go wrong. Let's say one day you just can no longer cope with the oppressive rules and you start talking at night and not cleaning your cell. You're sent to isolation, and then you do the same again. You hit out at people and talk back to guards. That's when you go to D block and get put in one of the cells from 9 to 14. This is known as the hole, and before you get thrown in there, you're stripped naked and beaten. The guards will come back and torture you now and again. You lie on a cold concrete floor and there is no light that comes into the cell. You can shower once a week, and you might get out in the yard for an hour in the week. The rest of the time is spent in that cold, dark cell, being treated worse than an animal. You're given no toothbrush or soap to clean yourself. At one point, a guard throws cold water on you. The cell stinks like a sewer, too, and you can forget about that tasty food. You're given four slices of bread a day, and then once a week you get a proper meal. In conclusion, Alcatraz is a foreboding place just to look at, and it comes with ruthless men who might bully and kill you. The food is good, but some men just can't cope with the rules. This is what one of your fellow inmates says about that. Men go slowly insane under the exquisite torture of restricted and undeviating routine. Men crack, and then they're punished, sometimes severely, and this happens a lot. The question is, will you crack, or will you get through it? Imagine you and some of your best buddies are traveling by plane to what you think will be a weekend to remember. Suddenly, you experience some bad turbulence, but it's nothing you haven't felt before. Then it gets worse. The plane drops through the sky, luggage falls from above. You grab hold of the seat arm, your knuckles whiten as you do so. The next thing you know, you're freezing cold, still fastened to your chair, in a part of the plane that broke off. You crash into the earth, but miraculously, you're still alive. You don't know it yet, but you've landed in one of the most unforgiving environments known to man. There's nothing but mountains around you. No vegetation, no animals, nothing. You are at least alive, but soon you'll be hungry. It won't be long now until your friend tells you, I'm going to eat the pilot. As unbelievable as this sounds, it's exactly what happened. This is the survivor story that eclipses all others. It's the tale of heroism and sadness, a brutal story, and one we just can't imagine being a part of. Let us start from the beginning. It's October 12, 1972, a Thursday. Friends who play on the same rugby team from Montevideo, Uruguay, are on their way to a match in Chile. There are 45 of them on board the plane. Not only the young, strong, and fit players, but some of the team's family members as well as some supporters and five crew members. It's expensive to fly commercially to Chile, so they opted for the cheapest option, which in this case was chartering an Air Force plane. What they don't know is that this American-made Fairchild FH-227D has the nickname the Lead Sled, owing to its high weight and relatively weak engines. They'll also soon find out why it has such an atrocious safety record. All they know now is it's the cheapest way to fly over the Andes mountain range to play what will be a fun game of rugby in Santiago. That first part of the trip is cut short due to a terrible storm over the Andes, and they're forced to stop over in Mendoza, Argentina. There's a direct route to get them to Santiago from there, but the plane can't fly the 25,000 to 26,000 feet required to get over the mountains. Instead, they'll take a route that looks like a U-turn. This route will skip the highest peaks and instead find a way around them. It's now Friday the 13th and they set off again. The atmosphere is fun. The rugby ball is being thrown around the plane. It's all laughter and games. One of the players, Nando Parado, gives his window seat up for his friend so his buddy can get a better look at the mountains. Nando has no idea that this small gesture will end up saving his life. Not long after, the turbulence starts. At first, no one takes it seriously, but then someone points out that the mountains seem to be very close to the plane, like right outside. What they don't know is the pilot and co-pilot have made a terrible mistake. They told air traffic controllers that they would reach the airport in a minute. They couldn't see much due to the clouds, and they were wrong about that minute. They were actually 11 minutes away. They were still in the mountains and hadn't reached the safe spot where they could turn right toward the airport. They descended anyway and were hit by more turbulence as they were right in the middle of mountains where the winds were chaotic. The plane was thrown around, the clouds parted, and the pilots saw a black ridge directly ahead of them. 
The plane attempted to pull up and accelerate, and now the passengers knew they were in trouble. The aircraft hit the ridge, tearing off the rear of the plane and sending the plane hurtling forward. They are still about 13,800 feet above sea level when they likely collided with another mountain, causing the wings to come off and leaving just the front part of the fuselage. Those at the back of the plane have been thrown out into the mountain range. Some are alive in the plane, but there is no time to think. Suddenly, what's left of the plane hits a snow-covered mountain. The fact that even this much of the plane survived is incredible, but what's even more incredible is what happens next. The plane begins sliding down the mountain like a sled, but somehow doesn't collide with any rocky outcrops or boulders, sliding down and down the mountain until finally it comes to a stop at 11,710 feet above sea level. Seats have been uprooted and bodies have been bashed against the front of the pilot's cabin. People are strewn everywhere, but many of the passengers have somehow survived. Some are screaming, their limbs twisted, parts of the plane stuck into them. But they are surrounded by glaciers so remote they don't even have a name. No one goes there and there's little hope of being found. It's freezing cold and it's hard to breathe because the air is so thin at this altitude. Of the survivors, those that are least injured begin to help the less fortunate. Some have broken bones, some are almost dead from internal injuries. Nando is in a coma and will remain in one for three days. Of the 45 passengers aboard the plane, 12 of them died immediately when the plane hit the mountain or fell out the back of the destroyed aircraft. Some bodies are found still strapped to their chairs covered in snow and not far from the crash site. The first night is brutally cold, with temperatures getting as low as negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit. The survivors huddle into the fuselage and try to block up the holes with suitcases. They all mistakenly think that a rescue operation will find them, and this will be their only night on the mountain. They could not be more wrong. What they don't realize is that the plane's white coloring means it cannot be seen from the air. Five more people die from their injuries on that first night. Nando in his coma doesn't know that his mother is dead and his sister is dying. Both were only on the flight because Nando was told he could use the empty seats for free. Inviting them would turn out to be the biggest regret of his life. The next day, the injured are attended to, some still screaming because their legs and arms have been broken in many places. The pilot is dead. The co-pilot, who made the terrible mistake, is found crushed under debris but alive. He tells the survivors that he has a handgun and asks them to shoot him and put an end to his pain. They don't kill him, but he dies soon after. But now they need food. At high altitudes and such cold temperatures, the body burns calories extremely fast in an attempt to stay warm. All of the luggage is searched, and while there is an endless stock of cigarettes and lots of booze, there isn't much food. In total, there are eight chocolate bars, a tin of mussels, three jars of jam, a tin of almonds, and some candy and a few bottles of wine. The survivors immediately make a rationing plan. It's next to nothing for so many people, and they have no idea how long it needs to last them. They have water at the very least, being able to melt it and funnel into empty wine bottles. Days pass and more die. On the tenth day, Nando, who is now conscious, holds his sister as she dies in his arms. He would later say that he went to sleep and woke up in hell. And yet, it will get worse, because they then heard on a transistor radio they had found in the wreckage that the search for them was being called off. They knew they were alone, cold, and starving. It was at this point of extreme desperation that Nando had told a friend, I'm going to eat the pilot. In fact, a few of the survivors had been rolling the same idea over in their minds. One of them later told the media, our common goal was to survive, but what we lacked was food. We had long since run out of the meager pickings we'd found on the plane, and there was no vegetation or animal life to be found. After just a few days, we were feeling the sensation of our own bodies consuming themselves just to remain alive. They didn't see it as cannibalism. If they were to survive and see their families again, it was what they had to do. There was no choice, eat your buddies or die. There were 27 people still alive at this point, which is a lot of mouths to feed. They started with the pilots, stripping the bodies of all the possible meat, including the organs as their starving brains told them, eat more, eat everything, don't waste a bit. On day 17, disaster struck again. In the middle of the night, they heard a noise, what one of them later described as sounding like wild horses running at them. It was an avalanche. Snow burst through the hole in the plane, and the entire fuselage was packed tight. Those alive scrambled to dig for air and find their friends. Eight more died, and the rest were in the dark, buried in snow, with little air to breathe for three days. In time, the snow would melt, and the fuselage would again be sitting on top of the snow. The days passed and they survived by eating more of the dead. They smoked cigarettes and went out on little exploratory missions, but after just a few hundred meters they'd be too tired. 
The snow was too deep and the air too thin for their weakened state. They were also affected by snow blindness, essentially a sunburning of the eyes that comes from the sun reflecting off the snow. To fight back against their surroundings, they made makeshift snowshoes and sunglasses so they could stray farther. Even then, they were surrounded on all sides by dangerous crevasses. One of the survivors would later say, we felt like insects trapped in the hugest forces of nature. They were right, there's almost no place on earth where it would be harder for humans to survive. On one sojourn, they found the other part of the fuselage. Inside were batteries for the plane radio as well as some chocolate, a little candy, and comic books. They stayed there all night reading the comics by the light of the fire they had built. For a while, they had hoped that they could use the batteries, but it soon became apparent that hooking up a radio with lots of wires was not something any of them possessed the know-how to do. As Nando later said, we were very depressed. For him, the only option now was to walk right out of the mountains. They were aware that Chile was west and remembered that the pilot had said they weren't far away from their destination, but they had no way of knowing that they were still 37 miles from the nearest road. But that wouldn't be an easy hike. It was 37 miles of glaciers and rough terrain, and they were far from experienced outdoorsmen. But Nando knew they had to walk over the mountain range to Chile. It was their only option. They decided that they would stock up on human meat and only the strongest would go. Nando and two others named Roberto Canessa and Antonio Bicentin. On day 61, when the men set off, only 16 survivors remained alive. Some were sick and everyone was malnourished and beaten by the elements. Before they left, a man named Carlitos Peas made them a sleeping bag with parts of the aircraft insulation sewn together with copper wire. Had they not had that, they would have surely frozen to death on their hike to freedom. It took them three days to climb the first mountain. Nando expected to see green valleys from the top of that mountain, but what he saw instead were more mountain ranges. Byzantine turned back and gave his food to the others. Nando and Canessa both said, we'll die, but we'll die trying. They didn't die. They walked for days, almost passing out from exhaustion. But on day eight of their walk, they found a river. They saw green poking through the melting snow, and most importantly, they saw a person on the other side of the river. Though they were unable to cross to the other side to meet him, they slept there that night and the next morning the man came back. He had brought with him a piece of paper and a pen. He tied them to a rock and threw it across the river. Nanda wrote on the paper, we are survivors of the plane crash. We have no food. We cannot walk anymore. There are more of us in the mountain. Where are we? And threw it back. The man went to find help, himself being many hours by horseback from civilization. On day 10, Nando and Canessa were finally picked up by the army, their skinny bodies carried out on the back of horses. Nando said at that point he was ready to embrace life again. Soon, helicopters would take Nando to find his friends, with the pilots asking how they could have possibly walked over such terrain without equipment. It was amazing. Their journey was tracked by professionals years later, and even with the latest equipment they found it hard and very, very dangerous. On day 71, the first of the team was picked up and on day 72, the rest were taken. All were suffering from various ailments, but all of those who had still been alive eventually recovered. And in fact, only one of them is not alive today. Once the newspapers had stopped cheering for the survivors, many began to ask just how they had survived so long without food. It was impossible, literally impossible. Then, a photograph taken by the rescuers came to light of a human carcass whose bones had been stripped. The survivors admitted what they had done, and many in the public turned on them, calling them cannibal savages. Nando later said that eating human flesh wasn't an easy decision, it was a last resort. He said, we tried to eat strips of leather torn from pieces of luggage, though we knew that the chemicals they'd been treated with would do us more harm than good. We ripped open seat cushions hoping to find straw, but found only inedible upholstery foam. It was either feast on dead friends or die, and one survivor that was reluctant to turn to cannibalism actually did die. But 16 of the survivors decided that they would do whatever it took to stay alive, and because of it, they made it down off the mountain. She's been shot at by a crazed high school psycho whose only mission in life was to murder her. Another teenager wanted her dead for the only reason that he wanted to be famous. But perhaps the most astounding assassination attempt was when a mystery figure tried to derail her train, a plot that was subsequently covered up by the government. The way old Lizzie has survived three assassination attempts will blow your mind. We're going to start with the most recent assassination attempt on Queen Elizabeth. The year was 1981, and she was in New Zealand, fulfilling her duties as a traveling monarch. The perpetrator of the 
crime? A 17-year-old kid named Christopher John Lewis. You might wonder why a teen would want to blast the queen to kingdom come, but you only need to look at his background to understand that his proverbial screw was loose. According to news reports, this boy lived in a house with a tyrannical father. Life was so chaotic for the kid that he couldn't even read or write until he was 8 years old. After assaulting another kid, he was expelled from school. He cut the heads off birds. His favorite man in the world was none other than Charles Manson. He got into petty crime while he was still young, culminating with his gang taking just over $5,000 from a post office after holding two workers at gunpoint. That was a lot of cash in the 70s, especially for a teenager. But for Lewis, the thrill from the violence was more important than the money. But he didn't stop there. He and his mates put together what they called a guerrilla army. They gave the outfit the name the National Imperial Guerrilla Army, spelling guerrilla wrong. With Lewis at the helm, they terrorized the neighborhood. Those that were close to him knew him as a bona fide psycho. As an adult, he wouldn't disagree. We know that from his memoirs, aptly titled Last Words. It was during these tumultuous years that he concocted a plan to do something to the queen that would put his name in the history books. He later said that living with his father was a living hell, which rendered him feeling in a constant state of terror. It's hard to say why he wanted to go as far as killing the queen, but he blamed what he called the twisted wreckage of his life and the fact that he very dearly wanted to become an outlaw. He was close to it already, feared in his town for many reasons, such as when he held up an elderly woman in her car and demanded a ride. And so on October 14, 1981, this troubled boy decided that he would take out his problems on the British monarch. At the time, she was visiting a museum in Dunedin, the town where Lewis lived. That day, he hid his 22 caliber rifle, stolen earlier from a gun shop, in a pair of old jeans and walked into a seven-story building from where he'd set up his shot. His getaway vehicle, a 10-speed bicycle, he left outside the building. Inside, he sneaked into a toilet cubicle and unwrapped his gun. He was seething with anger when he put on his gloves and readied the rifle. The queen he knew would soon pass by in the street in her Rolls Royce. As the motorcade got closer, his hands trembled as he heard the cheers of the many people in the street. He stood up by the window and waited, his gun pointing toward the road. Suddenly, a loud crack was heard by many people in the crowd. The queen had just just stepped out of her car. She wasn't hurt. The shot wasn't very close. If Lewis actually meant to kill her is not certain. He later said he didn't actually want her dead, stating, I felt that giving her a scare somehow, that the issues and problems that were evident in New Zealand might finally be brought into the public attention, and as a bonus, if the Queen would look at these issues, she might well take notice. That's not what the New Zealand Security Intelligence Service said after he'd been picked up by cops eight days later. They believed that this kid had tried and failed. All this was actually a hush-hush and led to a cover-up because it wasn't a good look for New Zealand. But this cover-up doesn't even come close to what you'll see later. When he was charged, all the public heard was that his crime was illegally possessing a firearm and illegally discharging one, not that he had tried to kill the queen. As we said, people in the crowd that day had heard gunshots, but cops later assured them and some curious journalists that it was nothing but an unrelated racket. When Lewis heard the charges in court, his words were, only two charges? What? Had the bullet hit her, would it be treason? But the whole story remained classified until February 2018, when a media company found out the truth. By this time, Lewis was long since dead. His death is a grim story if there ever was one. After the incident, he was sent to a psychiatric hospital. There, he once pulled a knife on a guard, and in his spare time, he concocted another plan to take out Prince Charles. After his release, he wrote these memoirs, and while he did try to stay away from crime, intelligence services never let him out of their sights. They thought he was still dangerous, knowing that if he had a more powerful gun that day, he could well have killed the Queen. That's why in 1995, when the Queen was visiting New Zealand again, they exiled him to Great Barrier Island for an expenses-paid 14-day vacation. As a friend of his once said, he always wanted to know what it would be like to take someone's life. The next year, Lewis was accused of doing just that after a mother of three named Tanya Furlan was found dead in her house, her head smashed by a hammer. Lewis was accused of the murder and of kidnapping her child in an effort to secure a ransom, but the evidence against him was weak to say the least. Cops had listened to an informant, a friend of Lewis's, and he told them that Lewis had killed the woman. From his jail cell, Lewis wrote, I stand firm in my convictions that the present nightmare will soon be over. I know in my heart that I didn't commit these crimes, so this is all the hope I need for myself. It's very likely he wasn't guilty, and the culprit was probably that informant, a man who later committed a similar murder. But Lewis didn't get to clear his name. He was electrocuted in his prison cell before his case went to trial. What's amazing about that story is the fact that Lewis really could have killed the Queen. There's no doubt about it. It's also fascinating that no one but the royals and some chosen authorities knew about it. 
With this next young chap, his assassination attempt was never going to hurt the Queen much, but it was spectacular in itself. It happened again in the same year on June 13, 1981. This time the Queen was on home turf, and again, her would-be assassin was just 17 years old. His name was Marcus Sargent. On the day he managed to get off six bullets as the Queen was riding a horse through central London for what's called the Trooping the Color Ceremony. That day, the crowds filled the street as the soon-to-be-married Diana Spencer rode in a carriage with Prince Andrew. Her lover and future husband, Prince Charles, like the Queen, rode on horseback. Sargent didn't have anything near the psychological problems that her first assassin had. He was a Boy Scout who'd done pretty well in school, and as a youth, he'd won awards for marksmanship at the Air Training Corps, a kind of cadet school for young folks. But then, at the age of 16, things started to go wrong for him. He joined the British Royal Marines but left after a few months for what he later said was bullying. He then joined the army and only managed to get through two days of induction. To add to this list of failures, he was also turned down by the police and the fire brigade. Angry and disappointed in himself, he ended up working at a zoo. At age 17, he was out of work again, and he'd taken upon himself to become a member of an anti-royalist group. Things could have really gone badly for the Queen if this young lad hadn't failed in finding ammunition for his pop's 455 Webley revolver. He tried in vain to get his hands on another gun, but as you know, it's not easy in England. Even though Sargent joined a gun club to get himself a license, it seems he gave up on trying to buy a real gun and instead paid about 80 bucks for two blank firing replica Colt Python revolvers that were sent to him via mail. If he couldn't kill her, he was damn well gonna scare her. Not long before he did the deed, he actually sent a letter to Buckingham Palace stating, Your Majesty, don't go on the trooping color ceremony because there was an assassin set up to kill you waiting just outside the palace. The letter arrived three days after the ceremony. As she rode on her horse, Sargent seemed to appear from nowhere and fired off six shots. Needless to say, this shocked and scared onlookers. No bullets came out of the gun, of course, but the noise frightened the queen's horse, named Burmese, and it reared up a little. Like a champ, she steadied the beast. Guardsmen and cops were on Sargent like a flash, and the queen, according to one of her bodyguards, rode on as cool as a cucumber. He told the press she looked shaken by the episode, but soon recovered her composure. Sargent was charged with the 1848 Treason Act and sentenced to five years in prison. It turned out that this failure of a kid had been obsessed with the assassinations of John Lennon and John F. Kennedy. When investigators unearthed his diary, one of the entries read, I'm going to stun and mystify the whole world with nothing more than a gun. I will become the most famous teenager in the world. He didn't deny it later, telling the cops to their face, I wanted to be famous. I wanted to be a somebody. Psychiatrists didn't think he had any kind of severe mental health issues, saying he was merely a messed up, insecure kid who'd studied the Lennon assassination and couldn't believe how easy it had been. He thought, why not? I would like to be the first one to take a pot shot at the Queen. He was released from prison at the age of 20, and due to him being disliked by a lot of royal-loving Brits, he gave himself a new identity. All the time he'd been locked up, he apparently sent letters to the Queen apologizing for what he'd done. She didn't reply once. We can't tell you what happened in the end to this boy that was called by the media a traitor and a fantasy assassin, but we reckon he sure would have been looked on with interest had the truth about the Queen's later visit to New Zealand had been told. And that brings us to another cover-up, easily the strangest tale of the three assassination attempts. Like the New Zealand attempt on her life, the story only became public knowledge many years after the event. In 1970, she was on a royal tour of Australia. On the 29th of April, she was riding a train with her husband, Prince Philip, heading from Sydney to the city of Orange, a distance of about 161 miles. The incident happened close to the town of Lithgow, population of 13,000. We now know that prior to her boarding that train, someone had laid down a large log on the tracks. At around 7 feet long and about 8 inches in diameter, it was big enough to derail the train. Someone had obviously left it there in the dark and they'd wedged it in enough so that it would do some serious damage. In fact, the train did hit that log and was momentarily shaken. But it just happened that at the moment, the train had been going much slower than usual. Had it been traveling at the usual speed, there is every chance it could have derailed and the Queen been seriously injured or killed. A report written many years later said the train continued on brakes for about 200 meters with the logs still wedged under the front wheels before finally coming to a halt at the level crossing near Bowenfell Station. As things turned out, the Queen didn't know a thing about it. The Australian cops didn't report the matter, and a local newspaper that knew what had happened made a so-called gentleman's agreement with the cops not to publish the story and so embarrass them and the country. The newspaper, the Lithgow Mercury, kept hold of the story for close to 40 years. One of the investigators later admitted he'd pulled the editor to the side and told him not to publish the story. He said, I took him for a drive and I told him the story and I said, I want your assurance that you don't print it. And he didn't print it. In 2009, it was finally published. For many years, Australian cops investigated the plot, but nothing came of it. One of the reasons for that was because they couldn't actually talk to many people about what had happened. The lead investigator recalled, we never came up with any decent suspects because if 
if we interviewed people, we seemed to be talking in riddles. Who is behind the plot remains a mystery, with IRA sympathizers being high on the list of suspects. Still, it could have been another kid trying to make a name for himself or just a regular run-of-the-mill loon. It seems Buckingham Palace had also been kept in the dark all those years, although it's possible the British authorities also kept the story under wraps. In 2009, the palace issued a statement saying it didn't want to comment on the matter, but in the royal diary there was no mention of anything strange happening on the train that day. My name is Sasha Yevchenko, and I'd like to tell you the story of how I survived one of the worst man-made disasters the world has ever seen. On April 25, 1986, I was working at the heart of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant when the number 4 nuclear reactor exploded. The blast was huge in itself, and one of my colleagues was pretty much vaporized instantly. What happened after that has become one of the world's worst real-life horror stories. But let me start from the beginning. It was evening at the plant where I worked, which was located near the town of Pripyat in northern Ukraine. The sky was a radiant blue, it was warm, and when my colleagues and I clocked in for our night shift at the plant, we were in good spirits. I remember the conversation was all about what we were going to do for the May Day holidays, and little did we know the near future would be very different from how we imagined it would be. My wife Natasha was at home with my two-year-old. I was 24 at the time, with a new family and everything to look forward to. That night, we were told that we were going to have to run a test on reactor number 4. This didn't go down well with a lot of guys because we weren't really sure how to do it. We had no choice though, a command is a command. We argued about the right power level we should start the test at and little did we know that there was a design flaw in the reactor. This would prove to be what you might call a fatal design flaw. What we were basically testing was a simulation of an electrical power outage. You can probably guess that such a thing, if it were to happen, would be very dangerous. But if there was an outage, the generators would kick on. The problem was this would take about a minute to gain full power. And you just don't have a minute because the water that's pumped in the reactor to keep it cool would not get pumped and too much heat would be generated. So the theory was that the electricity could be taken from the rotational energy of the steam turbine. This would in theory power the cooling pumps for that minute. So to do the test we had to simulate this power loss and see if this theory worked. We tried this twice before but both times the tests failed. Third time lucky is not exactly how things turned out. So we dropped the power levels. That didn't go well and suddenly the reactor became dangerously unstable. We also ignored, and were told to ignore, some of the vital safety mechanisms. We knew something was wrong but we were told to go ahead and keep testing. We removed something called control rods so that we could get back the power but that didn't turn out well either. It was also against safety procedures. Those rods are like a failsafe, they prevent the reactor from generating too much power. Power then began to rise, and then rise dramatically. We weren't sure what was happening. In the reactor, steam was building up. You could say what we had then was a pressure cooker of enormous proportions. We knew then we had an emergency on our hands. We pushed the scram button, which was the emergency shutdown. We then reinserted the control rods, but they jammed. What we didn't know is that the graphite tips on those rods caused more power to surge. At 1.23 and 45 seconds AM, the pressure cooker then blew. The 1,000 ton roof was blown right off and a fireball blasted into the sky. The air was filled with dust. Pieces of graphite were flung everywhere. Radiation spilled into the atmosphere. It was hell on earth in the literal sense. We were all shocked in the room. The boom was so big we thought a war had happened. The walls shuddered, the whole place felt so unstable. Trust me, I'm a huge man and I'm not afraid of much but at that point, I felt tiny, at the mercy of something terrible. I then went looking for my buddy because he must have been closest to the explosion. It was dark in the corridors, dust was everywhere. All I could hear was a hissing sound. He'd been too near the pumps, he was dead. I saw the roof had been blown off and in the night sky I could see the stars. And then I saw something that looked quite wonderful, ethereal, like God shining down on us. It was a beam of light. That beam was something more malign than I was aware of. It was radiation and that radiation would kill a lot of people. I then went with some colleagues to the reactor hall but the heavy door was jammed. As I said, I'm a big man. Some people say a bear of a man. I managed to get the door open while my friends went inside the hall and tried to understand just how much damage had been caused. Those guys would all die in the coming days and weeks from radiation poisoning. At the time, we knew radiation levels were high because the device used to tell us the level, the dosimeter, was showing a needle that was off the scale. Still, at the time, all we thought was there goes our job in the nuclear energy business. We had no idea of just how catastrophic that explosion was. After about an hour though, I knew something was wrong, and I mean wrong with me. I started to throw up and then I got a sore throat. 
Outside, firefighters were already on the scene. They didn't know either about the dangerous levels of radiation, and many of those brave guys would die slow, horrible deaths. In the town nearby, people stood outside, mesmerized by this great big beam of light. Some of those people would also die from radiation poisoning. But as I said, no one really knew about the danger they were in. I had a good idea as time went on, because at about 6 am I couldn't even walk. I felt deathly ill. The grim reaper of radiation was inside of me, slowly trying to relieve me of my life, my kid, my loving wife. I was taken to the hospital, and there a few of us talked about what was happening to us, just how much radiation had we been exposed to. One guy seemed to know what he was talking about, and he said if you throw up like that so quickly, well, it's a lot. We might even die. In fact, I later learned that vomiting after radiation poisoning means death for most people. I found out I'd been exposed to 4.1 sievert of radiation. You don't know what that means of course, but let me tell you that it was about 650 times above the level that workers at a nuclear plant should get exposed not in an hour, but in a year. It's 5,000 times more than the average person should be exposed to in a whole year. I knew I was in trouble. Some of these guys I talked to at the hospital died horribly. In a way, you could say they melted from the inside. Then, things got more surreal when the KGB came to the hospital and started to talk to me. I was then told I had to go to Moscow, and that's where they took me without even informing my wife. 128 of us made that trip, and I believe 5 people in this group died. I mean died soon, of course. God knows who died as a result of being poisoned in the years to come. I got to Moscow, and one of the first things they did to me was shave my head. This was no time to care about appearances, and anyway, in a week, all my body hair just fell out. Most of us were having trouble breathing. Our eyes hurt. Our noses hurt. Everything seemed to hurt. Then we were given bone marrow transplants. I had many, in fact. What's really weird and chilling is the fact that me and a lot of guys suddenly felt a lot better. What we didn't know was with radiation poisoning at such high levels, there's kind of a rest period, a hiatus in the chaos happening inside. You think you're getting better, but then the worst stuff starts to happen. For me, a low point was pulling back my bed sheets one day and seeing my ulcerous skin dead. The worst parts of me were my shoulders, my hip, my calf. And that's because when I held that door, those parts were exposed to really high levels of radiation. Had I gone inside, well, that would have been game over for me. Parts of my body just seemed to be eaten alive. Bits of me just turned black. It was awful to see. I was turning into a monster, a kind of radioactive mutant. But I was lucky. I went through my operations and had lots of skin grafts. I wasn't dead, but when I was told I might lose my arm, I was a bit upset. They saved it, but it stayed covered in bandages for the next 7 years of my life. Even these days, I might occasionally see ulcerations on the parts of my skin that were most exposed to the radiation. One of the things that saved me was the fact that they sent me to Berlin to have microsurgery, where blood vessels were transferred from my leg to my arm. Like I said, I was lucky. I'm a fortunate man. One of those guys that worked close to me had similar surgeries. He went blind, and then within a month of his exposure, he died. What had happened to him and to the rest of us is bone marrow cells had been destroyed from the radiation, and this caused a drop in white blood cells. When that happens, you can't fight off infection, and that's when you slowly start to be eaten alive from within. I spent in total one year inside hospitals, and then for years after I had to regularly go back for rehab. They told me I shouldn't have another child, because the chances of that child developing leukemia were very high. Now and again I get morbid and think, when will the worst happen? But so far, my good old body has been excellent at repairing itself. My wife has stood by me, and it wasn't easy at times. People knew about what had happened to me and thought I was a walking time bomb. They'd cross the street when they saw me because they thought I'd pass the poison onto them. I was one of the monsters of Chernobyl to them, walking around with a radiation hazard sign on my back. But I'm here and I'm happy. I think I can now safely say that I survived Chernobyl. My name is Sasha Yevchenko, and that's my story. Sometimes you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, but it seems Lady Luck has your back. We might take the case of Dutch cyclist Martin de Jonge, who is said to have cheated death twice after being scheduled to travel on the two doomed flights Malaysia Airlines MH17 and MH370, but he didn't end up getting on either plane. But what about the Croatian man, Franz Selak? It's said he's escaped death no less than seven times, including being on a train that flipped off the tracks and hurtled into a river. Seventeen died, but not him. It's said on his first plane trip he was blown out the door, fell to the earth, and landed on a haystack. He was okay, but 19 people died that day. 
He survived more deadly events and then won over a million dollars in the lottery in 2003. But today we have a special case for you concerning the few human beings that have been on the right side of fortune. He's special because no one that ever existed has been in his shoes. Many people have been lone survivors of catastrophe, but there's no person on record that has survived two nuclear bombs. We're of course talking about the two bombs the USA dropped on Japan at the end of the Second World War. The first of those two bombs was dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, and the second bomb was dropped on the city of Nagasaki three days later. Just before we introduce you to the man of the day, we should probably look at just how lucky he was. At the time of the Hiroshima bombing, it's thought that the population of the city was around 340 to 350,000. Many of these people recounted later that they heard an explosion and saw a very bright light. Many others saw the same but were unable to later recount their experience because they were dead. It's said that of the entire city population, around 70,000 or 80,000 people either died instantly or died soon after due to severe burns. So that's a rather large chunk of the population, and we should say that many more people died later from injury or radiation exposure. You can try and find total deaths in historical resources, but no one seems to agree to the number. Many resources say that just months after the bomb was dropped, the death death toll was around 140,000, not much less than half of the city's residents. The US Department of Energy tells us after five years, the number could have been as high as 200,000, while some Japanese resources say even higher. While these deaths were from long-term effects, the man in today's show sailed through decades after the bombs were dropped. On top of that, the Japanese later said that around 70% of the city's buildings were totally destroyed, and quite a few more were damaged. Getting out of this almost unscathed was not easy by any means. But as we know, the Allies weren't finished just yet. Over the industrial city of Nagasaki, the population at the time of the bombing was said to be in the region of 260,000. These people were about to get their version of a Big Bang in a very bright light. The star of today's show was about to experience this for the second time in three days. Many of the city's factory workers, families, and students were instantly killed. But again, the exact number varies and you can find wide estimates. The number given for immediate deaths after the bomb is usually 40,000 to 75,000, but most agree that by the end of 1945, the number was around 80,000. The US Department of Energy tells us that just after five years, you could probably double that number. So that's around 160,000. Let's just say that at the time of the bombing, maybe close to a third of Nagasaki's residents and also non-residents such as POWs died. No doubt the focus of our show today was asking himself if dropping the second bomb was overkill. Many people today say there was really no need to hit a second city, but we won't get into that. Ok, so it's about time we introduce you to our man. His name was Tsutsomu Yamaguchi. He was born in 1916 and lived until 2010, making him a natural survivor as well as someone who's dodged a rather large bullet a couple of times. Just so you know, while others may have survived both bombs, he is the only person who the Japanese government recognized as doing so. Ok, so Mr. Yamaguchi in his 30s actually lived in Nagasaki, but he made the unfortunate decision or was told to go to Hiroshima on a business trip the month of August 1945. At the time, he was working for Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, and it's said business wasn't exactly booming as Japan was suffering in its war effort. In fact, Yamaguchi, who never thought Japan would go to war, said later in interviews that he had considered killing his entire family with pills if Japan lost. He also explained what happened on the big day. When the blast occurred in Hiroshima, he said he had just gotten off a tram. What's surprising is that this tram was a mere two miles from ground zero. In an interview in 2005, he said this of the moment it all happened. It was very clear, a really fine day, nothing unusual about it at all. I was in good spirits. As I was walking along, I heard the sound of a plane, just one. I looked up into the sky and saw the B-29 and it dropped two parachutes. I was looking up at them and suddenly it was like a flash of magnesium, a great flash in the sky and I was blown over. Three miles away is certainly close enough to be one of those immediate fatalities we talked about. He didn't exactly take it on the chin though, explaining that he was temporarily blinded. He had his eardrums popped and suffered burns to the top half of his body. He later said this, When the noise and the blast had subsided, I saw a huge mushroom-shaped pillar of fire rising high up into the sky. It was like a tornado. In another interview, he said, I don't know what had happened. 
I think I fainted for a while. When I opened my eyes, everything was dark, and I couldn't see much. It was like the start of a film at the cinema, before the picture has begun when the blank frames are just flashing up without any sound. Believe it or not, he told the press years later, he decided the best thing to do was to go back home to Nagasaki and report for work. Covered in bandages, he made his way the next day to the train station. Looking at the devastation around him, risking radiation poisoning, he didn't know that. To find a way back to his presumably safe city, he said he encountered dead bodies strewn around. It was mayhem. Bodies floated in the river like blocks of wood, he said. He had to cross that river since the bridge was destroyed, saying he trod on the bodies of women and children and men, what he has called his human raft. Walking through the streets, he described what he saw. People, bodies, their skin had peeled, their flesh was wet and mushy, and they had no faces. Their eyes, noses, and mouths had been burned away, and it looked like their ears had melted off. He managed to get back to Nagasaki and was relieved to find his wife and six-month-old son alive and well. News didn't travel too fast back in those days, and Yamaguchi told his bosses of the devastation a bomb had caused in Hiroshima. He said they didn't believe him, that just one bomb could flatten a whole city and they questioned his sanity. They would soon know exactly what he was talking about, because their city was next. This is what he said in a translated interview with the American media many years later. I was telling my company supervisor in Nagasaki that one bomb had destroyed all of Hiroshima. He told me I was crazy. Just as he said that, the bomb fell on Nagasaki. He also said just before that happened, his boss had said to him, you're an engineer, calculated. How could one bomb destroy a whole city? Boom. That's how might have been the answer. On the day of the bombing, yet again Yamaguchi was about three miles from ground zero. Again, he was knocked to the ground, but he managed to get to his feet and had no idea what was going on. You must remember that the world had no idea something so powerful existed. It wasn't as if Yamaguchi had watched infomercials that people in the West saw years later talking about the deadly destruction of an atomic bomb. Yamaguchi later said in an interview, I thought the mushroom cloud had followed me from Hiroshima. This time his family weren't so safe. And while they weren't as close to Ground Zero as the Patriarch, they felt the bomb. In a strange twist of fate, his wife that day had been out looking to buy ointment that could help with her husband's burns. Her house was much closer to Ground Zero than the place she was at the time of the explosion. Yamaguchi later said that the fact that he'd been hit by the first bomb might have saved his wife from the second bomb. Even so, Yamaguchi's daughter said years later in an interview that her mother had told her she was soaked in black rain and was poisoned. She lived until 88 but did die of liver and kidney cancer. Her brother would also succumb to cancer in his 50s, and her older sister said she had been chronically ill her entire life. She even said that she believes her mother passed the poison she had been engulfed with to them. During life after the bombings, Yamaguchi was quiet and very rarely spoke about his experience. But later he said he felt compelled to talk about the horror of nuclear war. My double radiation exposure is now an official government record. It can tell the younger generation the horrifying history of the atomic bombings even after I die, he said. In a separate interview, he also said, Having been granted this miracle, it is my responsibility to pass on the truth to the people of the world. One day, Yamaguchi said, he hoped there would be no bombs that destructive in the world, that countries would agree not to chase such technology that could almost destroy every person on the planet and undo civilization as we know it. In one of his final interviews, he said, Japan can't rid the world of nuclear weapons by itself. The whole world needs to hold hands and prevent this type of war. Mr. Obama is now the US president, and I listened to his speech. Maybe there is hope. He died in January 2010 from stomach cancer. We've all seen the Hollywood movies where the good guy has an epic shootout with a thousand bad guys, and after gunning them all down, the lead bad guy fires off one bullet and hits our hero in the shoulder, or maybe the leg. Somewhere painful, but you know, not lethal. Then the bad guy goes down in a hail of gunfire, as the hero wins the day through superior firepower. What's not shown in these Hollywood movies, though, is just how dangerous it is to get shot. Yes, even a quote flesh wound, end quote. Today, though, we're going to explore what happens to your body when you get shot and how to survive a gunshot wound. Obviously, no one thinks a gunshot wound to the head is a great idea, but surely getting shot in the shoulder or the leg will make you look pretty heroic and maybe hurt real bad, but not be life-threatening? Sadly, it's time to toss all of those myths out the window, because yes, even a shot to the shoulder, and especially the leg, can be fatal. 
Bullets travel fast. That's why Superman is famously portrayed as faster than a speeding bullet. What you may not realize though is just how fast they travel. A 9mm bullet of the same caliber used by most police officers travels at a whopping 900 miles an hour, while a 5.56 round of the same type used by American combat carbines typically travels at around 2,045 miles per hour. A 7.62mm round of the same type used by heavy American machine guns and the AK family of Russian combat rifles travels on average at about 1,841 miles per hour. Those incredible speeds means that they contain an incredible amount of kinetic energy. Bullets, however, are very small things. Most are under an inch. But what they lack in mass, they more than make up for in acceleration. And remember that in Newton's second law of motion, the relationship between speed and kinetic energy is not additive, it's quadratic. With such incredible velocities, even small rounds can deliver a truly terrifying amount of energy. Take for example the humble 9mm bullet. Even with its small size, it can still deliver on average 542 joules of energy, while the 5.56mm round packs around 1,763 joules, and the 7.62 round around 3,525 joules. When a bullet enters the body, all of that energy it's carrying has to go somewhere, and that's going to be your soft, fleshy body tissues. As the bullet enters, the shockwave of impact causes your flesh to expand and creates a large cavity, which then very quickly falls back in on itself. This huge shock through your body's tissues can severely damage internal organs, even if the bullet didn't actually pierce any of them. Next is damage that the bullets cause once they're inside your body. In the movies, the good guy gets shot in the arm or the leg and the bullet is fished out and the wound cauterized and bam! Just like that, the hero is ready to go back to chewing bubblegum and kicking ass. In real life, things tend to get messy. Especially if the bullet's final stop is somewhere nice and bony, like a shoulder. That's because bullets are very prone to fragmenting once hitting something solid like bone, due to their incredible velocities, and the fact that bullets tend to be made up of layers of different materials. Striking a bone, or sometimes even just the extreme stresses of rapid deceleration inside the human body, can be enough to fragment a bullet into many pieces, and this can make things really messy. Fragments of a bullet will explode outwards in different directions, causing even more damage to surrounding tissues and organs. Bullets that retain most of their mass are even prone to bouncing around inside the body cavity if they happen to strike bone. And needless to say, having a piece of very sharp deformed metal bouncing around inside of you like a pinball machine is not great for your health. The body is notoriously allergic to being shot at, and it tends to react to bullet wounds by trying to pump as much of the blood you have inside of you into your immediate vicinity. This rapid and extreme blood loss is what makes bullets so potentially fatal, as even severe organs and tissue damage can be repaired or survived given a fast enough medical response. With all of your red, red crewy leaking out of you at an alarming rate though, death is just minutes or even seconds away. Top scientists have labored for decades and have at last determined that the best way to survive getting shot at is to try to keep as much of your blood inside your body where it belongs. So our survival tip number one for surviving a gunshot wound is to apply immediate pressure to the wound site. You want to try and wrap bandages of some sort, even dirty t-shirts would do, around the wound itself and maintain constant pressure in order to slow the blood loss. If shot on a limb, elevate it above the heart to minimize blood loss and keep the pressure on. You should very quickly be on your way to the hospital, but if you happen to be on a solo Rambo-esque mission in the middle of the jungle against evil drug lords, then the important thing is to maintain pressure and never ever remove the bandage, no matter how bloody they get. Removing a bandage on a wound can actually tear open the wound again after your body has worked very hard to seal it up through coagulation. Of course, you could try the popular Hollywood method of cauterization, which is a very good way of stopping blood flow if you know what you're doing. Only certain types of wounds can be successfully cauterized without submitting large parts of your body to terrible third-degree burns. And even worse, without very prompt medical attention, those third-degree burns could pose an even greater risk of deadly infection than your single bullet wound. 
If blood loss can't be stopped or slowed down significantly and the wound is on a limb, it's time to take drastic measures. You're going to want to get your hands on a stick and tear up your shirt into a long strip. Tie the shirt above the wound but before the torso, and then wrap the ends of the shirt around the stick and start turning the stick in circles like a crank. This will tighten the shirt around your limb to painful levels, but you need to keep going. You need to tighten your makeshift bandage so tight that it cuts off all blood flow to your wound. And yes, this does mean that if you don't get very prompt medical attention, you will end up losing the limb. Without blood flow, the limb's tissues will die off, but your life will be saved by preventing you from bleeding out. Tourniquets, as these makeshift devices are known, can be lifesavers and are a last-ditch measure to save someone's life. In the end, the best way to survive a gunshot wound is to not get shot in the first place. But if you do get shot, you need to remember to keep constant pressure on the wound and as a last resort, create a makeshift tourniquet and tie off the affected limb. Better to lose an arm or a leg than to bleed out and die. With modern medicine, even the most grievous gunshot wounds can be very survivable, and doctors often talk about the golden hour, where if a trauma victim can be on a surgical table within an hour, that person's life can likely be saved. It's burning hot outside, temperatures well over 100 degrees, and the air conditioning on our up-armored Humvee barely does a thing unless you press yourself right up against the vent. I'm really tempted to let down the window, but even when the wind blows out here in the desert, it just feels like a blow dryer to your face. Also, we're stopped, and it's hardly safe to let your bullet-resistant windows down in this part of the country when your vehicle's at a dead standstill. I'm a fire team leader, and my team and I are providing escort security for a VIP in the Humvee in front of us. Directly in front of his Humvee is two others, and the lead Humvee stops because of a suspicious pile of trash on the road ahead. But now everyone's on edge when they travel these roads. The insurgency has been hiding IEDs and everything from children's toys to random piles of trash and triggering them as a NATO column moves by. We've stopped for about a minute now and I'm getting really nervous. This is my first deployment and I've heard stories about what happens when your convoy sits still for too long. On the radio I hear the VIP, some general, call out to the lead vehicle, just shoot the damn thing and drive past. That actually sounds like a good idea. It's moments later and the lead vehicle opens up with a 50 caliber machine gun in its turret. There's a dull thump sound and past the three vehicles in front of me I can see a cloud of dust rising up into the air. Yep. It was an IED after all. Suddenly I'm more nervous than I was before, if that's even possible. We're supposed to have an MRAP with us to clear the way. That's a mine resistant ambush protected vehicle that we've been told can take an IED to the face and keep on trucking. They just got in theater though, and as usual, maintenance issues means they weren't ready to go when we needed them. The lead vehicle is waiting until visibility is restored before pressing forward again. No point driving straight through a thick dust cloud into whatever may have been waiting for our lead vehicle to take that IED and get knocked out. There's zero chance any insurgents in the area know of our VIP cargo, but to them hitting one convoy is as good as any other. They just want to score casualties. Still nervous about sitting still, I tell our Mark 19 automatic grenade launcher gunner who is looking behind us and providing rear security to keep his head on a swivel. Then it happens. There's a dull thwack 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 sound, and three cracks appear on the driver's side bullet resistant front window. I can see dull sparks from rounds pinging off the armor of the Humvee in front of us. Without needing to be told, the M60 gunner in that Humvee immediately spins his turret and starts putting out fire into the field to our left where the firing is coming from. My mouth goes dry. This is it, and I very desperately want one of two things to happen. I want the convoy lead to order us to dismount, because sitting in a Humvee is not a good place to be when the bad guys have RPGs. Even if you're driving an up-armored version like we are. I also want the convoy to just press forward, pedal to the metal, get the hell out of here. That's exactly what doctrine states in most situations. You push out of the ambush zone, but we don't move. Then we get a question over the radio. Are we receiving fire to the rear? Negative. After a moment, the convoy lead asks for our gunner to lay down a 100 meter by 100 meter barrage on the field we're taking sporadic fire from. I yell at my gunner, who seems eager to obey the order. A half second later, there's the dull thumping from the huge automatic grenade launcher, and in my stomach, I can feel the impact of the 40 millimeter grenades exploding. He puts out fire in a 100 by 100 meter square as instructed, because we can't see the shooters, and in my head, I remember practicing the same tactic when I too qualified on the Mark 19. I always pictured myself painting a giant box, the grenades being full of paint and making sure every single square inch of that box got filled in. The fire we were taking dies off long before our gunner finishes his job, then immediately turns his turret around to provide rear security again. We sit in silence for a few moments, and the order to go forward is given. I look down at my watch, and incredibly, only two and a half minutes have passed since we stopped for the suspected IED. My first combat felt like hours, and it was 
barely 150 seconds. Later we get word that a security sweep of the area found the remains of three bodies. When I hear the news I realize that these guys weren't the real deal, probably just some fired up kids hoping to take out some Americans and make a name for themselves. The real insurgency is a lot better at their jobs. It's now two days later, 1800 hours. We just got out of a briefing for tonight's op and are headed for Chow. We've been tasked with providing security for some intelligence guys as they lead us to a house in a local village. Tonight's going to be a snatching grab. The target is a bomb maker who is suspected of being pretty high up the chain, and likely the guy who either built the bomb the teenagers who got themselves KIA the other day tried to use, or planted it himself and left them behind to try and take out some Americans. The intel guy suspected he's been sent there by his higher ups to try and bolster the local insurgents. This area has been relatively quiet for years, but we're getting intel from locals that the insurgent forces are moving back in. If we can take this guy alive, it'll be a huge intelligence victory. So we're told over and over again how important it is we practice strict fire discipline. Also, the house is located in the very center of the village and packed right in next to two other houses on each side. The walls in most of these houses are really thin, and even our M4s can punch through these walls and hit someone on the other side. Limiting civilian casualties is critical. Nobody wants to be responsible for killing a sippy. I'm scared to death, but I try not to show it for the sake of my team. The prospect of going into the middle of a village to try to snatch a high-ranking enemy VIP makes my stomach churn. We've trained extensively for urban combat, even went through FBI training in close quarters battle or CBQ, and I know it can be a nightmare. There's too many places to hide or get ambushed from. Civilians everywhere. In military parlance, it's a total shit show. Also, tonight we can't go in with heavy weapons. We're limited to just M249 saws on the Humvees, and even those are for emergencies only. The M249 is like the smaller cousin of the M60 or the M240 Bravos, and there's something about seeing the big 60s or 240s on a turret that makes me feel safer, or preferably a 50 cal in a Mark 19. Everyone's in high spirits though, only one other guy on our team has seen combat before, our sharpshooter. He doesn't really like to talk about it, but none of the snipers ever really do. Through a long range scope, you can see the faces of the people you shoot at, and that makes the war real personal for those guys. It's now a 100 hours, and we're rolling back down a road on route to our target. The great thing about this part of the country is that few of these places have electricity, and the clear desert skies let you see more stars than you've ever seen in your life. The starlight is good for us. It let's us drive our Humvees and one escorting Bradley without headlights. Everyone uses night vision instead. Our vehicles may be loud, but we want to give the enemy as little a heads up as possible. A half hour later, we're rolling into the village, and everyone's on high alert. I remember asking during the briefing why we didn't just stop short of the target and hoof it. I feel safer approaching on foot without the vehicles making a bunch of noise and alerting the village the moment we enter. They want this to be a quick operation though, literally drive up to the guy's front door and yank him out before anyone has a chance to react. On paper, it seemed like a good idea. In reality, I have my doubts, and those doubts grow as I start to see curtains being pulled back in windows and faces looking down at us in surprise. We're at the target block of houses within a minute of arriving though and I find myself hopeful that we're fast enough to take off guard anyone who might be protecting the enemy VIP. I tell our driver to pull to the back of the houses. Us and the second team are tasked with securing the rear of the buildings and making sure nobody makes a run for it or tries to ambush us from this location. We're out of the Humvee in seconds, taking up positions overlooking the rear and corners of the five block row of houses. I look back and see my gunner in the turret behind the 249, and something in my gut tells me to get him off that turret. This is supposed to be a fast op, in and out, so it makes sense for him to stay in the turret, but I can't explain. Something tells me to get him and that gun down, so I do. He ends up taking position by one of the tires of the Humvee, proned out and gun facing down the road we're on. I can hear the entry team bash the front door in, and on cue two of our guys back here pop flashbacks inside the two windows on the rear of the small target house. Up front, they do the same thing, and almost simultaneously, there's the roar of four or five bangers going off at once. We have no idea where in the one-story house this guy is at, but we're not taking any chances. If he was awake and waiting for a fight, I guarantee he's no longer in a condition to do so. Everybody gets tense, waiting for the sound of gunfire, but there's nothing. Just the screaming of some civilians. A man and his wife and kids run out of one of the next door houses and take off down the street, fleeing in terror. We let him go. Then there's a call over the radio. We hit the wrong house. The intel guy screwed up. Bad. The only people inside are an old woman and her two older daughters. The old woman's in bad shape from the bangers and she needs medical treatment ASAP. 
I hear the call to abort. We lost the element to surprise, and the last thing our 20-man crew wants to do is get caught with our pants down as they currently are in the middle of this village. Everyone starts rushing for the Humphies. Up front, they're taking the old woman and her daughters into the Bradley so they can rush them back to base for medical attention. Briefly, I think about my own grandmother. What if it had been her in that house? We made this mess. Now we gotta clean it up and make it right. Suddenly, there's light, then heat. Finally, a roar. I'm staring up at the sky and I can barely hear anything. Slowly, my hearing comes back. Then I look over at my Humvee, just 40 feet away and it's in flames. Took an RPG and it looks like the gas tank got hit. There's burning diesel everywhere. Immediately, I look for my gunner and I see him miraculously laying down fire towards a house a block over. The thick, heavy-duty tire and axle somehow protected him from the blast. War is so random sometimes. My head's all fuzzy as I look at my gunner firing away. And I keep remembering, don't fire unless you need to, and keep off the 249s unless absolutely critical. There's civilians everywhere. I open my mouth to tell him to stop firing, but then I see the dust that's being kicked up all around me. Little explosions of dust everywhere, and I realize we're being shot at a lot. My hearing finally comes back as I crawl for cover behind a short concrete wall. The air is full of sharp cracks, and it dawns on me that that's the sound of being on the wrong end of a bullet. I make contact with my team checking for any casualties. Everybody's fine, but the other team with us has a guy down. My mind races as I take stock of the situation. We're being told to extract ASAP, but I radio back that our Humvee's out and we got one casualty. The fire's coming from a house directly up the street from us, and I realize that this was probably the house we were looking for all along. Just our luck to be caught right out there in the open in front of it too. There's fire coming from two of the front-facing windows, and somewhere to the left of the house in another building as well. My guys are returning fire best they can, and the 249 is chewing up the front of the house, but having to stop for reloads every 30 seconds or so, he's got no assistant gunner with him this time to help him reload. We weren't supposed to need it. I can see the figures darting in and out of the house, the left and right, and I realize they figured out that we're just a small team, not even a full strength platoon's worth of soldiers, and three of them are intel guys I'm not sure have fired a rifle since basic. I remember my training. We studied the Russian invasion of Afghanistan a lot. Their biggest mistake was staying put when under fire, letting the Mujahideen maneuver on them and outflank them. They took huge casualties because of that. We don't stay put. I order my saw gunner to stick with the other fire team to protect the wounded. Now they have two and I take my two other guys and make a break to our left. We duck behind another row of houses and start slowly sweeping forward. We may be under strength, but we've been trained to fight aggressively. A second fire team from the front of the house is mirroring our movement on a parallel street. One of their Humvees got knocked out as well, and we're down to two Humvees in the Bradley. Not enough room to move everyone out. We didn't bring spare vehicles because, again, we were supposed to be in and out. The US military has learned from its mistakes. Too often units have sat still, holding defensive positions waiting for extraction or a chance to make a break for it, racking up casualties the whole time. Not us. We got one way out of this mess and that's to jump straight into the teeth of it. We take four guys completely by surprise. They're practically jogging down the middle of the street, not even bothering to move tactically rifles up. Yes, they expected us to hunker down, to sit still. Their mistake they'll pay for it. It's a lot like shooting targets at the firing range. A few quick squeezes on the trigger and it's over in a couple of seconds. The three of us opening up almost simultaneously. We're now just a few houses over from the new target house, which is being hammered by one of the front team's 249s and incredibly still has people shooting back out of it. The other fire team maneuvering up also ran into their own bad guys, but they got pinned down in a firefight. Yes, their perps were smarter about how they moved toward an ongoing fight. We fixed the number of hostiles by now though, two still firing inside the house and three engaging the fire team maneuvering up the street across from us. There's another estimated three down inside the house, two in front of it after trying to make a break out the front door, plus the four my team got. That's 14 hostiles total, nine now KIA, who were all either living in or next to the target house. Suddenly, I'm really happy we didn't hit the right house. It would have been a bloodbath for the entry teams. It's a small village though, and the good news is that with so many hostiles in one spot, it's unlikely there's reinforcements coming from anywhere else. This gives me an idea. It's insane, and I surprise myself when I realize I'm already transmitting it over the radio. I'm even more surprised when we get the go-ahead. We've been cleared to storm the house, take out the last two guys, hopefully seize the enemy VIP still alive, all with a three-man assault squad. It's insane, I keep telling myself as we move toward the rear of the house, guns up and eyes trained on the windows and doors around us, but especially the rear door of the house. It's been left wide open, probably from the haste the guys trying to maneuver on us were in. I'm afraid. 
damn afraid. I'm about to literally jump into the shark's mouth and take guys with me, but I push it out of my mind. I realize that this is the first time I've been afraid since the fighting actually started. I've been running on pure adrenaline, brain falling back on training. I go back to that place and I try to think about what's coming next as just another training exercise, just another breaching exercise. Move in, shoot the stationary target dummies, don't shoot the civilian dummies, reset the course, do it all over again. At the back of the house, I peer into one of the rear windows. There's what looks like a messy bedroom that sleeps at least a dozen guys, blankets all over the floor, but it's clear. The back door leads to what I'm assuming is a hallway. Slowly, the three of us maneuver on that door, stopping just to the right of it. This was my stupid idea, so it's my head that peers out and into the open door. Long hallway, and I can hear what sounds like two guys firing from one of the rooms at the end of the hallway. Looks like they didn't leave any rear security. Again, probably expected us to sit tight, defend our casualties, and wait for extract. This is a new ward though, we don't sit and wait for air support anymore. Hit us, and we're going for the jugular. I call for the gunner still putting fire on the house to aim high. The machine gunner is now shifting his fire up, hitting the roof of the building so he doesn't inadvertently put rounds through the thin walls and into us. By keeping up the fire though, he's drawing the attention of the two guys still inside, making them think they're still taking direct fire. I take point. Again, it's my bad idea, might as well be the first in. Also, it's my team. The thought of one of the guys buying it and me going home safe because I was second or third in scares me more than this firefight. We stack on the side of the door, just like in training, ready to burst in almost simultaneously. The third man on the stack squeezes the shoulder of the second guy, who in turn squeezes my shoulder. That's the cue, and on getting that squeeze, I silently whip into the door, rifle up and ready. It's supposed to be a four-man stack, but we adapt. I push past the first door on the left, and the two men behind me whip into the room. I hold position just past the door, still focused dead ahead where the shooting is coming from, a room further down the hall on the right. A second later, the two come out of the door, whispering all clear. We press forward once again. The hallway is tight, too tight for the guys behind me to safely fire if anything happens without running the risk of hitting me in the back, so I'm all the security we have as we move forward. I'm duck walking, my feet spread widely apart and chest forward to the enemy. That way if I do take a round, it'll go straight into the thick armor plate covering my chest. It's an awkward technique to learn at first, but we've practiced it so long that it's easy as regular walking for me. I keep expecting someone to pop out ahead of us, but nobody does. The two firing away in the room ahead to our left are still completely unaware we're in the house. There's a body up ahead lying in the hallway. By now we're close enough to the front that I can see all the bullet holes in the walls where our rifle and machine gun fire tore straight through the thin walls of the home. This guy must have caught rounds that came through the closed front door when the fight started. I take a quick look at the body which is lying face up and then call for the man behind me to cover me as I take a knee real quick. His rifle goes up as I duck down, checking a photo in my pocket the intel guys provided us with. Yep, it's him, the bomb maker. Now, just another KIA. The entire mission is basically pointless now, just two loose ends left to tie up. The saw gunner out front has been strafing the far left side of the house and the roof to make it seem like he's still opening up on the bad guy shooting out the window. Now I call him over the radio. He pulls his fire up even higher, putting it clear over the roof of the building and into the sky. Me and my team are directly outside the bad guy's door now. I don't feel anything. Just another run through the CQB course back home. Nothing to it but swing in, fan out, take out your dummy targets and press on. I feel that squeeze in my shoulder, and operating purely from instinct, I swing into the doorway and press forward. In CQB, you slice up a room into individual fields of fire, and each man has his own slice. It's vital you clear your slice first, even if there's no bad guy there, because if you ignore it to open up on a bad guy in somebody else's slice, you could miss someone. And now that bad guy you didn't put down is going to put you down and your team down. I swing into the room and press forward just like in training. First man in, I'm responsible for the far left rear corner of the room, away from the front facing windows, away from the bad guys. The second and third man are in the room just split seconds after me. There's silence at first, then the roar of gunfire coming from my guys. My slice of the room is clear, so I turn to the known threats, but they're already down. They never saw us coming, never dreamed we would do anything but hunker down and try to defend ourselves. In combat, whoever has the initiative is typically the victor. We've been trained to be aggressive, to seize the initiative and deny it to the enemy, keep him off balance. Tonight, that training saved our lives. I think about this night later, and I find myself glad that my slice of the room had been clear. I'm glad it wasn't me that had to put down a hostel at point-blank range, close enough to see their face. Day 1 I still remember the night before. I'd gone out to celebrate a friend's birthday. We had no idea it would be the last normal night of life on Earth. At just past 6 in the morning, I was woken up by a massive roaring sound and a bright flash of light. It felt like a giant body slammed me as I got picked up and thrown out of my bed. Good thing, too, because the ceiling came crashing down where my bed used to be. The entire side of my three-story apartment building ripped away, 
and a hurricane force wind as hot as an oven washed over me, giving me first and second degree burns, and I was one of the lucky ones. Anybody caught out in the street was instantly vaporized or torn to shreds by the pressure wave. I found out later that it was a quirk in our local geography that saved my life because the buildings 300 feet north of me and toward the detonation point just happened to be on a slight hill about 45 feet higher than my apartment building, causing the hill to absorb most of the pressure wave, sparing me and a few other survivors. When my hearing came back, I thought about trying to save people but remembered that immediately after a nuclear explosion, you have about 10 to 15 minutes to find shelter from the fallout. So I immediately grabbed what few supplies I could get my hands on and ran for the underground parking garage of our apartment building. On the way, I yelled at a few survivors to join me, but only four of them did. The rest were too dazed or confused to pay attention, or were too busy trying to dig out buried friends and family from the rubble. Sadly, it would soon be too late for them as well as a massive cloud of radioactive fallout crashed over the city after being swept miles up into the air by the initial blast. There was nothing we could do, as the five of us huddled in a storage closet on the second basement level of our apartment building. I don't even know when night came, I just remember finally falling asleep from pure emotional exhaustion. Days 2 through 7 In my first week surviving nuclear war, there wasn't much to do except make our shelter better. Luckily, the people I was with had been as fast thinking as me, so we had barely enough water between us to survive a week if we rationed it. Food was something else. Even rationing it, the food would only last about 4 days. That's okay, water's more important than food. Every 24 hours that you can remain away from radioactive fallout, the danger level drops exponentially, so we knew we had to stay in our shelter for at least a week to get to survivable levels of fallout. The power had gone out immediately after the bomb's impact from the massive EMP blast that it caused. It had burned out all of our electronics, including phones, so even if we had reception, it would have been impossible to get news from the outside world. Inside our shelter were me, my two neighbors Lilith and Alexis, and the elderly couple who lived down the hall from us, Mr. and Mrs. Vasquez. We tried to piece together what had happened to us, and Mr. Vasquez was sure that shortly after the first blast, he heard a second one in the distance. That confirmed it for me. Whatever happened to LA wasn't an accident or a nuclear terrorist attack. The fact that there were multiple impacts means this was an attack by a modern ICBM carrying multiple warheads. This left only Russia or China, which left us with a bigger question. Was the world at nuclear war, or was this just a single attack? With no working radio or telephone, it was impossible to tell. We huddled in that basement until the end of seven days, lit only by an old flashlight that Mrs. Vasquez had brought with that had incredibly survived the EMP blast. Days 8 through 12. I knew it was dangerous to leave our shelter even after seven days. Ideally, you want to remain in place for 10 to 14 days until radioactive particles have lost most of their energy, but we were out of water and Mrs. Vasquez was looking really bad. Me, Alexis, and Lilith had all given up our last two days of water rations for her, despite her initial refusal, but eventually she accepted. At this point, the danger comes from inhaling radioactive particles, or having them land on exposed skin, and getting into cuts, scrapes, or even wounds. Once inside, they bathe your body with radioactivity, and despite being very low yield, it's still dangerous enough to kill you if you breathe in a lot of particles. We used the very last of our water to soak up several rags and put them around our mouths and noses and did our best to cover up any exposed skin. When we finally dug our way out of the parking garage and into the city, we were shocked by what we saw. The famous LA skyline was gone. Only a few skeletal remains of our big downtown buildings remained. Our neighborhood had been completely devastated by the impact. It was an absolute miracle we survived. But that also meant that we were in the most dangerous fallout area, being so close to the point of detonation. We had to move, and we had to move fast. What affected us the most was the bodies. There wasn't much left of the people who'd been caught in the open when the bomb exploded, and what was left now was the remains of the people who had choked to death on radioactive dust, or burned from within after inhaling vast quantities of it. These people had survived the impact, but hadn't taken proper shelter. They were probably forced out into the streets in a desperate attempt to find help or food or water. Instead, they found more radioactive dust. It was a sober reminder that we needed to take decontamination of our clothes and bodies very seriously once we found a better long-term shelter. We decided to head out of downtown LA and head toward the San Fernando Valley. It was unlikely that the valley would have taken a direct hit since there wasn't really much of commercial or military value there. Plus, the Bob Hope Airport is a federal emergency response site, meaning this is where the government would send rescue and supplies in an emergency. It's likely whoever attacked us might have known this and targeted the valley anyway, but it was the best course of action available to us. However, we needed water and food, as we were all feeling faint, so we picked our way through the debris and traveled just over a mile before we found a corner store which had been blasted open. 
Luckily for us, there was still plenty of sealed water and other drinks, as well as food on the stock shelves. The plastic would be enough to keep things from being contaminated, but to be safe, we only took items from the very rear of the shelves, stuff that would have had the least amount of radioactive dust sitting on it after a few days. I insisted we hunker down, now that we had food and water, and wait for the weak mark, so that nearly all of the most dangerous radioactive fallout would fade to acceptable levels. We found a garage just outside the blast zone and packed it with food and water, then closed the door behind us, and we waited. Days 13 and 14. We had plundered some extra clothes from the ruins so that we could change out of the radioactive dust-covered clothing, and we were careful to seal up all the outside openings with duct tape so that the dust wouldn't blow in. We even wasted precious water to carefully wash ourselves free of the dangerous dust. That required the buddy system, and I have to admit, I was glad that Alexis chose me as her buddy. She lived next door to me for a few months now, and I'd always had a crush on her. I guess there's worse people I could have gotten stranded in a post-apocalyptic world with. But was it really the apocalypse or was it just a local event? Maybe the US and Russia or China just exchanged the tit-for-tat attack, and then the powers that be thought better of plunging the entire world into nuclear hell. There was just no way of knowing. Before we entered our shelter, we had scanned the skies looking for any sign of air traffic, but never saw or heard a single plane or helicopter. That bothered me. But the military and government could very well be busy dealing with catastrophes elsewhere. It didn't necessarily mean the world had come to an end. Mrs. Vasquez had been hiding her hurt foot, but eventually the pain was too much for her and she came clean, showing it to us. She must have injured it sometime during the attack, and when we ventured out of our shelter, radioactive dust had gotten into the wound. It looked brackish and brown, and the brown was spreading. Plus, she'd started coughing and looking pale. None of us wanted to say it, but we all knew she was dying. The radioactive debris had entered her bloodstream and spread around her body. Radioactivity was burning her alive from the inside out. Days 15 to 20. Mrs. Vasquez died on day 15, just as we decided it was finally safe enough to walk around outside. The group would have to get used to people dying, if the worst had really happened, but it hit us really hard. We'd become a small family in the last two weeks, and as far as we knew it, we were the only survivors in a city of millions. We were literally all we had. We couldn't bury Mrs. Vasquez because that would mean stirring up the radioactive dirt, so instead we sealed her inside the garage and marked the door with spray paint promising to come back and give her a proper burial when we could. The group took extra precautions against dust and debris. Just because most of the radioactivity had died down by now, it didn't mean travel was safe, but we had to keep moving. Our supplies would only last a few more days, so we had to find another safe location to raid for food and water. Plus, all of us were eager to make it to the valley and find out if the rest of the world had survived or not. We kept traveling east, away from downtown, eventually making it to the 101 freeway. It was hard going through since it was choked with all kinds of cars and debris. Sometimes we had to climb over stacks of cars, like they were small mountains, though most of the time we were forced to detour to find a way around because there was no way Mr. Vasquez was getting over them even with the help of ropes. Days 21 through 22. Alexis and I had been talking a lot at night, away from Lilith and Mr. Vasquez. We were all doing everything we could for Mr. Vasquez, but he was getting slower by the day. And there was nothing wrong with him physically. I think he was just too heartbroken and overwhelmed to go on. I couldn't imagine living through a nuclear attack and then losing the woman I'd loved for over 50 years. I guess maybe I too would want to give up. Alexis asked me if I'd ever leave anyone behind, even if they were slowing the group down. I told her absolutely not. She smiled and grabbed my hand for a second, giving it a firm squeeze. I couldn't help but smile back. But despite our constant encouragement, Mr. Vasquez was slowing down. He insisted once or twice that we go on ahead. He'd catch up with us, but we refused. On day 22, just before setting up camp inside a destroyed city bus, I heard something shuffling around outside. When I went to investigate, I was shocked to find a dog. It was a poodle something mix. You could tell he was really hungry from how skinny he was. I was amazed we hadn't found anybody or anything else that had survived yet in the last three weeks. Just tons of corpses of people who had died trying to flee the city only to run into the fallout. He was nervous. Obviously, he'd been alone for the last three weeks. But his instincts to seek out people eventually won and he came over when I called him. The group gathered together to meet him and incredibly he was still wearing a collar with a tag that read Lucky. Well, he was definitely lucky to have survived the explosion and the fallout, so the name suited him perfectly. Having him join us really lifted all our spirits, and we needed it badly. Even Mr. Vasquez smiled for the first time since his wife died. The next day we set out again with renewed vigor. Days 23 through 26. 
Traveling from downtown to the San Fernando Valley on a normal day can take up to an hour thanks to traffic. It was taking us over two weeks because of all the wrecks, debris, and need to stop and constantly replenish our supplies. Mr. Vasquez wasn't helping matters either. He had briefly perked up after Lucky joined our group, but he soon was lagging behind again. I didn't blame him. His heart was broken. I couldn't imagine the pain of losing someone you've spent half a century with. But when I did try, I caught myself looking over in Alexis's direction. Sometimes I caught her looking back my way too. On day 26, we met another two survivors, a brother and a sister duo, who had the same idea as us. They'd survived inside a house just outside downtown, and Annie, the sister, had been smart enough to make Ben, her brother, shelter in place with her until after the fallout settled. Annie told us she was sure there were other survivors still huddled up in houses around the city, but there were so many corpses in the streets that we were sure most people had died from fallout poisoning. We were glad to have more company, especially Lilith, who had been feeling a little lonely since me and Alexis were hanging out so much. Day 27 Mr. Vasquez didn't wake up on the morning of the 27th day. There was nothing physically wrong with him, he just given up. It was still far too dangerous to dig, so we laid him to rest best we could and said a few words, promising to try to get word to any surviving relatives. Days 28 through 32 we were moving slightly faster now, but the freeway had suffered serious enough damage in parts that we were forced to leave it and head to the side streets, which slowed us down again. However, that's where we found something truly chilling, a body. But this wasn't like the other bodies we'd been finding since we left our shelter. This was different. It was fresh, maybe just a few days old, and the cause of death was obvious. Someone had shot this person and left them to die. The fact that the body had been stripped of anything valuable told us everything we needed to know. Everyone's worst fear had come to pass. There was at least one group of looters out here, preying on travelers. I suppose it was inevitable. I remember a quote from somewhere that went something like, civilization only lasts as long as the lights are on. We were now on the lookout for weapons to defend ourselves with, and we decided to take a detour to a local gun shop that Ben knew about in the area. Given the condition of the roads, it would take us a few days, but if it was still standing, it'd be more than worth it. Days 33 through 35. It took us just over three days to get to the gun shop, which took us way off course. When we arrived, though, it was clear we weren't the first to have this idea, which was kind of good news as it meant more people had survived multiple nuclear detonations over Los Angeles. It was also bad news, though, given the evidence we'd seen of someone killing and looting survivors. The front of the gun shop had collapsed in on itself, so we had to force our way in through the rear. Ben and I went first, and we were shocked to be greeted by the business end of a shotgun. A dirty, crazy-looking old man was in there, and he thought we were after him. Luckily, we managed to calm him down. Turns out we'd gotten to the shop shortly after he did and inadvertently startled him. I didn't want to, but Alexis insisted on offering that he join our group. I had a weird feeling about him. I mean, it's good he didn't blow our heads off, instead talked to us, but there was just something off about him. My guess is he already had been suffering from some kind of mental illness and the nuclear attack pushed him right off the deep end. He had no problem with us helping ourselves to what was left, but he insisted on taking all the shotgun ammo he could carry, which didn't leave much for us. Then he crawled out the same way we'd crawled in and just left, waving away Alexis's offer for him to join us. She sighed a breath of relief when he declined. Then I got embarrassed. I could tell back in the real world she'd been a genuinely good person, and she probably felt guilty about being relieved that the crazy old man had ignored her offer. Lilith had some firearms experience since she'd grown up hunting with her dad in Ohio, and I had some due to a few years in the Army Reserves when I was younger. Between the both of us, we did our best to train Alexis, Ben, and Annie on how to use the handguns we gave them, and then taught them how to shoot in an alley a mile and a half away. We had plenty of ammo, so there was enough for target practice on the few handguns and two rifles we looted. We thought about setting up camp at the shop. It was definitely a secure place and we'd have ready access to more weapons and ammo, but then we thought twice about it. If we knew this place existed and the crazy old man knew the location of the former gun shop, it's likely other survivors would too. And I didn't like the idea of us attracting attention. Days 36 through 40. Alexis didn't like that I was trying to avoid other people, but I just wanted to keep our group safe. We decided that we'd sleep in as long as we could in daytime and then travel mostly in the latter half of the day and at night. It would help us avoid any unwanted attention. Alexis complained about this. I could tell she really wanted to help anyone that might still be out there. But just as we got back to the 101 freeway, we saw another fresh body. That put an end to Alexis's complaints about us purposely avoiding other survivors. I could tell Alexis was scared after finding the second body. 
She refused to leave my side when we finally set up camp late at night. I tried talking to her about the old world, reassuring her there was no way the entire world went to war with nuclear weapons. All we had to do was get out of LA and we'd find civilization again. That made her feel a little bit better, and she held my hand again. It was weird feeling so happy in the middle of an apocalypse, but holding her hand and having her fall asleep next to me just felt right. Days 41 through 46. Annie and I had discussed the two bodies we'd found, and when we found two more bodies, this time laying side by side, where they'd been gunned down, we came up with a plan. She had hunting experience, so she took point and led the way a few hundred feet ahead of the group. That way, she could scout out any trouble before we actually ran into it. I didn't think that there were bandits out there setting up ambushes. There just weren't enough survivors around. We'd heard people in the far distance once or twice, but never actually came across anyone. So it was probably an unfortunate coincidence that us and whoever was killing the other survivors were traveling in the same direction. We likely had the same idea, get to the valley where there was bound to be safety. Day 47 On day 47, we finally reached the part of the 101 that passed in front of Universal Studios. We were officially in the valley, but things did not look good. There was plenty of destruction all around us, with the Hollywood Hills between the valley and the explosions in downtown LA and elsewhere. Most of the buildings here should have been spared. The best thing to do was get a good view of the local area. So we decided to climb up to the top of Mulholland Drive where there were a few scenic overlooks that couples used to go park their cars at night and look at the lights of the valley below. Days 48 through 51. It took us three days to make the climb up the hill because the hills were an absolute mess. Before nuclear Armageddon hit Los Angeles, the hills had been full of houses that were perched perilously on the steep Hollywood Hills landscape. This was dangerous enough given how frequently SoCal got rocked by earthquakes, but the nuclear blast had caused seismic activity so intense, most of the houses had slid down the hills and crashed into the streets below. This meant that climbing the lower portions of Mulholland was like trying to traverse a deadly obstacle course. Once we got to the upper portion of Mulholland, though, we had a different problem. Here, entire sections of the road had been washed away by landslides, so we often had to find a completely different way around. Eventually, though, we managed to get to the backside of Mulholland Drive where you could overlook the entire valley on a clear day. What we found made our hearts sink to the bottom of our chests. I'd been right about the enemy, whoever it was, targeting Bob Hope Airport because it was a federal emergency response location. You couldn't quite see the airport from our vantage point, but you could see the decimated ring of destruction that represented ground zero of an atomic blast. There was a similar ring over in the direction of Van Nuys, where another airport had once existed. In between the two rings of total annihilation was miles and miles of lesser but still overwhelming destruction. We set up camp as night fell so we could collect our thoughts. There'd be no help coming, it seemed. So our next course of action was clear. We had to get out of the city, but where to go? As we considered our options, we all heard a strange noise, something like the sky slowly tearing in two. Looking around us, we spotted two blinking lights far off in the distance, traveling south. That's when it hit us. It'd been so long since we heard any air traffic that we'd almost forgotten what a jet engine sounded like. It was impossible to tell what type of aircraft it was, but we knew where it was headed and that was San Diego. Our spirits soared that night. And even Lucky must have felt it because he started happily barking along to our cheering. Someone had survived. The world hadn't ended after all. The attack was probably just on Los Angeles, maybe one or two other major cities, and a conventional war was still probably going on. But that's why there hadn't been an emergency response yet. The military was too busy. The rest of the US must still be humming along. That night, Alexis and I kissed for the first time. I guess the euphoria of knowing civilization had survived got the better of us, but I could tell she didn't regret it. In fact, she pulled me straight in for another kiss. I only wish we'd been more reserved about our celebration. I had no way of knowing that somebody else had not just seen the same airplane overhead, but heard us cheering wildly in the distance. Days 51 through 56. We had a new plan. Head south out of Los Angeles and follow the 5 freeway all the way to San Diego. It was a bit concerning because there were some important military installations there, but the fact that we saw a plane headed in that direction really lifted our spirits. Besides, the sad truth is we didn't have many options. It seemed like most of LA County had been obliterated in a nuclear strike, and the terrain around Los Angeles is not very hospitable. We could have headed north and tried to reach some of the smaller communities, but we figured that our best bet was to go somewhere the government would be invested in securing, and that meant San Diego. The way down the Hollywood Hills took us twice as long as the way up because the route was so unsafe but at least we were able to raid the abandoned houses for supplies. We even found some new camping gear in one home and replaced some of our worn out tents and sleeping bags. What was really holding us back was the fact that we had to carry everything we owned on our backs, so we were limited on what we could take and how fast we could move. Days 57 through 62. 
Getting to the 5 freeway was an ordeal in and of itself. We decided to head through Burbank to get to it and past Universal Studios and the Warner Brothers film lots. They were nothing but smoking debris now, since we were so close to the impact site near Bob Hope. But it was incredible to think that just over two months ago these places were full of movie stars and thousands of people all making hit movies that would be watched around the world. Our group had gotten close in the last few weeks and Lucky was our de facto mascot. He really helped keep our spirits up. And with a goal in mind and the hope of seeing civilization again, the mood was generally positive, which is weird when you're passing by dozens of human remains every day. I could tell that Annie and Lilith were getting close, and that made me feel better because I was worried Lilith would think I had stolen Alexis away from her. Day 63 On day 63, Annie warned me that she thought someone was following us. She'd taken to scouting around us as we traveled. Sometimes she'd be out ahead, sometimes to one of our flanks, other times far behind us, catching up a few hours later. It was when she'd been lingering behind that she caught sight of a small plume of smoke a few miles behind us as we set up camp for the night. She spotted it three nights in a row, so she didn't think it was a coincidence. Then again, the 5 freeway would be the obvious choice for anyone traveling to safety in San Diego, so I wasn't convinced it was a threat. Besides, we hadn't run into any more fresh victims from whoever was out there killing people. She reluctantly agreed, but I could tell she wasn't convinced. I wish I'd listened to her. Days 64 through 68 we were finally outside of LA County and here the destruction lightened up. We caught sight of two more planes and that sent an electric shock of excitement through the group. The US had survived after all. Travel was faster outside of the main blast zones, but it seems as if multiple warheads had leveled not just most of LA County, but the surrounding cities as well. That makes sense. SoCal is obviously one of the most economically important parts of the US, especially Los Angeles, so it's obvious an enemy would try to destroy as much of it as possible. We picked up some bicycles from a mostly intact sporting goods store and managed to use them to carry more supplies, which made life a lot easier. Lucky had a blast keeping up with the bikes, and we had to ride slowly most of the time anyway because of all the debris, but we were making good time. By my count, we can make San Diego in a week or two at most at this rate. Day 69 Somebody took Lilith shortly after we set up camp for the night. She excused herself to use the bathroom, and we heard a brief struggle in the distance and then nothing. We immediately set out, but we couldn't find her. Annie picked up a trail, though, of what she thought was at least three people with a fourth being dragged. Her old hunting skills really came into play as she immediately set out to track Lilith's kidnappers, but I had to stop her because my own military skills warned me against rushing straight into what could be an ambush. Annie and Alexis were both adamant that we set out right away, but I calmed them down by pointing out the fact that whoever took Lilith wanted her dead, they would have just attacked our camp. Finally, they agreed, so we waited until it got really dark, then followed the trail. I followed the group from the left flank though at a distance so I could remain on scene with my rifle. Turns out though that whoever took her had horses. How would they manage to survive through the attack and fall out I'll never know, but there were clear signs of where the horses had been tied up and then the tracks that led north into the wreckage of the city. Now I felt stupid because my insistence that we wait until it was fully dark had cost us an hour of pursuit time. Maybe we could have gotten to them before they got to their horses. At least we had tracks to follow. Day 70 and 71 it took us a day and a half of following the tracks to finally catch up with the kidnappers. They had holed themselves up in a surviving strip mall in the city of industry right outside LA. I guess they didn't expect us to follow for so long and so far because it didn't look like they were expecting visitors. Now we just had to hope that Lilith was alive. Annie and I were the best qualified for a rescue mission so we waited until nightfall again and snuck up to the edge of their little compound. You could tell they were starting to secure the area because there were makeshift barricades in the middle of being constructed but there were no guards posted. Instead, we heard laughing and some screaming coming from one of the buildings. Then suddenly the screaming cut off into a choking gurgle. With growing pits in our stomachs, we snuck over to the building where all the sound was coming from. Peering in through a broken window, we spotted a group of five all huddled around a fire with a six figure chopping something up. To our horror, we realized what he was chopping, a person that must have been who had screamed before being butchered. With a sigh of relief though, we spotted Lilith chained up against a far wall. Whoever was being butchered, we guessed, about to be cooked, at least it wasn't her. Annie and I came up with a plan. We were both pretty good shots and angry as hell, so we waited until this crew of six settled into their disgusting meal and then split up. She attacked from one side while I attacked from the other, catching them between us. Annie opened fire first, shooting one of the cannibals in the chest, and then I started unloading. We dropped three instantly, with the third reaching for a pistol and taking a shot in my direction. Annie got him clean between the eyes as I ducked for cover, then finished off one of the two survivors who took off running. 
I immediately gave chase for the surviving runner. I didn't want any part of this evil troop to survive and prey on other innocents. Annie, meanwhile, went to rescue Lilith, in case there were more around somewhere. The survivor turned a corner a few dozen feet ahead of me, and then I heard two gunshots, almost simultaneously, followed by a scream I recognized as Alexis. Turning the corner, I found the surviving runner laying on the ground, clutching his leg. Across from him lay Ben, dead, from a gunshot to the chest. Ben had come to try to help when he heard gunfire, and when the two ran into each other, the cannibal had been the better shot. With a roar of rage, I turned my gun on the survivor and pulled the trigger. Days 72 through 76. If there were other cannibals around, they didn't bother to give chase after the rescue. We didn't bury Ben either, because of fear of contaminated soil. But we covered him with rocks and a makeshift cairn like our ancestors used to. Annie was inconsolable, but having Lilith back helped. Our world had become cruel and deadly faster than any of us could imagine. Days 77 through 82. The road to San Diego was harder than we expected. The freeway had been packed when the bombs fell, so there were a lot of vehicles getting blown around by the superheated hurricane winds. We spotted another group of travelers in the distance heading north, and Alexis wanted to make contact with them. However, both Annie and I put our foot down and absolutely refused. We weren't taking any more risks. Days 83 through 89. The freeway was now running near the beach, and the sound of the ocean was almost comforting. Or it would have been if the beaches below us weren't covered in debris that had been washed out to sea and then right back on the waves. As far as the eye could see, the beaches were covered in the debris of an entire coastal city, destroyed in nuclear hellfire. Back in LA, the skies were perpetually covered in black sooty clouds. Out here, the ocean winds created gaps in the clouds, but most of the time, all we had over our heads was thick brownish clouds. We all knew that trillions upon trillions of pounds of debris had been blown up into the sky in the attacks, but could there really be so much that it covered the entire sky in dust and debris? As we neared San Diego, I was getting more and more nervous. Day 90. We spotted another airplane overhead, this time unmistakably a fighter jet. It came in from the ocean and seemed to head in the direction of San Diego before coming up north in our direction and curving back out to sea. Looking through a set of powerful binoculars we'd looted, Lilith swore that she could vaguely see the outline of an aircraft carrier out there in the horizon. We had to take her word for it, she had the sharpest vision of us all. She'd quickly taken to learning how to shoot the two rifles we'd brought with us and was proving to be a crack shot. Lilith was determined to never be helpless again. Days 91 through 96. Progress slowed down again due to debris and the fact that we got caught up in a severe storm. This is rare because SoCal almost never has bad storms in the summertime. We noticed that the temperature had been dropping slowly over the last three months as well despite it being the middle of July. We thought about setting out rain catches to help replenish our water supplies, but I thought better of it once I saw how greasy the rain was as it fell. My fears that the skies above were still polluted with debris from the bombs proved true. The rain had come down hard for two full days, and when it finally cleared there was no sunshine, just big puddles of sick smelling water left behind. Luckily, we could still find plenty of convenience stores left abandoned with shelves full of drinking water. Days 97 through 99. Something wasn't right. The lights from San Diego should have been visible at night for the last two days despite the heavy cloud cover. Alexis figured it could have been the EMP blast from the attacks on Los Angeles. I wanted to believe her, but I couldn't shake the gnawing feeling at the bottom of my stomach. Even Lucky felt it too. His normally happy self was looking increasingly worried, probably from picking up on the group's stress. Day 100. There was no denying it. San Diego had been hit by a nuclear attack alongside Los Angeles. That explained the lack of lights or traffic coming from the city. We finally traveled close enough to see it for ourselves. The skeletal remains of the iconic San Diego skyline far in the distance. The group was too crushed to do anything but set up camp early. If there was no safety in San Diego, then where could we go? Just how far had the war spread? That night, we got our answer. Far out at sea, somewhere in the direction that Lilith swore she'd seen the outline of an aircraft carrier, came a blinding white flash followed by a dull roar a minute after. I knew what I'd just seen, but it took me a while to pull myself together to explain it to the group. Whoever had attacked the United States with nuclear weapons had just struck again, this time destroying a carrier battle group just off the coast of Southern California. LA hadn't been the victim of a single attack, and nuclear war hadn't destroyed the entire world. Nuclear war was destroying the world, because it was still being waged. A half hour after the explosion at sea, three plumes of fire from somewhere deep inside the United States lit up the night sky briefly before disappearing into space. Nuclear intercontinental ballistic missiles from fields in the American heartland to strike back at whoever just hit us again. The war was clearly ongoing. While everyone had expected World War III to be over in an hour, we were dragging it out over weeks and even months, hitting tit for tat as one major city after another got wiped off the map. How far had it gone? Where would it stop? What was even left? 
January 26, 1991, night, the Iraqi desert. Two SUVs barrel across the moon-bright desert toward Chris. He crouches low, getting into position. His body shakes from the wild pounding of his heart. He breathes deep and thinks of his two-year-old daughter. His hand steadies. The vehicles are closer now, 55 yards away, then 40 yards, 30 yards. At 20 yards, he pulls the trigger. A rocket whooshes from the launcher. The first SUV explodes with a heavy bang, thick smoke billowing up. Chris launches a grenade at the second SUV, nailing its hood. Then he pops up and charges toward the vehicles, spraying bullets in case there's anyone still alive in the wreckage. Satisfied that he won't be chased anymore, Chris turns and runs until it feels like his heart is going to burst. For now, he's escaped the enemy. He doesn't know if anyone else in his patrol is alive or dead. His only chance for survival is to walk across the desert and cross into Syria. It was supposed to be a straightforward mission. During build-up to the ground invasion of Iraq, B Squadron of the 22nd SAS is stationed at a forward operating base in Aljuf, Saudi Arabia. Three eight-man patrols, Bravo 10, Bravo 20, and Bravo 30, are to infiltrate deep into Iraqi territory on intelligence gathering missions. The main task of Bravo 2 is to find a good lying up position and set up an observation post to monitor the main supply route, or MSR, that runs between the town of Hatida and three airfields. It's thought that the Iraqi army is moving Scud missile launchers along this route. The patrol is to report on enemy movements via radio or satcom. After 10 days, a chopper will resupply them or move them to a new location. Bravo 2 consists of Patrol Commander Sergeant Andy McNabb, Sergeant Vince Phillips, Corporal Chris Ryan, Lance Corporal Dinger Pring, and troops Bob Concilio, Legs Lane, Stan McGowan, and Mark Cover. On the night of January 22nd, an RAF Chinook drops the soldiers into the Iraqi desert. Unlike the other two patrols, Bravo 2 opts to travel on foot instead of bringing vehicles. It's a decision they'll soon regret. The mission gets off to a rough start. The desert's colder than expected. It's hard work moving their heavy equipment. They've misjudged the terrain from poor, outdated maps. Bravo 2 soon realizes that the spot they're in is hot. There's an anti-aircraft encampment less than a quarter of a mile away. Legs, the patrol's radio man, has trouble contacting command on the radio. The day after their insertion, Bravo 2 is compromised, when a young goat herder stumbles upon them and then alerts other people. In the afternoon, the patrol finds themselves hunkered down in a wadi or a dry river channel. From about 219 yards away on a bluff, two Iraqi men watch them. It's a tense moment, and then Chris makes a bad mistake. He waves. It's meant to be a disarming gesture, but he waves with his left hand, which is offensive in Arab culture. The men instantly begin firing their weapons. Bravo 2 returns fire and the situation rapidly deteriorates. The Iraqis are quickly joined by a dump truck full of men with AK-47s. As the firefight rages on, the patrol retreats further down the riverbed, struggling under the weight of their heavy haversacks while shooting and trying to evade getting shot. Chris activates his Tactical Rescue Beacon, or TACB, and yells that they're under attack. Andy also activates his TACB. Though their beacons are set to different frequencies to alert both the US and SAS forces, neither gets a response. Bravo 2 ditches their biggest packs so they move faster. Legs leaves behind radio equipment. At the last minute, Chris runs almost 20 yards back to get a hip flask his wife had given him as a present out of his discarded pack. Miraculously, the patrol escapes the Iraqi fighters. They regroup some distance away. Amazingly, no one had been hit, but they lost a lot of their gear. Not sure if their communications have gone through, they decide not to wait for a rescue to show up and head for the Syrian border. As dusk falls, Bravo 2 detours and doubles back through the rough, rocky terrain in case they're being followed. Then they walk south. Periodically, Mark switches on his GPS to get a fix on a satellite. They then check their maps to determine which way to go. After walking for several hours, Stan collapses. He has on thermal underwear and the fast pace has caused him to sweat hard. He's dehydrated. Chris, who's trained as a medic, gives him rehydrate powder mixed into water. Some of the others want to find a safe hiding spot and leave Stan behind, but Chris won't allow it. He cajoles and threatens the semi-conscious Stan into continuing to walk. When they venture near the MSR, fearing discovery, Chris sets an even more punishing walking pace. Stan and Vince keep up with the rest of them. After about an hour, they pause to consult which way to go and discover that the rest of the patrol, Andy, Bob, Mark, Legs, and Dinger, are missing. From higher ground, they pause to look out over the desert floor, but don't see the missing soldiers. Chris turns on his tack and to see if by chance Andy has his on, they'd be able to communicate. Unfortunately, there's no answer. The patrol is down to three soldiers. 
Chris, Stan, and Vince walk on, occasionally trying to contact Andy on the Tacby. At around 5 a.m., having hiked some 43 miles through the night, they take shelter in a ditch. They take turns sleeping and keeping watch. As the day wears on, it grows colder and begins to snow. After resting, Stan seems better. Chris's feet are beginning to grow blisters due to his rough wool socks. The three snuggle together in the muddy, snowy ditch until dark. At night, they set out, trying to navigate toward the border via compass. They walk for hours in the freezing cold. Vince gets belligerent and loses his grip on reality due to hypothermia. Eventually, he falls behind. Chris and Stan briefly retrace their steps, but they can't find him. Chris makes the difficult decision to press on, and Stan agrees. The patrol is now down to two. After walking for hours, near morning, Chris and Stan cuddle for warmth in a wadi and sip whiskey from Chris's flask. Thankfully, it's a sunny day and they're able to dry out some. Chris eats two biscuits at the last of his food. They've lost track of time, but they think it's Saturday, January 26th. Midday, they hear the jingling of bells. Goats. Along with the goats comes the threat of them being discovered again. Chris wants to ambush and kill the herder, but Stan doesn't want to kill a civilian. Against Chris's wishes, Stan steps out of their hiding places and tries to communicate with the herder. Unfortunately, the surprised herder doesn't speak English and they don't speak Arabic. Stan decides to go to the nearby village with the herder. Chris begs him not to go, but Stan's adamant. Chris tells him he'll wait until 6.30 p.m. for Stan to come back. As promised, Chris waits until dusk for Stan to return before checking his compass and walking north. He's walked for about 15 minutes when he sees the lights of an approaching SUV. Thinking that it's Stan, he runs toward the SUV, and that's when he notices a second set of headlights. Stan would never send two vehicles. Chris turns and runs from the SUVs, and that's when they begin to chase him across the desert. After Chris destroys the SUVs with his rocket launcher, he continues his trek toward Syria. Now out of water, he keeps thinking that he should reach the Euphrates River soon, but doesn't. Eventually, he sees a small village with crops. Surely they're near the river. Chris stealthily skirts the village as the dogs start barking. At the river, he tries to fill his water bottle, but discovers that the water is shallow over a layer of silt, so he wades out further and ends up getting sucked down by quicksand. Luckily, Chris is able to struggle free. He carefully fills his water bottle, and the water is murky, foul-smelling, but it tastes good. Chris realizes he can't cross the river, it's cold, and the middle current is too strong and unpredictable. He has to go another way. Chris spends the next few nights hiking through the desert, occasionally zigzagging miles out of his way to avoid villages, vehicles, and goat herders. He sips a little whiskey when he needs a pick-me-up. With each step, his blistered feet grow more painful. During the days, he hides in the wadis or culverts and rests. Sometimes he turns on his tack bee, but there's never any answer. He consults its map, but has trouble lining up landmarks with it. Chris crosses the MSR again and becomes demoralized by a highway sign, which announces that Al Qaim is 50 kilometers, which means that the Syrian border is 80 to 90 kilometers away. He thought he was much closer. The lack of water becomes an urgent problem again. Starting to get careless from exhaustion, Chris stumbles into a signal base, but manages to avoid the soldiers, at times crawling and shimmying across the ground. He finds a clear spring and fills his water bottles. Then Chris accidentally wanders into the large compound of a local politician. A huge portrait of Saddam Hussein is painted on one of the buildings. As the day approaches, Chris is deciding where to hide when he realizes that two men are headed in his direction. There's no way they won't see him when they pass. Despite his exhaustion, Chris's training takes over. He ambushes the men, stabbing one in the throat with his knife. He wrestles the other man to the ground and, using a judo hold, snaps his neck. He drags the bodies into the tall grass by the riverbank to hide them. Chris takes refuge in a stinky sewer culvert full of rotting trash and feces. He can barely maneuver his stiff fingers to open his water bottle. Finally, he gets it open and takes a sip. The water tastes metallic and seems to burn Chris's mouth. He spits it out and uses his flashlight and compass mirror to check his tongue. Everything looks okay. He tries a second mouthful of water with the same reaction. Clearly, the water's bad. Chris dumps it out, very disappointed. It's been eight days since he had a proper meal and two days since he's run out of water. Chris's feet continuously ache, but he doesn't dare take his boots off because he doesn't know if he'll be able to get them back on. Furthermore, he's lost feeling in the tips of his fingers, and due to the dirt stuck under his fingernails, infection has set in. Chris dozes uncomfortably in the culvert, waiting for dark. At night, Chris is finally able to escape the compound area. He limps toward the town of Krabila but can't find it. Later, he'd learn that Krabila was blacked out due to war and he'd gone right past it. Eventually, Chris comes to a big barbed wire fence. Finally, is this the border? He manages to cross it with only minor injuries and staggers on. 
Suddenly, there's a blinding light and Chris wakes up sometime later. He drags himself to his feet and keeps going. He has several random blackouts. Chris sees a dwelling in the distance and makes for it. He turns on his tack bee. If need be, he'll kill someone for water. The goat herd family, although surprised and rather suspicious, helps Chris. He manages to ask where he is and they can confirm that he's in Syria. They give him water, sweet tea and flatbread, but he can't swallow it. For the first time in days, he takes off his boots. His feet are rotting, the toenails falling off. An older woman washes his feet. For a while, he's able to lay by a fire, warming his feet and letting them breathe. Through sounds and sign language, Chris communicates that he wants to go to the police. He gives the family a gold coin for their help. That actually makes things grow tense. They want more money and threaten him with an ancient rifle, but he mimes that he's out of money. The young man is aggressive about taking Chris to town, so Chris carefully eases his feet back into his boots, and he and the young man stand on the side of the MSR and hitch a ride. The camel farmer driver who picks them up speaks a little English. Chris lies to him, saying that he's a crashed airline pilot. Halfway through the ride, the driver kicks the young man out and sends him back home. Chris starts to worry. In the tiny town, they stop for gas. The farmer gets belligerent. Chris tries to bargain with him. The farmer whips up a crowd of people. Chased by a mob, Chris runs into a police station. The police take away his kit and open it. It's a tense moment when they find his 203 automatic rifle grenade launcher. Luckily, an official who speaks English shows up and asks for information. Chris provides his correct name and birth date, but lies about his regiment and repeats the crashed pilot story. Strip searched, blindfolded, and two wild car rides later, Chris ends up in Damascus. He's delivered to the head of the Mukhabarat, the Syrian secret police. The secret police allow him to finally get properly cleaned up. For the first time in several days, Chris sees himself in a mirror. He's gaunt. He's dropped from 176 to 140 pounds, losing 36 pounds in 10 days. Though the authorities provide him with a feast, he can't eat. He can only drink water. Per Chris's request, they take him to the British Embassy. He's questioned by Embassy Brass and writes down his whole story. They work out the route he took and chances are the spring he drank from was contaminated with nuclear effluent. After a few days of government red tape, Chris flies into a base in Cyprus. From there, he ends up in Riyadh, where he's interviewed multiple times by the brigadier and colonel in command of the special forces. The rest of Chris's patrol is still missing. No one knows what happened to them. The other patrols, Bravo 1 and Bravo 3, had declared their areas too dangerous upon arrival and had been extracted shortly thereafter. As it turns out, legs had been given the wrong radio frequencies and the base only received three garbled messages on January 24th. The army waited two days before mounting a search, which had to be aborted due to bad weather. Another search was mounted on the 27th with the focus on the most likely escape route, but they didn't find the patrol. A third search was also aborted, this time due to an ill pilot. On February 24th, the ground war launched and was over in five days. As it turns out, five members of Bravo 2, Stan, Dinger, Mark, and Andy were separately taken as POWs, ultimately ending up in the same prison. Eventually, they were handed over to the Red Crescent and released after the war. Legs died from hypothermia while trying to cross the Euphrates. Bob died after being caught in a firefight, and Vince died of exposure in the desert. The patrol originally broke into two because Andy heard a jet and stopped to use his tack bee. Bob, Legs, Mike, and Dinger had been behind Andy, so they stopped with him. After trying to contact the jet, the men saw movement ahead and thought it was an Iraqi patrol, so they stayed put until the patrol moved on, and by that time, Chris, Vince, and Stan had vanished. Chris physically recovered in about six weeks. The dentist had to remove some loose teeth, and Chris's gums had receded due to malnutrition. He also had a blood disorder from drinking dirty water and a high level of enzymes in his liver produced in reaction to the nuclear affluence. Thankfully, he didn't have radiation poisoning. It took Chris much longer to overcome the recurrent nightmares and psychological scars the mission caused. In all, he walked just under 200 miles in 10 days. You've seen him take on the hottest pepper in the world, or at least the hottest we could conveniently get shipped in the mail. You've seen him survive three days homeless on the streets of Los Angeles. You've seen him live for 24 hours trapped in a bathtub and give a poor delivery driver trust issues. Now we're turning over our fourth from the bottom most important writer to you, the fans, and leaving him to your mercies. Today, we're putting him in a survival challenge situation that comes straight from the viewers. 72 hours alone in the forest. Okay, so before I get into my experiences with this challenge, I just want to be upfront and state that this might be my last challenge episode. The infographic show pays me well for the sometimes dangerous situations I get myself into, but after this challenge, I had to step back and really think about if I want to continue with these challenges. As you'll find out, I ran into some serious trouble out there. 
and things could have gone bad multiple times, and I think I just need to reevaluate things going forward. Unfortunately, I lost my journal during one of these incidents, so I'll have to work from memory on retelling my wilderness survival experience. When I first got the challenge, I was kind of excited. Truth be told, one of the reasons I do these challenges is because I like pushing my limits. I hate sitting at home being comfortable all the time, which might sound weird, but I guess I've accepted that it's just who I am. It definitely drives the girlfriend crazy who would prefer I live a perfectly safe, normal life. Three days and nights alone in the forest and not just the backyard woods, we're talking real forest. For this challenge, I actually went up to NorCal because SoCal isn't so well known for forests. Plus, we're entering fall, which means that the few mountain forests that are here are going to get very, very cold and possibly even snowed on, which would very quickly make this challenge extremely dangerous. For a solo challenge with no support, I'm not willing to risk it. I went up north enough to hit the rainforests of the Pacific Northwest. The show's lawyers have warned that we shouldn't give out any specific locations so that nobody's crazy enough to try to go up there and repeat our experiment. This is also a perfect opportunity to state the obvious. Don't do this. Seriously, don't. I know it sounds easy to do some silly challenge, but the fact is that wilderness survival is pretty serious business. I have training courtesy of the US military on how to survive in various wilderness environments, and years of experience putting that knowledge to the real world test in very stressful situations. You may think you're ready from watching a bunch of YouTube prepper videos, but believe me, you're not. This isn't some weird flex. It would honestly devastate me to find out a fan decided to go out there and try this for real and got themselves hurt or worse. If you're interested in survival, take some local classes or join the Boy Scouts. Get out there into the woods in a supervised environment and build the fundamentals. Matter of fact, I recommend it to everyone. You never know when some basic survival skills will come in handy. Now back to the challenge. For this challenge, I'll have only a survival knife, which, by the way, is not a fancy Leatherman or anything like that. It's literally a folding knife, and that's about it, though it's pretty wicked sharp. It has a reinforced grip and the bottom of the grip is blunted so that you can use it to smash things, but that's about all the utility you're getting out of it. I'll also have the clothes I wear, which will be underwear, thermal underwear, hiking pants, t-shirt, sweatshirt, and poncho. Sadly, I can only take the socks I get to wear, which do not estimate the necessity of fresh socks in a survival situation. The moment your feet go bad, your odds of survival plummet dramatically. That's about it, except for four packets of energy gel, a map of the local area, and a compass. The energy gel is for emergencies only, and the map and compass so that I can navigate my way back to my pickup at the end of three days. I'm going to only briefly peruse the map so I'm oriented before heading in, but I will be scouting out the wilderness myself to find sources of water and food. No cheating by pinpointing the locations of lakes, rivers, or anything like that beforehand. I originally wanted to take a crew member with me to document things, as I thought it might be fun for you guys to see them more than just animation, but sadly hiring out professional crew is pretty expensive. And then there's union concerns over the nature of this challenge, as well as insurance which adds up to a pretty <laughs> whopping figure. Basically, until the infographics is a TV show, I would count this possibility out. You know what to do, fans. Start writing to the big TV studios. I got dropped off at 5 in the morning on my first day by friends I have from my time in the military who live in the local area. We mapped out a general area which I would try to stay inside by using some easily identifiable boundaries, such as a set of cliffs and a river. And then we picked three different rendezvous locations for pickup. This way, if I got injured, there would always be a pickup location nearby that I could get to no matter where within the area I wandered. Also, it would give any search and rescue parties places to start their efforts at. Planning is extremely important for wilderness survival. When you're in a survival situation, you have to immediately prioritize and then work on your needs in order of priority. My first need was to find water, as I could easily survive the three days with no food but would get into trouble really fast if I couldn't find drinkable water. I'm near the coast, but hopefully everyone watching knows that drinking seawater is an absolute no-go. One big benefit though is that early in the morning mist blows off the sea and saturates trees and bushes with water droplets. My problem was that I had no container to store water in, so I decided to take a risk and take off my poncho to turn that into a makeshift water bag. When you're in the wilderness, staying dry is very important because being wet can very quickly lead to hypothermia even if the outside temperature is not that cold. Water is really good at leaching heat from your body into the environment, so it's important to stay dry as much as you can. 
However, being wet is also a really good way for bacterial and fungal infections to take hold, and can absolutely devastate your feet. Once more, if your feet go bad, your odds of survival fall dramatically. Go image search trench foot and see why it's important to stay dry. Just make sure you do it on an empty stomach. I gathered the corners of my poncho to turn it into a makeshift bag, and then I took my shirt off while putting back on my sweatshirt and I used the t-shirt to wick up moisture off tall grasses and tree leaves. Then it was as simple as wringing out the water into my poncho bag and pretty soon I had a decent amount of water stored up, enough that I felt safe looking for a more permanent solution. With water temporarily taken care of, I started looking for a place I could set up long term. If you can find a cave, that's the most ideal place to take shelter, though you have to worry about animals who are thinking the same thing and this typically means mountain lions and bears here in the US. I was too far from the mountains in the distance to risk trying to find a cave, so I decided I could pretty easily build a lean-to shelter from all the fallen tree branches and dead leaves. Location though is important, so I surveyed my environment to figure out where to build my shelter. I was very near the coast, probably only 2 or 3 miles from the beach, and the terrain sloped slowly upward to the distant mountains to my east. There was another stretch of mountains north of me which told me that I was in a very broad valley, and that's very good news, because if I followed parallel to the coastline, the odds of finding a small stream or full-blown river were really good. All that mountain snow has to run off somewhere, and it would either pool into lakes between the sea and the mountain cul-de-sac I was in, or it would run as streams. I hiked for a few hours as the sun started to rise and evaporate all of the mist. If you're relying on condensation from mist for water, you want to collect it very early in the morning because as soon as the sun rises it's going to start evaporating. Shortly before noon I hit a small creek winding its way through the middle of the woods, exactly as I predicted, so I decided to set up shop near it. You might be tempted to build your shelter right there next to the water, but that can be a bad idea for several reasons. First of all, heavy rain or other events further upstream could cause the water level to suddenly rise, which could wash away your shelter. Second, animals like water too, including predators. It's important to note though that even herbivores can be very dangerous, and yes, deer can and have killed people before. I decided I'd build my lean-to about 20 minutes from the water and got ridiculously lucky when I found a large overturned tree that had collapsed onto another tree. With the two trees acting as a wall and a roof, I simply got to work sawing off large branches and laying them down over both trees. Then I covered the leafy branches with dead leaves and a bunch of grass, covered that in turn with a layer of dirt and once more another layer of leafy branches and grass. Thankfully, there were plenty of bushes around and by the end of it, I had a pretty decent little lean-to build. Even better, I found a bunch of grubs in the dead wood and as long as you avoid the little nasty pinchers some of them have, they make for a great snack. Grubs may be gross, but they're jam-packed with protein and fat. Generally, the grosser an insect looks to you, the better it is to eat. The only bugs you should avoid are any with a hard shell such as roaches or grasshoppers. You should eat those only if you've roasted them in a fire because of parasites. You can still get parasites from plenty of other things, but you always want to mitigate your odds of danger as much as possible. Survival is risky business, plain and simple. I decided the next thing I needed was tools and the very first thing I needed was something for self-defense. This being fall, the odds of running into a bear were lower than normal, but because most bears would be looking for a place to hibernate by now, this leaves only the bears who didn't pack on as many pounds and were desperately trying to add weight. These bears are far more dangerous than they normally would be and this fact would come into play very soon. I decided I'd use the knife to make a spear and hunted around for a long, decently thick branch I could use. It took a bit more time but I managed to find a nice hardwood branch with good length on it. But instead of sharpening the tip to a point, I decided that the branch was stiff enough to simply splint the top of it into a cross shape. In an emergency, I could jam the open knife into the tip deep enough to stay firmly secure and I'd have myself a pretty efficient and deadly spear, far deadlier than a sharpened stick. It would probably only last a few jabs into a big animal, but that should be enough to drive it back. Next, I set about working on a way to contain and transport water. Notice again that I'm more worried about water than food. I really can't stress enough how important water is. This being a Pacific Northwest rainforest, I knew I couldn't rely on the poncho forever as I'd eventually need to stay dry myself. I tried finding discarded tree bark, hoping I could fashion a few pieces of bark into a rough bowl shape, but I actually got even luckier than that. I found a white plastic bag. Normally I hate people who litter, but in this case it ended up being exactly what I needed 
though you still shouldn't litter. Water is good, but water safety is also very important. So next I worked on a way to help make the water from the creek safe to drink. I found tree bark which I could rip off, and I managed to get a large curved piece which I could bend just slightly into a very shallow bowl shape. It wouldn't hold much water and I'd be reduced to basically taking sips at a time, but it was the best I could do. I need a fire to make the water safe though, and this proved far more difficult than anything before. It actually took me until just a few hours before nightfall to get a fire going. Starting a fire with no tools has always been one of my weak areas, and it didn't help that most of the wood I could find was pretty humid thanks to how wet the Pacific Northwest tends to be. Without tools, the best way to start a fire is to gather some kindling, dry pine needles work like a charm, and a piece of large soft wood. You can typically find soft wood in the large branches of living trees, or just split a very young tree in half. The wood from dead trees is hard and no good for this. But it is good for the second thing you need, a stick of very hard wood. Basically you create a channel down the middle of the soft wood and you put your kindling at the bottom of it. Then with your hard wood stick you rub it up and down the channel over and over again, repeatedly for hours, until you finally cause enough friction to actually light the kindling. Now I've seen people do this in just 15 minutes, but it took me hours to get going. Like I said, not my strong suit in the survival game. Eventually though I had a small fire just outside my lean-to, and I gathered up some large flat rocks so that I could eventually cook on them. For now though I had spent my entire day setting up shelter, building tools, and finding water, so there wouldn't be much food to eat. Instead, I heated up one of the large flat rocks in the middle of the fire and then pulled it out with sticks. I immediately placed my makeshift bowl on the hot rock and filled it with as much water as I could manage, which wasn't very much. Tree bark makes for terrible bowls. Boiling water was going to be out of the question without metal tools, but if you can heat water up enough, it can destroy harmful bacteria. It's an imperfect solution, but like I said before, survival comes with risks, and your job is to simply mitigate, not negate those risks. With a decent little camp set up, I returned to the creek as the sun started to set, hoping I could score some water critters for dinner. I didn't want to be away from camp when night fell so I wouldn't accidentally get lost, so I didn't spend much time looking. Sadly, the only thing I managed to score was some edible lichens, which wouldn't do much to curve my hunger after not eating all day. That's alright though because I had water to drink and that was far more important. Dealing with hunger is easy as long as you're hydrated. That night I planned out my strategy for day two. I had dried my clothing over the fire and dried my feet off by holding them close to the fire. Water was nearby and plentiful, and I figured with only three days out here I could risk getting sick by drinking without treating the water, because trying to sterilize sips of water at a time just wasn't going to work out long term. I knew I was only a few miles from the coast, so I planned on following the creek to the beach to find mussels and other edibles. The coast can be a bonanza of stuff to eat if you don't mind the gross taste. All in all, my situation was looking pretty good. I even managed to keep embers going in a small pit inside my lean-to when it started to rain outside. Then things took a turn for the weird and the very dangerous. I don't know what time of night it was, but I woke up to the sound of, I don't know, it almost sounded like human screaming, but more high-pitched. The sounds were coming from a few miles away, and I have to admit, it had me really spooked. I'm pretty familiar with the sounds of the American wilderness. And this was no screeching owl or bellowing elk, or wounded animal of any kind. The sounds changed between short high-pitched screams and then long, very deep howls. Sometimes they would come from one direction, and there would be a reply from a completely different direction. I've never been around wolves in the wild, so it might have been a wolf pack for all I know, only I'm pretty sure there are no known wild wolves in the Pacific Northwest. The howls and screams came pretty intermittently, maybe once or twice every 10 minutes or so, but lasted for a long while. I wasn't going to risk sleep with an unknown animal out there so close by. Maybe it was one or two weird or wounded elk. They can actually bellow pretty loud. I've just never heard that scream in this style before. Either way, wounded animals are dangerous. It was lucky that I stayed awake because at some point, again, hard to tell the time without a watch, after the howls and screams settled down, I heard heavy breathing, grunting, and shuffling in the woods nearby. I already had my knife wedged into my makeshift spear shaft, and honestly, I felt my blood go ice cold. Because I was pretty sure I knew exactly what was lumbering my way. These were sounds I recognized. A black bear lumbered through the trees. 
just a few dozen feet away. I held perfectly still, hoping it wouldn't decide to investigate my makeshift camp. But it probably spotted my lean-to and thought the same thing I was thinking when I built it. Dry shelter in the rain. The first thing I did was carefully observe the bear. It was definitely not full grown, and was a fair bit on the lean side of things. This meant two things, an inexperienced juvenile that had not done a very good job of fattening up for winter. On one hand, it could make the bear desperate for food and humans make good eating. On the other hand, it was likely weak, and if it had been so outcompeted for food, then it was likely a bit of a pushover. I also tapped into what I know about predatory animals. They prefer to ambush prey or launch hunts on their terms. Predators are notoriously shy animals and can have a very low confidence when confronted. This is because if a hunt goes awry, they can suffer an injury, and this could impact their ability to hunt and possibly lead to starvation. This is why you never run away from a predatory animal. It's usually better to simply back away confidently. Running triggers the hunt instinct, because you confirm to the predator that you're weaker than it and scared. I decided to take a huge gamble, and I ran out of my lean-to straight at the bear, shouting and yelling, thrusting with my spear. All things considered, I was basically trapped inside the lean-to and a bear can easily outrun you. It was a risk, but remember what I said about wilderness survival being risky? The bear immediately reared up on its paws, which is bad news bears, pun intended, because it might mean that it might try to fight back. Luckily for me, yelling and stabbing in the air in front of it like a wild man did the trick, and the bear lost its nerve and scampered back. I've been in close calls with wild animals, but I have never faced off a bear standing on its two hind legs. It's not something I care to ever repeat again unless I'm packing a 45 on my hip at minimum. The bear lumbered off, but I knew it wasn't safe to stay where I was. Any minute the bear could change its mind, so I packed up what few things I had and I immediately took off into the pitch black rainy woods. Normally, you never want to move at nighttime, as it's really easy to lose your bearings. If you have to, use the stars above you to pinpoint a single direction of travel and to stay in a straight line. That way, in daylight, you can retrace your steps and reorient yourself from more familiar ground. I walked for about 15 minutes and had to wait out the rainy night under a thick pine. Luckily, the rain abetted after a few hours, but I didn't get a lick of sleep that whole night. The next morning, I made my way back to my old camp, and sure enough, the bear had returned and trashed the place. I made the right call. Luckily, days two and three were far less eventful. I relocated my shelter to the other side of the creek, and it didn't rain for nights two and three. I changed my sleep schedule, though, to sleep during the day and stay up at night in case of wandering bear again. Also, I won't lie, those weird howls and screams had me on edge, especially after my encounter with the bear. On the coast, I managed to find edible mussels pretty easily and I ate some raw, which I immediately regretted, and then I roasted the rest in their own shells. Mussels are great for energy, but you have to be careful if you're low on water because they can add a lot of salt water to your system. If you aren't peeing regularly, the salt in your body can add up dangerously. By the way, they taste like mermaid boogers when you eat them raw. I also managed to find some edible flowering plants. With flowering plants, you want to pluck the actual flower off because the sap in the stem can be really bitter and unpleasant. The bud of the flower and the petals, though, make for good eating at a pinch. And dandelions typically grow in most places. If you really don't mind the bitterness, you can eat the roots of most flowering plants, which are chock full of minerals and nutrients. Though be careful, never eat a flowering plant whose flower is umbrella shaped. Those are poisonous and may not kill you, but will have your stomach twisted up in knots. Lichens and bugs made up most of the rest of my meals. Grubs were pretty plentiful in rotting logs. I couldn't remember which mushrooms are edible and which aren't, so I stayed away from them, better not risk it. Also, mushrooms don't actually pack a lot of energy, so don't waste time trying to look for them unless you have no other options. Same goes for trying to hunt. Wilderness survival is a numbers game, and your job is to waste as few calories as possible while gaining the most possible from what you eat. Hunting can burn a lot of calories, so forget trying to catch anything larger than a squirrel or a rabbit, and even then only go after them if you can make some rough traps and snares, or happen to find a burrow or warden. I made it through my three days pretty alright, but very much on the hungry side. My encounter with the bear, though, definitely left me a bit shaken. That was a very serious situation which could have gone very badly. The girlfriend wasn't happy to hear about it, and we both talked for a long time about those challenges. They have definitely started to ramp up in risk, and I guess I have to think about if I really want to keep on taking some of the risks I do. I love reading some of the feedback from you guys, and I'm happy that they're entertaining and sometimes even enlightening. But I guess this whole bear experience is just making me reconsider. 
It's here. The zombie apocalypse. The dead roam the streets, and whether it was a plague, an ancient curse, fungus spores, or mutated rabies, none of that matters now. What matters is survival. But how are you going to survive in a world where you are now the main course for billions of flesh-eating zombies? As usual, the Infographic Show has your back, and today we're going to teach you how to keep from being the main course with our top 10 zombie survival life hacks. Number 10. Go North. No, even further north. Our first life hack is not really a hack, it's just more a general survive this nightmare and don't get eaten tip. When the zombie apocalypse hits, you're going to be joining millions of survivors all trying to figure out their next move. Some guy is always going to suggest you go to a government safe zone, because like he totally hears they've been working on a cure there. Don't listen to him, he's just going to send you on a pointless side plot and probably get a person or two killed while he's at it. Forget the government, because you're on your own. Now obviously you're going to want to get out of the cities, seeing as that's where most people live and those people are now zombies. Staying put in a city will be like rolling up to a fresh lion kill and wrapping yourself up with a carcass. So while you may be tempted to be near places you can scavenge for supplies, don't. You're going to want to find a place with abundant natural resources because from now on, your meals are coming straight from Mother Nature herself, and she doesn't deliver on Uber Eats. More importantly, you want to go somewhere that zombies are going to have a difficult time finding you, or at least eating you. Flesh of any kind has a pretty hard time dealing with the cold. It tends to freeze and become very rigid and inflexible. And with no blood circulating through their dead limbs, zombies that freeze are going to become undead statues in no time at all. That's why you want to be going north. Really, really far north. Like literally as far north as you can get. If you've hit polar bears, then you're on the right track. Sure, survival will be a bit difficult in those extreme latitudes, but you know what else makes survival hard? being eaten alive by zombies. In the far north of Alaska or Canada, you'll only be dealing with approximately three months of mild temperatures before that thermostat starts dropping, and once it does, any zombie that's followed you up there is going to turn into a frozen popsicle. And at that point, it'll be as simple as leisurely knocking heads off one at a time. Number 9. Learn to get clean drinking water. Okay, so you've taken our advice and decided to head north into the wilderness. Now you're going to have to deal with one of the basic necessities of life, clean drinking water. Obviously, if you can hit up any local army surplus or survival gear store, then you absolutely should do that and get yourself some handy water filtration systems. But if you missed out or if man-made filters are just like too mainstream for you, then fret not. We're going to teach you how to make a basic water filter with nothing more than a plastic bag and a bunch of rocks and dirt. First, you want to cut a very small hole at the bottom of the bag, then line the entire bottom with a layer of rocks. Above that, make a layer of sand, and then a rock layer again. Repeat two more times to make a total of four layers alternating between rocks and sand, and voila, you have your own homemade Brita filter. Sort of. It won't get rid of microscopic contaminants like bacteria, viruses, and polar bear pee, but it'll do a great job of filtering out larger particles and make water mostly safe to drink. Number 8. Don't hit up an army surplus or survival store. You remember how, like 30 seconds ago, we told you to hit up a surplus or survival gear store? That was a test. And you failed, and now you're dead. In fact, you should be doing any zombie prepping now before the actual zombies hit, because trying to do so after the fact is probably only going to get you killed. See, it's like when you visit an online forum and see posts by hundreds of people all proclaiming how they would hit up their local gun shop first thing and become some sort of badass zombie killing vigilante, except literally everybody else is going to have the exact same idea. Not to mention, you know, the gun shop owners themselves, who by virtue of owning a gun shop, are probably pretty heavily armed. Rather than heading to a place full of desperate, terrified people who are now heavily armed, just use that time to get away. You're going to have a pretty narrow window of time to actually use highways and city streets before they become a congested mess, and it's far better to use that time to get out of Dodge while all the internet tough guys fight each other at the gun store. Besides, you'll probably be able to hit up similar shops in much smaller population towns long after the initial wave of panic has hit and most of your competition is, well, dead. Number 7. Stop aiming for the head. 
Everyone knows that the golden rule of zombie survival is to aim for the head, for some very weird reason. I mean, we're dealing with the living dead, the brain at this point is just a bunch of dead tissue. And yet the golden rule is zombies can't die unless you destroy the head. Well, we'll leave that for the hardcore zombie lore fans to figure out, but for the rest of us, we're worried about two things in our zombie apocalypse, survival and conserving resources. Aiming for the head is a notoriously difficult thing to do. You may be a whiz in PUBG, but fire Firing a weapon in real life is quite a bit more difficult than video games make it out to be. There's a reason why police officers and soldiers are taught to aim center mass instead of to take sweet headshots, and that's because center mass is far easier to hit and will seriously ruin somebody's day. Now a zombie may not have vital organs functioning anymore and can't bleed out, but they do still have to obey the laws of physics and if you manage to destroy a vertebrae or blow out a kneecap, that zombie isn't walking anywhere. Our skeletal system is easy to overlook, it's on our inside and literally just sits there your entire life doing a whole lot of nothing. But one of the things it does do is provide structural support for your muscles, and without that support we'd all basically be fleshy beanbags. For zombies, destroying that support is going to drop them faster than Taylor Swift drops number one hits about ex-boyfriends. And while it may not be a killing blow, that doesn't really matter if the zombie can't move around anymore. Number 6. Learn First Aid You're gonna get hurt in the zombie apocalypse, it's pretty much inevitable. Now, there's no hospitals to take care of you and no 911 to call and get an ambulance. On the one hand, it's kind of nice that you won't be shelling out your life savings just because you had to visit the hospital once. On the other, you're probably going to die now from totally preventable causes. We've largely forgotten our ancient past, and the modern wonders of civilization have insulated us from just how terrible life is in the wild, but also just how terrible our bodies are for living in the wild. We're pretty much the slowest and weakest of animals amongst our weight class, and our bodies are just lousy at surviving in the wild. Our bones are basically made out of glass, in comparison to thick tough cow or bear bones, and ridiculously thin skin has no thick fur to protect us from the cold or cuts or scrapes, and it's gonna be pretty important to learn how to take care of yourself and others. So learning some first aid now before your neighbors are trying to eat your brains is going to do wonders for your survival. Number 5. If nothing else, learn tourniquets. Every American soldier receives some basic first aid training, but the one thing that every soldier learns how to use and apply to themselves or others is the tourniquet. Our bodies are not only weak and pathetic in comparison to the other animals, but they have a lousy habit of gushing blood everywhere that really should stay inside your body. For minor to moderate cuts and wounds, applying direct pressure with makeshift bandages and perhaps elevating an affected limb will do. When the wound is serious enough though and your body won't stop pumping all its blood out onto the floor, no matter how much you ask it not to, you're going to have to take some drastic measures. In these circumstances, you're going to want to shut the flow off as soon as possible and the best way to do that is a tourniquet. Simply tear a shirt into a long strip and tie it around your limb with a knot, then place a stick over the knot and tie a second knot over for the stick. Now, you're going to crank that stick in a circular motion, tightening the strip of the shirt tied around your limb. You're going to want to really crank that thing, because your goal is to shut off blood flow. But you need to ensure that you're shutting off the flow from deeply embedded arteries, so you're going to require a great deal of pressure. Once the blood has stopped doing its best to vacate your body, you're going to want to secure the stick with a second strip of cloth and tie that as tightly as you can as well so that the stick doesn't unwind and loosen the tourniquet. Number 4. Store up fuel, but only if you plan on using it within a year. In every zombie apocalypse show or movie, there's always the scene of survivors hotwiring cars and making a last minute escape from a horde of angry zombies. In the real world, depending on how long ago the apocalypse began, trying to do that will only leave you trapped in a very much dead car, surrounded by, well, the dead. That's because gasoline can and does break down over time and trying to store it for later use is going to prove difficult under the best of circumstances. You can use some commercially available stabilizers to extend the lifetime of gasoline, but the best you're going to get is maybe a year and two or three months. Same goes for diesel fuel. So if you're hoarding up fuel, then good job because you're becoming proactive about your survival, but also make sure you use it as soon as possible before it becomes useless sludge. Number 3. Learn to make fire without matches or a lighter. 
Yep, the fuel inside a lighter will eventually break down too, and matches, well, they can get ruined by the weather or zombie attack victims rudely bleeding all over them. Your best bet will be to learn how to make a fire the way our ancestors did, and if a bunch of prehistoric cavemen could make the fire, then come on, how hard can it be? Well, actually, it's ridiculously difficult to make fire the old-fashioned way, as many people who have to pass a military survival course have learned the hard way. Even if you know how to create a bow and a stick contraption to start the fire and happen to have great kindling, it can still take a very, very long time to get even a tiny ember going. Instead, get your hands on a magnifying glass, which should be easy enough to find at any science classroom. You can also use a highly polished crystal, which you can find in any new-agey mystical mumbo-jumbo store. As long as the crystal can focus light the way a magnifying glass does, you'll be able to get fire started in no time with nothing more than the sun. While this won't work very well on cloudy days, even with just a little bit of sun, you'll very quickly be setting fire to everything and anything you desire. Just remember, forest fires are still a thing, and this time there's no fire department coming to put it out. Be ashamed to survive The Walking Dead only to roast yourself alive because you didn't listen to Smokey the Bear. Number 2. Turn 2-liter soda bottles into cordage There's few things in the world more useful than rope. And in a world gone all zombie, having rope can be a literal lifesaver. You can use it for everything, from harnesses, securing doors, making leashes for pet zombies, and tying off limbs that refuse to stop bleeding. In the survival community, rope is known as cordage, and you're going to definitely want to get your hands on some. Typically, you can make a pretty decent cordage from tough, stringy plant fibers, pulling them off in long strands and wrapping them together to make a thicker single rope. This can be time-consuming and, depending on where you are geographically, impossible. While it won't make a rope, though, you can get a decent length of cordage that you can use for a variety of things from something that, thanks to mankind's refusal to actually put trash in the trash bin, is now a part of every natural environment. 2-liter soda bottles. Simply take your trusty knife – you did pack a knife into your survival kit, right? – and then cut off the bottom of the soda bottle so that you're left with what's essentially a giant funnel. Then cut down into the plastic on one side of the bottle for a thickness of cordage that you want. And after that, it's as simple as cutting the plastic into a long, unbroken strip. The trick is to keep the thickness even, but with a little practice, you'll easily get the hang of it. Besides, it's not like discarded plastic bottles are uncommon or anything. There's literally millions of them in the ocean alone, keeping all the sea turtles company. Number 1. Build a shelter So by now, if you've taken our advice, you've left the cities behind and you're headed up north like you got Klondike fever. Civilization tends to get a bit sparse the further north you go, but because we're turning you into a bona fide zombie apocalypse surviving badass, you don't need no home, you'll make your own. While wild animals can sleep perfectly fine in the elements, we're pathetic, weak creatures who can't even survive one rainy night in the wilderness without the hides of other animals to protect us from the cold. Pretty high on your list of priorities, somewhere between don't get eaten by zombies and find food and water, you're going to want to put build a shelter. Your shelter should be tailored to your environment, and you'll need to learn how to make shelter suitable for the season you find yourself in. If you've headed up north, then during winter shelter will actually be pretty easy. Simple snow caves can be deceptively warm and comfortable, as snow is a fantastic insulator, and the chill of the snow outside your inner chamber will help keep the snow on the inside from melting due to your heating the place up with your body. You can even make small fires inside snow caves, though, of course, you want to ensure that you have proper ventilation. To create a snow cave, simply dig into a deep snow bank about 3 feet down, and then level off a foot or two and make a sharp right or left turn, followed by one more sharp turn. The U-bend you create will help keep out chill winds and trap heat. On the ceiling, you'll want to bore out a small ventilation shaft just a few inches wide, because even if you don't light a fire, snow caves can get lousy with CO2 from all your breathing. In the warmer months, building a mound-type stick hut is quick and easy, plus surprisingly sturdy and good at keeping out rain and wind if built correctly. Start by finding large, sturdy branches to act as the foundation, and then lay them against each other so they form a large dome. The weight of the branches leaning against each other should be sufficient to keep them propped up, so your initial foundation is probably going to require a lot of large, thick branches. After this layer, you'll want to find smaller, leafy branches to cover up the first layer thoroughly. Then simply repeat for at least three more layers to create multiple layers of leafy branches over your foundation of thick, strong branches. Once that's done, add a final layer of thick, strong branches to make sure that strong wind doesn't blow your thinner, leafy branches away. 
In essence, what you've done is create a multi-layered structure that will be very effective at keeping the wind and even rain out, though you may have a few small leaks in places. If you want to take your shelter building game to a whole new level though, fill buckets with fresh wet river mud and smear a layer of mud in between the leafy layers and the final layer of thick branches. Once the mud dries and hardens, you'll have waterproofed your makeshift house and you'll be riding out the apocalypse in true hobo fashion. Boom. Blinding light washes out the landscape around you. Several things all happen within a second. First, your vehicle dies as an electromagnetic pulse spreads at the speed of light, killing all unshielded electronics. In the civilian world, that means practically everything. If you were not blinded by the flash of the explosion, you'd see sparks dancing along the high voltage wires overhead as they're overloaded with electricity. All modern vehicles that rely on fancy computers and electronic gadgets that make them super efficient and comfortable are now just useless hunks of junk on four wheels. Personal computers, cell phones, even pacemakers are all instantly shut down across a 40-mile radius, and they'll never come back online again. The power grid is absolutely ruined and will need to be completely replaced before it's ever operational again, a task that will take years. You're lucky that you were driving in the opposite direction of the detonation point, because if not, you would have been facing toward it. What's just happened about a mile above your city is the birth of a second sun that burns brightly for just a few milliseconds. That's all that's needed to unleash a billion joules of energy, though. And much of that energy is in the visible wavelength and searing the eyes of anyone who happened to be even glancing in its general direction at detonation. Those within a two to three mile radius will be blind forever, assuming they survive what's coming next, while anyone outside of that area might be blind for a matter of hours or minutes depending on the distance. Even those who avoided being permanently blinded will likely suffer at least some vision loss as a result. You're safely out of the immediate impact area, but for those who aren't, ionizing radiation tears through their bodies from the detonation. Their DNA is completely unraveled as the ionizing radiation rips through them. It's like taking millions of microscopic shotgun blasts, only these pellets completely disintegrate the very instructions for life. Most people within a half a mile will die immediately from the radiation exposure if what comes in the next few seconds doesn't kill them, of course. Outside of that range, the effects of radiation poisoning fall off steeply. You were in your car, which protected you from a lot of the thermal radiation, but not all of it. Your arm was hanging out the window, and even at over two miles from the detonation point, your arm has suffered some pretty nasty second-degree burns. You're lucky. 35% of the energy from a nuclear explosion is released as heat, and anyone caught out in the open can suffer third-degree burns at a distance of up to five miles. If third-degree burns cover 24% of the person's body, or second-degree burns cover 30% of their body, those individuals will go into serious shock, with death imminent. All flammable material directly under and surrounding the blast site catch on fire because of the intense heat. Even at two miles out, some of the paint on your car evaporates, and the car door becomes painfully hot to the touch. Tires on vehicles all around you burst as the rubber softens and weakens, while billboards catch on fire. People caught out in the open are consumed in flames as their clothes ignite while they're still wearing them. Some people's hair is literally seared off their heads, leaving behind painful second-degree burns across their scalp. This has just been one second into a nuclear detonation. Your car spins out of control as the tires go flat, but you're lucky to come to an abrupt but mostly safe stop. You have barely enough time to look into the rearview mirror before you see what's coming next. Like an invisible tsunami, the pressure wave is now smashing its way across the landscape starting from the detonation point and radiating outwards. This has been a nuclear attack using an intercontinental ballistic missile, so the explosion took place a few hundred meters above the city. This way, the pressure wave could expand outwards unimpeded by terrain and buildings. A ground impact is highly unfavorable, as it leads to buildings or terrain features absorbing much of the pressure wave and limiting the damage dramatically. Directly below and up to a mile away from the detonation point, the destruction is complete. Buildings are flattened and tall skyscrapers are annihilated leaving behind only the very core of each building, jutting up a few hundred feet like a shattered skeletal figure. Plenty of sewers and service tunnels crisscross a modern city, not to mention transportation tunnels in the sub. All of these are collapsed, killing hundreds stuck below or trapping them with no hope of rescue. Outside of a mile, the damage falls off, but is still severe. Multiple-story buildings are seriously damaged, leading to many simply collapsing in on themselves or against their neighbors. Buildings with only a few stories are less severely affected, but have every single window blown out and many of their roofs collapse, killing anyone below. At least the tunnels and sewers that crisscross the city here are safe from collapse. Only a few are seriously damaged. Almost no human beings up to two miles out survive if caught out in the open. You're just over two miles out from detonation. 
and here the damage falls off once again. Windows are blown out and some roofs and walls collapse, but generally buildings remain standing. As the pressure wave catches up to you, your car is physically picked up and tossed, like an angry kid playing with their Hot Wheels cars. The pressure wave blows your car over and threatens to tip it, but you're too far away and your car comes crashing back down onto all four wheels. Debris pelts the landscape around you, and you're mostly safe inside your car. A few people standing out in the street get taken out by chunks of concrete hurtled through the air by a 300 mile an hour wind. The roar of a second sun coming to life above your city has been so incredibly loud that you've temporarily lost all hearing. It'll probably return in time, but for those closer to detonation, they could experience permanent or severe hearing loss. A strange silence falls over the city five seconds after detonation as a massive mushroom cloud slowly drifts up into the sky. Then the screaming starts. Tens of thousands of people seriously injured, tens of thousands less so. You're now on a ticking clock because you've survived the initial explosion through sheer luck, but surviving what comes next is going to take skills, knowledge, and quick thinking. Tick tock, tick tock. You've got 15 minutes before you're dead. What's currently happening and what will kill even more people than the initial explosion is that an ecological disaster is in the brew and about to break out all over you and every survivor in your city. The detonation of a nuclear weapon above your city has sent ionizing radiation all over the landscape, penetrating into the very building materials of the city itself. The thermal flash and pressure wave pulverized all of that irradiated material and turned it into a very fine dust. Then the incredible heat, reaching as much as the surface of the sun for a few milliseconds, creates huge convection currents that suck up gargantuan quantities of air and sends it roaring upward into the sky, hence the mushroom cloud. But all that air is impregnated with billions of tons of highly radioactive dust, and in approximately 15 minutes that dust is going to start falling all around you. You panic because you know what's coming, but you've got a choice to make. You could probably find a working vehicle somewhere and take that to flee the city, trying to outrun the fallout cloud that's about to break over your head. In fact, many people along the suburbs right now are climbing into their cars to do just that. But you're smarter than that. You know that even if you found a working vehicle in the next minute, you could never outrun the cloud of fallout looming overhead. It's being propelled along by winds in the upper atmosphere and will outpace anything but the fastest sports car. Plus, the roads and highways are inevitably going to be choked up with vehicles and other people with the same idea. The particles in the stem of the mushroom cloud will end up falling right back down where they were picked up. Not many people will die from them, but that's pretty much only because anyone under the growing thick black sooty stem of a massive mushroom cloud is already dead from the initial explosion. It's the rest of the billowing cloud that you have to worry about because what goes up definitely comes down. But you're not the only one in danger, as much of the radioactive fallout will reach the uppermost layers of the atmosphere where it will be carried along by strong winds. Massive plumes of radiation will fall for hundreds of miles from the detonation point, poisoning communities entire states away. This is the very reason why Russia might saber-rattle and talk tough about using tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine, but in reality it would only be shooting itself in the foot as prevailing winds would carry much of the fallout right back into Russia itself. To avoid dying in the next 15 minutes, you have a choice to make. Avoiding radiation poisoning is about three things – time, distance, and shielding. The more time you spend away from a radiation source, the safer you'll be as the radioactive decay, especially in fission byproducts of nuclear explosions, tends to make dangerous particles extremely short-lived. The greater the distance between you and an unshielded radioactive source also means you'll be exposed to less radiation. Meanwhile, shielding takes into account placing barriers between yourself and a radioactive source. If you can't meet the requirements of one, time, distance, or shielding, then you must compensate by adding even more of the other two requirements. To survive a nuclear attack, you're going to have to do all three, though. First, take a look around you. Your first choice, and the absolute worst, is to remain in your vehicle. This will put some shielding and distance between yourself and the fallout. The only good news is that the radioactive debris about to rain down on you is only hazardous if it's extremely close to your body. So if your car can simply physically keep it away from you, odds of survival have greatly increased. You need to put all the windows up and close all the vents, stuffing them with anything that you have available. You can't let there be a single crack. The first radioactive particles to fall will be the size of grains of sand or salt, and these should be easy to keep out. However, over time, the finer radioactive debris will begin to descend and this can be as small as specks of dust. In fact, you can detect the presence of radioactive fallout after a nuclear explosion simply by seeing coatings of dust on objects. A car is a terrible survival choice, but it's better than nothing. However, an even better choice is sheltering inside a building with a basement if possible. 
Basements might not seem like the best choice since so much of the fine debris is going to settle in low places, but the key is to choose a basement with as few entrances as possible, and then to seal those entrances as best you can. However, in many modern cities, especially in sunny SoCal, basements are rare. In that case, you want to move to the centermost area of a home or a building and shelter in place there. Staying at the core of a building will add distance and shielding between yourself and the harmful fallout. But if you're going to survive, you're going to have to take some precautions before the radioactive dust starts falling. Hopefully you've got duct tape available nearby, in which case you need to immediately seal all windows and doors with duct tape. A closed window will be fine to protect you from the initial larger grains of debris that falls down first, but every window is leaky and the finer particles will ride in on those air currents, potentially poisoning you inside your shelter. This is why it's important to seal windows and doors with tape and to make your shelter as far away from any window as possible, ideally past several closed doors. Your first priority is securing your shelter and luckily, you found an intact office building to hide inside along with a few other survivors. Working quickly, you seal off all exterior windows and then taped up the doors leading to the inner core. But now that you're somewhat safe, it's time to get naked. No, you're not repopulating the earth already, you're avoiding a very nasty death by radiation poisoning. If you were outside at the time of detonation, there's a serious risk that you've already contaminated your clothing with radioactive particle debris. That's why any of you who were outside when the bomb went off need to immediately remove all outer garments and put them in a plastic bag of some kind, then seal the bag off. If possible, put that first bag inside a second plastic bag and store it somewhere far away from you and make sure everyone is aware of its location. You're also going to immediately want to start wiping everyone down. This means using the buddy system to get in those hard to reach spots that you can't get by yourself. You're going to be stuck with your new friends for a while, so what better icebreaker than to get naked and give each other a quick wipe down? You need to remove all exterior contamination from your body so that it doesn't rest against your skin and damage your body with ionizing radiation. You can do this with simple soap and water to scrub away any grime, but even just brushing off with a clean cloth is enough. Afterwards, though, anything that you use to clean each other off with is going to have to go into another containment bag. Never reuse or reopen an old containment bag already full of contaminated material. Now that you've avoided the most imminent hazard, exterior contamination, your next greatest threat and one that will persist for a while is interior contamination. This will come from the finer radioactive debris that can get inside wounds or be breathed in and settle into your lungs or along your esophagus. Inside your shelter, your odds of survival are good, but only if you stay in place. You've created distance and shielding, but now you need to add time to the equation. Fallout contamination decays very quickly with it giving off 80% of its energy in the very first day. However, the debris is still energetic enough to be deadly even after one day. For every seven-fold factor of time, dose rates decreases by a factor of 10. Two hours after detonation, the fallout will have lost half its energy, but this can still be extremely deadly. Ideally, you'll want to shelter in place for a full 72 hours before leaving your shelter, at which rate remaining radioactive debris will still be harmful, but only if you remain in contact with it for long amounts of time. Unfortunately, your city is going to be a hell-blasted nuclear landscape after an attack, so you'll be in constant contact with radioactive debris even after three days. That's why the CDC recommends you wait a full seven days before leaving your shelter, as this will give you the best survival rates. By that time, radioactive fallout will have a fraction of its original energy and be much less dangerous. At this point, external contamination is unlikely to be a serious threat anymore, but the biggest threat comes from internal contamination. Too weak to penetrate the skin at this point, radioactive debris that gets lodged into wounds or inside your lungs can still be deadly or pose serious long-term health risks. So when you leave your shelter, you want to take precautions against breathing in fine radioactive particles. Face masks like the type we've been wearing due to the coronavirus outbreak are okay, but not great for this. You'd be better off wetting a t-shirt or other large cloth and wrapping it over your mouth and nose. It's important to keep it wet as the moisture will attract fine particles and trap them and important to cover both your nose and mouth. After any excursion, you'll need to wash whatever protective equipment you've used and all exterior garments. If you can, give your body a good washing down as well, just to remove any fine particles that you might end up breathing in or shoving into a cut or scrape accidentally. Hopefully, you had food and water in your shelter, or at least just water, or you probably aren't making it to this milestone, and your story ends here. But if you've managed to survive seven days, you're now going to have to think about long-term survival. First, you need to consider if it's best to remain where you are or seek help. Assuming that this was a small-scale attack, there should still be help from the military or emergency response agencies coming to your city. If it was a full-scale nuclear conflict, though, you're probably completely on your own. If you think help is coming, work on increasing the resiliency of your shelter. Improve the shielding to the outside. 
by creating layers of plastic or cloth like curtains that hang in front of the exterior doors. This will help keep radioactive dust down as people go in and out. If you can, simply make suits out of garbage bags to wear over your outer clothing. That way it can be removed and thrown away in specified disposal locations after each trip. If you've got water to spare, create two cleaning areas for boots. You can do this by filling two buckets with water and dipping your boots into each one in succession. After a few rinses, dispose of the water somewhere so there's no chance of it contaminating you or your shelter. You're going to want to pay special attention to boots and feet, as they'll be the most likely to get saturated with fine radioactive debris since most of it will settle on the ground. You'll also want to make sure your shelter is visible to search and rescue parties who are looking for survivors. Create large geometric shapes made of bright materials to immediately grab the attention of a helicopter or passing rescue vehicle or patrol. SOS is a global sign of distress, but in a city you should be able to find many creative ways of making it obvious that your shelter is occupied with survivors. Make sure to regularly clean your emergency displays to make it obvious people are still alive, otherwise rescue workers might simply assume that the shelter has been abandoned. Whether you move out or shelter in place, you'll probably need to find food and water eventually. It should be obvious, but avoid anything that isn't completely sealed in non-permeable material like plastic. Canned goods are excellent options as they're airtight, but even pastas or breads in plastic wrapping is okay to eat as long as the wrapping is completely sealed. Just don't open any food items outside of your shelter, and it's best to wrap them in cloth or plastic as you transport them through the outside world and back into your shelter, though as usual you'll need to decontaminate whatever you use to protect them. You'll also want to get rid of the wrapping material or tin cans after they're done if they've been in an unsecured area where they could have been exposed to outside dust. Water will be trickier, because there will almost certainly be no electricity in your city, which means no water pumps to supply water. If you're lucky enough to be in a safe interior location when an attack takes place, immediately plug up sinks and bathtubs and fill them with water, if it's still flowing. Underground water pipes will be safe from the radioactive fallout for a long time, but not forever as eventually the body of water that feeds them will be contaminated. That's why even if you have running water after an attack, you don't want to rely on it. Better yet, stock up on water bottles, which should be easy to find in shopping centers and corner stores after an attack. Most water bottles are made of thick plastic, which will keep the contents safe even after a fallout has descended. However, as usual, you want to decontaminate every bottle of water you bring into your shelter from the outside before you start messing with it. If you can't find water, your best option might be just to start moving and get out of the city or head toward emergency services. Major airports are a good place to head toward as it's likely this is where the first rescue efforts will take place. However, if you can't reach one, or if government help isn't coming, survival will still depend on getting out of the city. It'll help if you can figure out which way the prevailing winds are blowing and head perpendicular to them. You don't want to head into the wind because you could just be getting facefuls of contaminated dust. Instead, much like a rip current, head perpendicular and get out of the stream of air that's carrying radioactive waste. Once you're out of the city, your best bet is to head toward high ground. You're safer on the leeward side of a mountain where the wind hasn't blown radioactive dust and debris onto the soil. Radioactive fallout will settle in low areas, and rains and streams will wash it down the mountains and into the valleys and plains below. It would be wise to learn what major drinking water sources are around your city and then head to those that are on high ground. If you can shelter in a safe area for a few months, radioactivity levels and remaining debris should be manageable. At this point, if you're forced to continue living in the area of a nuclear attack, a long healthy life is out of the question, but you can probably enjoy a moderately long life with few serious health problems. Some radioactive elements will remain deadly for years. Strontium-90, for instance, is still dangerous after 10 years, as is cesium-137. If you can't get away from the site of a nuclear attack or if your entire nation has come under attack, there's probably little you can do to avoid these dangers, as these elements will become part of the environment itself. But there's a reason why both Hiroshima and Nagasaki are habitable today, and that's because a nuclear attack from another nation will almost certainly be of the airburst variety. A ground burst weapon is one designed to explode when it hits the ground. This greatly limits its destructive potential, but also causes massive plumes of irradiated material. However, an airburst weapon explodes above its target so the destructive shockwave and thermal radiation can hit as wide an area as possible. This also comes with the benefit of shooting much of the weapon's radioactive output into the atmosphere or into space. Within days of both the Hiroshima and Nagasaki explosions, people were inhabiting the ruins and living lives with few if any health effects. So cheer up, because the end isn't here after all. Now it's time to grab your trusty Pip-Boy and head off into the greatest Fallout LARP event the world has ever put on. Day 1, 0 100 hours. Crawl, dirtbags! An instructor tears into your tent. 
quickly followed by several others. They're all carrying rifles or old M60s and are firing blanks with wild abandon. Some of the instructors toss out a grenade simulator and smoke grenades. The fake grenades still explode with a hell of a bang, and the sudden cacophony of noise is enough to temporarily drive you deaf. You've made it through weeks and weeks of the toughest training on Earth, but what awaits you now is five days of absolute hell. If you survive, though, you'll have the privilege of joining the ranks of the single most elite fighting force the planet has ever seen. You were smart and slept in your uniform and boots, so it's only a matter of flipping out of the bunk and landing on the ground before starting to low crawl. Instructors fire off blanks over your head as more flashbangs and smoke grenades go off. It's utter pandemonium, meant to stun and disorient you. But you know war will be worse. It's all a mental game. You simply have to shut out the screaming instructors, the firing of hundreds of blanks all around you, and the bursts of grenade simulators. Just focus and crawl. You crawl 100 meters on asphalt from your tent to the compound, the place you've sweat in harsh PT for months now. On a raised platform stands a senior instructor awaiting for your class of 90 to fall into formation. As your fellow classmates make the grueling crawl, you already see one standing up. That can only mean one thing, he's quitting. He looks dazed and slightly confused. He may have been a little too close to one of the flash grenades when it went off. Oh well, injury and accidents claim as many would-be SEALs as the inability to continue in the brutal training. San Diego is seated right in sunny SoCal, but in the fall, the area is prone to rainstorms and temperatures can dip into the 30s at night. Today is no exception, and as the instructors order you to double-time it back to the tents, rain starts to fall. Don't worry though, Buttercup, because the last thing the instructors want is for you to be left out all cold in the rain. That's why they had the decency of tearing your sea bag apart and removing all the carefully packed uniforms from the plastic waterproof packaging. Next, you'll be taking it into the ocean for a quick half-hour wash in neck-deep water. You have less than a minute to repack your sea bag and get your ass to the beach. Then it's an icy cold plunge into the Pacific Ocean, so you can fight the waves in tide and neck-deep water. Everything inside your sea bag is going to get soaked in seawater, and that's the point. There'll be no comforts these next five days, and even if the uniforms dry off on their own, you'll still have to contend with all the chafing sand and salt they're getting covered in. Though, don't worry, because you'll be real good friends with the ocean this week. You're in the surf for just over half an hour with the instructors watching over you from a 12-foot berm. The entire time they're complaining about how cold it is, despite the fact that they've got warm jackets on and rain ponchos. It's all part of the psych game. They're probing each and every one of you for weakness. With teeth chattering so hard you're legitimately afraid you might chip one or two of them, you briefly think that all you have to do to make the cold and pain end is just quit. Nobody would even blame you for it. But you shove that thought out of your mind and you blank your brain. That's the key to survival here. Don't think about anything except the task set before you. One of the instructors makes an offer. He knows that you and your class have prepped for Hell Week by stashing little snacks around the training area. If one of you gets him a snack, he'll let you out of the water. Initially, nobody says anything. It's true. You've personally hidden at least two candy bars in the sand in spots only you know of. Surviving Hell Week isn't just about carefully obeying orders and following rules, it's about breaking them and cheating when you can without getting caught. Because in combat there are no rules, there's only mission success. You expect one of your other classmates to give in to the temptation of giving up their own stash just to spare some time in the water, but it seems everyone's wise enough to know that the extra calories later is worth more than avoiding some discomfort now. After another 20 minutes, you're given the order to get out of the water and return your sea bags to your tents. At least they'll be out of the rain, but you won't be, because you're going for a little boat trip. You and your class are ordered to report to the beach assembled in boat crews with your IBS, or inflatable boat, small. You think you know it's coming. You've been rowing out to surf despite waves as tall as 12 feet for weeks now, but the instructor throws a curveball at you. Tonight, you'll be doing rock portage. This sends a shiver down your spine. And it's not the cold, because you're shivering all the time now as your body fights up hypothermia. This is pure fear. You and your crew drag your boat out onto the surf and climb aboard it, fighting the raging waves. They still manage to flip over several of the small boats, and you think yours might be next, so you grab your paddle as hard as you can. There's a rule here in SEAL training, no loose paddles. You can get tossed out of your boat as much as you want, it's bound to happen, but you don't ever let go of your paddle. You're not just saving Uncle Sam money by not having to replace it, but you're also preventing serious injury to yourself and others by holding on to it. You've seen people get teeth knocked out and faces gashed open by loose paddles. Incredibly, you managed to break past the 10-foot waves and now paddle out into the Pacific Ocean before paddling down to a point directly across from a mess of sharp, jagged rocks. Other boats line up, and then on a signal from the instructors on the shore, you and a second boat begin your approach. The goal is simple, land your team on the rocks. The reality is far from it. 
The waves are vicious and the boat takes a pounding. As you get to the rocks, a wave picks up half your boat and brings it crashing down. Someone smashes their face right onto a flat rock. They're lucky to avoid one of the jagged ones, while another student who is struggling to get out of the boat gets their foot cut between two rocks as the boat pushes them over. You can hear the sickly snap of an ankle being broken in two, even through the rain and roaring waves. You're lucky, and you only get some mild cuts and bruises as you scramble over the slick rocks. But then you turn back because there's no lifeguards here. Someone has to get your buddy with the broken ankle out of the water before the waves break him to pieces on the rocks. And that someone is you and your boat crew. Working together, you manage to pull them to safety. There's already a medic on scene and waiting, another dropout. But you see the respect in your instructor's eyes. Injury doesn't mean a pause in the training, and it's far from the only one this night. As the final boat crews make the extremely dangerous landing, you're given a moment to rest, literally a moment, before grabbing your boat, putting it over your head, and jogging to a pier. Then it's back in the water for another hour of treading water. Eventually, the instructors order you to inflate your pants by tying off the bottom of the legs so you can use them as flotation devices. That's a small mercy. You get a hot breakfast at 6 a.m. and you're allowed to eat it indoors at the chow facility. You eat everything on your plate and fill yourself with some hot coffee while you have the chance. It's an incredible luxury. And the Navy isn't feeding you well out of the kindness of its heart, it's literally keeping you alive. You're burning so many calories shivering and exercising that without four meals a day you will die. Then it's back into the water for more swimming and paddling. By the time night approaches, you've completed your first full day of Hell Week, and there's four more coming. Day 2 you wake with a start to the sound of a screaming instructor. You were dreaming of sleeping comfortably in your cot, but when you come to, you're right back on the beach. Your team was fastest on the latest lap swim, and as a reward, you've got a whole 10 minutes of rest. That's it. Now you've been up for 24 hours and you've slept less than 20 minutes that entire time, snatching up a minute of shut eye here or there whenever you could get it. The instructors have a surprise for you today. They decided to give you a break from the ocean and instead order you to grab your IBS and get marching south along the beach. The Mexico border isn't very far from here, and you're wondering where in the world you're headed when you spot the outlet of the Tijuana River. You've been marching for 8 miles through sand with a 300-pound boat on your head before you see it. Welcome to Camp Swampy, also known as the Mud Flats or the Sloughs. This is where the Tijuana River runs along the Mexico border and empties into the Pacific. The river brings with it plenty of churned up mud and even worse things as some of the sewage from the city of Tijuana ends up in that water. This is the perfect playground for seals to be, and the instructors are waiting for you, with huge grins on their faces. Getting here was a race against the other remaining teams, there's nine now. Everything you do is a race, and the prize for coming in first is the sweet few minutes of relief you get for waiting for the final teams to make it. Your team got here second, and you get an incredibly luxurious five minutes by a roaring fire to warm up and do what your body is screaming for, sleep. Inevitably, the sound of a whistle wakes you right back up. Uncle Sam cares deeply about your self-esteem, which is why he's prepared a mud treatment just for you. At the sound of a second whistle, it's elbows and asses into the mud, and you're ordered to cover yourself in it completely, even shoving it down each other's pants and into your shirts. Hey, don't look so glum. A Beverly Hills spa would charge hundreds of dollars for this treatment, and the US Navy is giving it to you for free out of the kindness of its heart. Never mind the mud is seeped in random sewage, probably at least partially toxic, and smells like the devil's… hole. Stick it in your face and get it into every nook and cranny. All the instructors want to see from you is white eyeballs and teeth. Then it's time for games. Mud races mostly, with random breaks to ensure everyone refreshes their exfoliating mud treatment by covering every single square inch of their bodies in freezing mud all over again. When it comes time to eat, you do your best to eat as little mud as possible, but it's inevitable. Several more students quit. One of them looks physically ill. The instructors wrap them up in warm blankets, give them hot coffee and fresh jelly donuts. Then they make them sit in front of you and eat their donuts and drink their hot coffee. It's yet another mental torture, but you'll shove it out of your thoughts. Day 3 Days blend into each other in Hell Week, especially when your brain is actively hallucinating because it's so sleep deprived. You're still in the mud flats and spend hours playing hide and seek games with the instructors and against other teams, darting from bush to bush and rock to rock. You run into several illegal border crossers only to send them off screaming. You don't blame them, you look like a monster, covered head to toe in wet caked mud. People's bodies are starting to give out on them, and a class full of 20 year olds is now moving around like they're in their 90s. The instructors give you one break, allowing you to collapse into bleachers built there specifically for SEAL trainees. 50 feet away, just far enough that none of the heat reaches you, is a blazing bonfire. An instructor makes you all a deal. If you can tell him a funny story that makes him laugh, you can go stand by the fire. A trainee gives it a shot. 
gets rejected. As punishment, he has to go dunk himself in the mud again. You think you've got something about the time your stepdad walked in on you while you were watching some adult entertainment online. It's a hit, and the instructor roars with laughter as he allows you to stand up and double time it over to the fire. The heat is a godsend, and you revel in the first warmth you felt in days. You could stand here forever, it seems, and you want nothing more than to roll up on the ground and go right to sleep. The heat is so intense that it causes steam to billow off your uniform. And then, one of the instructors begins shouting, Student on fire! Fire! Everyone in the water! It's a big joke to the instructors, but you respond automatically, gritting your teeth as you hit the freezing water. It's back into the wet mud for you as your entire class is ordered to stand neck deep in the water for another hour. Then the instructors tell you all to stick your head down under the water and keep it there for a full five seconds. If anyone got up early, everyone would have to do it again. You take a gulp of air and go down counting 1 1,000, 2 1,000, 3 1,000, 4 1,000, 5 1,000, 6 1,000. You give it an extra second. You don't want to be the reason everyone has to repeat the torturous exercise, but it's all just a mind game. And the instructors call out random students, forcing everyone back under the water. You do this again for who knows how many hours before it's back on the beach and back on the bleachers. Another round of funny stories, another opportunity to stand next to the fire, and inevitably, another shout of student on fire, everyone in the water, and it happens all over again. Day 4 It's 2 in the morning, and you're allowed your first official sleep of Hell Week. You and your team are crammed underneath the overturned IBS, nuts to buns, desperately trying to leach each other's body heat. The guys in the middle are the luckiest since they get the most body warmth. But the Navy doesn't play favorites, and it wants everyone to have a chance at the middle. That's why one member of each boat crew has to get up and run around the perimeter of the camp, shouting out, It's Hell Week at Camp Swampy, and all is well! It takes approximately a minute for the run to finish, after which he ducks under the boat and the next person in the front of the human stack gets to go. The process repeats itself over and over again until morning. But if there's a lapse in the running and shouting, the instructors immediately descend upon you ordering every single boat crew to get their asses back in the water. You manage to snatch a few minutes of sleep across the entire four hours from 2 a.m. to sunrise, then it's back up into the mud. A few more mud races and then finally a chance to clean yourself off with a long swim into the breaking surf. You're almost grateful to be out of the mud, even if the 8 to 10 foot waves do their best to drown you or pound you into the underwater rocks. There's a few more dropouts by the time the swimming is over, some from sheer physical exhaustion and others from even more injuries. The mud made yet another student too sick to continue on, and you hate to think about what crap you've covered yourself in for over a day. There's three less boat crews by the time you get to your IBS and put it over your head for the eight miles back to the compound. Bowel movements are becoming a serious concern at this point, and you've all been fighting them. There's no bathroom breaks in Seal Hell Week, so you and your buddies do your best to rush into the water to relieve yourselves. However, often accidents happen. And number twos just come while marching in the boat on the beach while you're sitting next to them, arms locked together, singing songs during the surf torture. What would have absolutely disgusted you a week ago is now nothing more than a minor annoyance, even when the contents of someone else's stomach end up on you. The human body can only function for so long without sleep, and when you refuse to let it get the rest it needs, the brain will snatch sleep when it can. You've fallen over at least five times while paddling your boat, going straight into the freezing cold ocean only to wake up with a start and drag yourself back up into the boat. It happens to everyone. Hallucinations are becoming much more frequent too. Most people hallucinate about food or warm fires. Others have full-blown mumbled conversations with themselves. A guy on your boat crew insists he sees a cartoon character rowing your boat with you. Everyone's brains are so starved for sleep that they're projecting dreams straight into reality. After evening chow, it's time for a special treat. The Navy wants to reward all your hard work with some rest and relaxation so everyone strips completely naked and jumps into the outdoor pool for a game of water polo. It's the most vicious game of water polo you'll ever play in your life, because the stakes are high. The winning team gets a brief rest, while the losing team has to stand under the outdoor showers for five minutes with the cold water running. This is on top of the freezing cold wind that's picked up. The motivation is high to win, and the race to five points is brutal with injuries on all sides. Your team wins the first game but ends up losing the second, so it's off to the showers for you. There's no word to describe the cold you feel under the showers as a blustery wind blows onto you. Your teeth are chattering so hard by now that you're sure you need dental work after this week is over. Day 5 You have no idea what time it is, but you've entered into Day 5, your final day of Hell Week. At some point past midnight, not too long after your freezing stay in the showers, you all pile back into the pool after being ordered to bring only a single IBS with you. This is confusing, as there's still over 30 of you left 
and you wonder what fresh hell the instructors have come up with. The game is simple. Everyone needs to get onto the IBS and remain atop it. Failure means doing it all over again. Those who get loaded on first have it worse. Sure, they get to rest briefly as the rest of the class climbs on, and you've learned to revel in seconds of rest, but as more and more people get onto the small boat, the more and more pressure that gets put on them. Eventually, the IBS begins to take on water, and while it won't sink, it'll go down a few inches into the water. This causes the people stuck at the bottom of the human pile to fight to keep their heads above water and breathe, which inevitably ends up with them kicking people off the IBS. In response, the instructors order you to do it all over again, and so it goes for at least two hours as you struggle to cram an entire class onto one boat and hold steady for at least a few seconds. To congratulate you in a job well done, the instructors reward you with a low crawl on the asphalt back to the beach and into the surf. The asphalt is torture to low crawl over, especially since you're back in your uniform which is crusted in sand and salt. The sand and salt tear at your skin as you drag yourself over the pavement a hundred meters before you hit the sand. The sand is easier, but it's much colder. Still, you prefer the sand over shredding your skin to ribbons on the hard pavement. Once at the surf, the 30 or so of you remaining lock arms and sit right where the waves break on the beach. They smash into you with tremendous force, and combined with the ever-blowing coastal wind, work to leach every ounce of heat from your bodies. You're on day 5 though, and you refuse to quit. Together you sing to keep spirits up, everything from old Baptist hymns to modern pop songs. The instructors meanwhile torture you psychologically by presenting you with steaming hot cups of coffee and warm jelly donuts. All you gotta do is quit, and a delicious donut and hot cup of joe and a warm blanket is waiting for you. But none of you do, at least not at first, because the instructors have saved the worst trick for last. Looking at your pathetic selves up and down, one of the instructors spits into the surf and declares you the worst motivated class he's ever personally seen. You're so poorly motivated that he's decided to enact a rare but special provision which allows an instructor to extend Hell Week by as much as two days. Your sorry asses have failed to impress him, and he's decided what you need is another two days of motivational training. Then he orders you all out of the surf and back onto your boats. The thought of putting that IBS back over your head is torture. The rubber boat rubs against your scalp with every single step and bump, rubbing it raw and even tearing your hair out. If you're in the back and put it onto one of your shoulders, it literally wears the skin off your bones. Then the salt and sand gets into it. It's absolute torture, but you sigh and begin to double time it straight to your boat. You didn't come this far to give up now, even though the news that you'll be doing another two days of this hits you like a sledgehammer, wrecking your morale. But when you get to your boat, one of your crew is missing. He's standing on the beach, tears streaming down his face. You know what this means, and you don't blame him. He can't bear the thought of another two days of this. And while some will call him weak for quitting now, the truth is he's proven he's a lot tougher than most people to make it this far. One less man means a lot more load for you to carry as the 300-pound IBS slams into the top of your head over and over again. You're at the front and too tired to lift it with your arms, so you let it rest on your skull. It's a good way to get a mild concussion, but at this point you're well past your physical limits and simply don't care. It's a race to the next evolution as usual, and against the odds and despite your missing crew member you manage to get there first this time. You collapse on the ground ready to soak up the few minutes of precious rest, but to your dismay the other teams were nearly as fast as you. You struggle back onto your feet, but your knees give out under you. One of your classmates grabs you and helps you up. That's probably the biggest part of Hell Week. Teamwork. Without it, none of you would make it. An instructor comes strutting up, and you can't imagine what fresh hell he's got in store for you. To your amazement, however, he says the sweetest words you've ever heard. Class, you are secured from Hell Week. There's no cheer. Everyone is too tired, and there's no celebration. Instead, you pick back up your IBS and lug it to the compound to stow it away. After this, you'll clean up a bit, get a medical inspection, and then be allowed to go home for the weekend. You've still got weeks and weeks of brutal training ahead, but you've completed the single most challenging event of becoming a Navy SEAL and joining the ranks of the deadliest fighting force humanity has ever produced. Few people have made more enemies than Vladimir Putin, and the dictator of Russia hasn't given them many ways to express their grievances. Sure, they can shout it in the public square, but the odds are the police will be right behind them. So it's not a surprise that some of them have resorted to other, more violent methods. But the KGB agent turned politician is ruthless, and he's managed to survive more than one assassination attempt. Some of them may just put action heroes to shame. Putin didn't just take office by election, he was appointed to the office of prime minister in 1999 by Russia's first and some would say only democratic leader, Boris Yeltsin. When Yeltsin stepped down, Putin became Russia's new president, and he's held one of the two positions ever since, taking down every check and balance in his way. That's 23 years of him wielding increasingly tight control over Russia, 
while his enemies are getting ever more desperate to remove him. The current laws mean he could hold power until 2036, and that's if he doesn't declare a permanent state of emergency as a result of the war. And for many of his opponents, Mother Russia's death grip feels even tighter. Russia is still technically a democracy, with elections being held at regular intervals. But are these elections truly free? That's much trickier. Arrests of protesters, opposition leaders, and businessmen who fall out of favor are increasingly common. And for those who Putin can't find any legal dirt on, he often gets them another way. Assassinations by poisoning have become a common trick of the trade for Putin, with noted Putin critic Alexander Litvinenko being fatally poisoned with polonium in 2006, and a double agent as well as his daughter being targeted with a nerve agent in 2018. While the latter two survived, what scared the world about these two attacks is that they happened in London, meaning Putin's agents wouldn't even tolerate dissent outside of Russia. And soon enough, Vladimir Putin would go from hunter to hunted. But Putin is notoriously secretive, rarely appearing in public. Even when he's in meetings with his inner circle, he often insists on being safe distances from them, just in case anyone thinks about returning to a common Soviet method of settling disputes with leadership. It happens so often, in fact, that it's become a running joke. If a Soviet citizen turns on the TV and they're playing Swan Lake instead of news and propaganda, odds are there's been an unexpected change in leadership. It's no wonder that Putin, who has ambitions of restoring much of the Soviet Union's territory, also employs some of its tactics. Which raises the question, how did we find out about the attempts on his life? It started with an unusual source, the acclaimed filmmaker and notorious conspiracy theorist Oliver Stone, who actually got to interview Putin in 2017. While asking the Russian president questions, Stone casually mentioned that Putin had survived five assassination attempts, which probably wasn't something that Putin intended to get out. While no secret police bundled Stone off to the gulag, it probably didn't help the case of any of the journalists who wanted to get interviews after that. But Putin's been making close escapes for over 20 years now. It all started in February 2000, not long after Putin took power. While attending the funeral of the former mayor of St. Petersburg, Anatoly Sobchak, Putin suddenly came under attack. Not many details are known of this attack, because Putin keeps him close to his chest. But what is known is that his security team quickly intervened and kept him safe. More ominously, when asked about this at a later date, the Federal Guard Service's press secretary would only comment that they had identified the organization behind the attack, which meant it wasn't a lone wolf attack, and more attacks were likely coming. They wouldn't have long to wait, only August of the same year, and on a much bigger scale. Putin was attending a summit of the former Soviet nations at Yalta, many of whom were likely worried that the Russian bear was looking to reclaim its old territory. But in the grand Soviet tradition, the reports didn't come out immediately. It would be weeks before anyone even revealed that an assassination attempt took place, and even longer before it was revealed that the attempt was against Putin. But once the details came out, everything fell into place. The Commonwealth of Independent States gathering brought a lot of grievances to the table, but one issue that wasn't on the table was the situation of the Chechens, a Russian Muslim minority group that had long been pushing for independence. Russia had cracked down on them multiple times, and that brought a group of radicals to the summit. Ultimately, four Chechens were arrested and a number of Middle Eastern nationals with them. But that was about all we know, because the documents were classified. It seems these plotters were arrested without ever getting close to Putin. But the same can't be said for later plots. If you asked the Russian security services for more information, the answer would probably be a solid nyet, which is why much of this information comes from third-hand sources much after the fact. But the higher profile the attempt, the harder it is to keep a lid on the incident. That was the case in January 2002, when Putin was getting ready to visit the former Soviet state of Azerbaijan. While Putin wasn't there yet, his security forces were, and it turned out that they knew more than the Azeri security forces did. Which makes you wonder, what else did they know about their former subject state? The Azeri leaders didn't have time to ponder that. There was an assassination to foil, and this one was an international affair. The main subject of the investigation was an Iraqi citizen, and tracking him showed he had been working with both Chechen rebels and the agents from Afghanistan. They'd been planning to deliver a large number of explosives, likely to be deployed against Putin during his visit. But once again, they never got close enough to pull it off. The plotters were arrested, with at least one being sentenced to 10 years in prison, and Putin's eventual visit went off without a hitch, something the Azaris were likely even happier about than he was. But none of the plots were this competent or elaborate. It was 10 months after the Azerbaijan plot was foiled when a threat came very close to Putin, but it was far from being a competent terror assault. Like something out of an action movie or at least the Russian bootleg, a man drove into the Kremlin complex and demanded to address Putin personally. His name was Ivan Zayatsev, and he had a bizarre claim. He thought he was the legitimate president of Russia. Was this some long-lost descendant of the Romanovs? 
or a Soviet loyalist next in the line of succession. Nope, it was just a crazy person. But that's where the story got wilder. Zayatsev was quickly arrested and bundled off to the nearest psychiatric hospital for observation. While there, he continued to make one wild claim after another, including that this was the second time he tried to get close to Putin. His motivation? He thought Putin was a secret Nazi who was planning to turn Russia into a fascist state, which some might say wasn't that far off. But he also claimed to be an undercover spy and that he was avenging the beheading death of his brother years ago, and he planned to cut Putin's head off as a trophy. No evidence was found of any of those claims, but Putin's security forces no doubt made sure that Zayatsev wouldn't be getting a third chance to get close. As time went on, Putin tightened his grip on Russia and the attacks would get more serious. It was only a few months later when Putin was heading back to the Kremlin headquarters. A group of workers showed up at the highway leading up to the complex, announcing that they had been hired to install new signs. Except that the work had not been ordered by the city and soon the area was swarming with police. What they found was shocking. 40 kilos of explosives timed to detonate when Putin's motorcade would be passing. It was the most competent attempt on Putin's life yet, and came dangerously close to succeeding. Not that people would know it, the explosives were quickly removed, the plotters were no doubt tracked down, and soon the Russian government would insist the whole affair never happened. But Putin's security didn't do enough to keep it from happening again. Assassination attempts on Putin seem to be a yearly affair in Russia, and if he stays in power, who knows, it might become a tradition. Someone dressed up as a plotter pulls it off and is foiled by the actors playing the police, while the street vendors sell the spectators pierogies. There wouldn't be much of a difference between the success rate of the plotters and the actors because they seem to be foiled constantly. In 2003, a plotter used the same tactic as a previous plotter, bombs by the side of the road where Putin was supposed to be passing. This time though, the bomb was a small pipe bomb object hidden in a bag. It was unlikely it would have even exploded. When asked for more details, such as if a culprit had been found, the Russian authorities once again said, yet. But as time went on, the plotters started to get smarter. It was 2008, after a relative era of peace, and Putin was planning to leave office for another office. His longtime ally, Dmitry Medvedev, was ascending to the office of president as Putin stepped down to become the new prime minister, his old office. Many assumed this was a way for him to maintain power behind the scenes. But some people would rather neither be in power, and they decided to take action. While the two were walking in an area surrounding the Kremlin, no doubt discussing their plans for Russia, a sniper struck, reportedly firing at them. However, the security presence was able to protect the two politicians and neutralize the threat. Once again, the identity of the shooter and their eventual fate is unknown. But old enemies were about to strike again. It was 2012, and sure enough, Putin was president again. The laws involving term limits had been changed, and Putin had taken back his old office from Medvedev and now looked to rule indefinitely. And the Chechen radicals who had plotted against him before knew that likely meant bad things for them. Once again, they planned an often tried tactic of a roadside bomb, and once again they were foiled. Like with the other attempts, the security team got a tip and took action before the bomb was detonated. And just like those other tries, the Russian authorities remained tight-lipped about the details of the plot. It's likely the Chechen areas where the attackers came from felt the impact. At least eight attacks, none of them successful. What is Vladimir Putin's secret? Not only did none of the attackers kill Putin, none of them even managed to injure him or get particularly close to him. Each time it felt like the attackers were running behind the eight ball, with the Russian security forces knowing where they'd be and neutralizing them before there was even a disruption. Ironically, the closest anyone got to actually creating a major incident was the fabulous Ivan Zyatsev, whose wild stories and unpredictable behavior likely made him much harder to track than the organized plotters. And the failure rate comes down to a number of factors. For one thing, Russia's security is good. Very good. While much of Russia's military is made up of conscripts mostly consisting of draftees who are often poorly trained and underfed, the security team is the best of the best. The Russian presidential regiment is all armed and trained in unarmed combat, and they patrol the Kremlin relentlessly. The massive guard towers surrounding the complex let them see full range around the area. The regiment has strict entry requirements, and only those with excellent eyesight and hearing are accepted. One benchmark potential members are tested on is being able to hear a whisper from up to 20 feet away. They're also put through rigorous fitness tests and need to match a certain height and weight to be considered suitable to protect Putin. But it's not just the security team. Putin is a paranoid man, but his paranoia is not unfounded. He wanted advice from someone who had much reason to fear assassination as him, if not more, and so he went to an old friend of the Russian regime, the elderly dictator Fidel Castro, 
who had ruled Cuba for close to half a century by the time Putin took power and had been targeted by more than 600 attempts at assassination, all unsuccessful. Some of those attempts were by domestic enemies and some were by foreign governments, including the United States, which once took aim at him with exploding cigars. So it's no surprise, he was very paranoid. In the interview with Oliver Stone, Putin reminisced about his conversation with Castro, and the old Cuban revolutionary had one key bit of advice, don't be afraid to be a control freak. Castro claimed that he was always the one to personally deal with his security forces, hand-picking them and promoting or dismissing them when he felt like it. This gave no one on the outside the chance to influence them and sabotage the leader's security. The result? A security team that looks a lot more like a private army only loyal to one man, rather than a large organization of the US Secret Service. But it's possible for this to go too far. There are some national leaders who keep an even tighter grip on their country than Putin. And the odds are, he looks at the leadership of North Korea and goes, dude, lighten up. Run since its founding in the 1940s by one family over three generations, their security forces are trained to fend off enemies from both the general public and the ambitious agents in the government who might think they could run things better than that son of the previous leader. Which is why the security system in North Korea looks a little bit more like a cult than a government agency. Like Russia, they have a conscript army, but unlike Russia, being selected for the leader's personal security team means cutting ties with your old life. Members of the team are never allowed to have contact with their family again, because Kim Jong-un wants them to have loyalty to only one person. Russia doesn't go that far, but his security team are no slouches themselves. In addition to physical skill, everyone who works for Putin's security team is highly trained in psychological profiling. They're not, however, trained to fade into the background. The training for Russian bodyguards is much more offensively focused than for the Secret Service. If something even appears to be a possible threat, they're supposed to take action hard and fast, and their responsibilities extend well beyond assassins. They're supposed to be so thorough, in fact, that their duties begin months before Putin is supposed to appear at a location. They're also all under the age of 35 and trained to speak multiple languages, preparing to protect Putin effectively when abroad. In some ways, they're more like spies than bodyguards. If your country is supposed to be hosting Putin, the odds are you won't even know that they're there. They'll simply make their way in, usually without much fanfare and only with a few people in the know to start scouting the area. This will involve looking for any signs of criminal activity or social unrest, as well as the presence of known enemies of Putin. These issues will usually be shared with the local government so they can coordinate, if the Russians trust them. Beyond that, the security will be observing infrastructure issues, looking for potential weak points, and Putin likes to have everything under control. That includes planning for what would happen if a natural disaster strikes during his visit. So if any super spies are packing an earthquake device in their next attempt, the odds aren't great. But if all the preparation fails, Putin is anything but defenseless. When he's appearing in public, Putin is typically protected by four squads. His first is his visible security detail. They're armed, ready to take a bullet and fire a lot of them if needed. This group is Putin's first line of defense, similar to the ones that protect the president, and they have only the best gear, including a pistol that can fire 40 rounds a minute. But many people who observe them notice they don't actually seem to do much. They're a constant presence, but they seem to take action less often than any other presidential security teams. And that's because they don't have to. For every visible squad guarding Putin, there are three other squads backing them up, and they're largely invisible. One is in plain clothes and assigned to blend in with the crowd, looking for any unusual movements toward the Russian president. If they see something, they'll strike and take down the assailant without them expecting it. Another group stands outside the crowd, undercover but armed, and ready to strike if anyone gets past the first two lines of defense. And in the event of a larger threat, a team of armed snipers keeps watch from the sky, ready to shoot down any attacker. But not all of Putin's lines of defense are armed. It's revenge of the nerds Russian style because one of Putin's biggest secret weapons is his IT team. Today, most assassination attempts are pulled off digitally, with bombs being detonated remotely, while hacking is used to confirm the location of the target. That's why Putin's security team commonly places jamming devices around his location blocking cell phone operations and keeping remote-controlled bombs or drones from being used in the area. It also has the side effect of letting the government spy on any electronic device in the area, exposing assassination plots or anyone saying something the government disapproves of. An invasion of privacy? Probably, but don't say that when Putin and his men are listening. And if someone gets too close, Putin has fail-safes in place. Not only does Putin have this highly trained security force, but there's usually a convoy of armored vehicles stationed around, ready to swoop in with backup and extract him from the situation at a moment's notice, and maybe plow through a hostile crowd if needed. Back at the Kremlin, Putin has some guards with their own unique and both tasty and terrifying duties. It's a tradition going back to medieval times, but the need hasn't lessened. 
Food tasters sample every meal Putin eats before he digs in, and so far no one has tried to poison him that we know of. But one other X factor might protect Putin from assassination attempts. It was 2017, five years after one of the botched attempts against Putin's life. While it's not known if the culprits were ever found, one of the top suspects was Chechen radical Adam Osmayev. He'd been arrested in Ukraine but due to a lack of evidence was never charged, and Ukraine refused to extradite him to Russia. He was eventually released and one day he and his wife were near a railroad crossing when a mysterious assassin shot them both, killing his wife and wounding Osmayev. Was it a message from Russia? If yes, they're not saying, but everyone knows Putin has a long-lasting memory, and if you target him and fail, the odds are good that his security apparatus will come for you no matter how long it takes, and he doesn't care who gets caught in the crossfire. But now those threats might be ramping up. The Russian invasion of Ukraine changed everything in the conversation about Vladimir Putin, and that included who started talking about taking him out. While previously only local radicals and the occasional crazy man were thinking about it, now US senators like Lindsey Graham are openly talking about assassination. While most countries were staying out of the fray, especially once Putin casually reminded everyone how many nuclear weapons Russia has, there's no doubt that his security forces are likely tightening their grip. So what does it look like now? It's hard to tell because Putin's control over Russia is only getting stronger. A combination of sanctions and stricter laws means most foreign media is heading for the exits. Netflix pulled the plug on their service in Russia due to a new law that stated they'd have to carry Russian propaganda channels. Netflix doesn't have channels, so we're guessing that Putin probably isn't a fan of streaming content and may not be up on the latest lingo. But all indications from those reporting from the inside are that Putin's paranoia and isolation have only deepened, and that means the biggest threat to him might be coming from within. Could Putin's own inner circle be plotting against him? Early indications are that he at least may think so. As the war in Ukraine drags on and Russian forces lose massive numbers of soldiers, with some even being captured and appearing on TV to condemn the invasion, Putin gets increasingly desperate. The country is under massive sanctions that have basically kneecapped the economy, and Russia has reportedly been forced to ask for military aid from China to keep the invasion going. This has led many people to compare him to Hitler in the dying days of the war. Is Putin trying to prevent his own Operation Valkyrie? Reports out of Russia are that Putin has fired or even arrested many of his top generals and security advisors. Some have been placed under house arrest, some have fled the country, and others have just not been heard from in a while. Many of his oligarch friends have found themselves personally sanctioned, even losing their massive yachts, and had no choice but to return home to Russia. There, it's entirely possible that all these powerful businessmen might decide that Putin's gone too far and needs to be removed by any means possible. But that's becoming more and more unlikely. As the war rages on, the bad news grows for Russia and the odds are more attempts on Putin's life might come. But for those who try, they might find themselves facing increasingly long odds. Not only is Putin appearing in public less and less, but the list of people who get to see him in the Kremlin is getting smaller and smaller. Even his closest advisors find themselves kept at arm's length, or the length of the longest table they can find. And anyone plotting an attack knows that if they fail, it's not just their fate at risk. It could be their family or even the whole countries. And in a building that is starting to look a lot more like a fortress, Vladimir Putin waits for his enemies to make their next move. Want to know how it all began? Check out how Vladimir Putin went from KGB agent to president of Russia. Or watch these memes will get you arrested in Russia for the lighter side of life under Putin.